It's Sam. No, it's Sam. Testing, testing. One, Hello, two, Jason. Three. Hello. Hello, Mayor Hello. Patel. Hello. Yep, Jason, you're good. Let's get down to it. Members of the public. 157. So we're still waiting for Matt working on the timer. We are. There's going to be a sort of squeaky. Scream while they're talking, folks. Madam Mayor, Matt needs three minutes. Keep working. Uh, and Ariel, do it. Your, your webcam is you're kind of off in the corner there, so if you want to adjust that. reminder for staffers you can add your title on um, you can do that by going to the control panel go to the file menu and go to edit your name and email and you can add your a comma and then your title after your name and that will show to the public which is helpful and we'll get started in about two minutes okay Two hundred thirteen. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Yes. Okay. Welcome to this meeting of the Santa Barbara City Council. Today is June 2nd, 2020. And I will start with the Pledge of Allegiance and I will be taking a knee to honor George Floyd. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Clerk, can we have a roll call, please? Mayor Patel? 
Yes, Council Member Jordan. Here. Council Member Alejandro Gutierrez. Mayor Pro Tem Sneddon. Here. Council Member Friedman. Here. Council Member Harmon. Here. Council Member Oscar Gutierrez. Present. Madam Mayor. Here. Thank you. And uh, Alejandra Gutierrez has has joined the meeting also. Thank you. I would like to open this meeting with a moment of silence for George Floyd, who lost his life in a brutal manner at the hands of a police officer in Minneapolis on Memorial Day. Mr. Floyd, we are thinking of you, and I want you to know that I pledge to do everything I can to reject and eliminate institutional, institutionalized racism uh, in our society. I honor the work of our local Black Lives Matter group and the regional NAACP. And I look forward to connecting with you all and anyone who's committed to social justice uh, work. I'd like to open the floor to my colleagues uh, to say a few words. This is the first uh, formal city council meeting that we've had uh, since this uh, tragedy. And um, you're welcome to say a few words, uh, anyone on our on our city council. Ms. Uh, Ms. Snedden, go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor, for this opportunity to speak. Um, it's very difficult to put this in, in context but I wanna bring it home to Santa Barbara. The protests this weekend were justified. They didn't come from a singular tragedy. A singular tragedy is what lit the fuse, a fuse that's been building for generations and decades. When an innocent human can be killed in broad daylight, complicit with law enforcement, um, we're at a dark time and it's, it's hard to see it any way differently. I want to be part, our council wants to be part of the change in addressing what we can. I want to say that I acknowledge that black lives are not safe. Black voices are not heard. Black income is not equitable. Black lives are more heavily impacted by COVID more at risk of infection, more at risk of job loss in this time. Racism is a public health crisis. We are part of the structural inequity that's wrought through all of our systems. It's time for us to all acknowledge and act now for concrete change. Nothing that we do in this moment can be enough. It will never be enough but this is an invitation to our community for us to listen, for us to do what we can, act where we can, and to acknowledge fully, truly fully, the extent to which our black community is in pain. I would like to say the names of those who are on my mind, and these are only just a few, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Amuda Arbery, Sean Reed, Tony McDade, and Trayvon Martin, child. And to say that I have a, a personal vow to do what I can, not just in this moment, but moving forward to listen and to act and to respond and to say out loud that black lives matter. And thank you, Madam Mayor, for the opportunity for us to voice our support. Thank you. Ms. Harmon? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, there are many things that I thought that I thought about saying today, but I keep coming back to one simple, powerful truth and that's that my 
voice is not the voice we need to hear today. My voice is not the voice we need today. My sadness, my righteous anger, my feelings are not the feelings that need to be expressed today. That my job today, my responsibility, first and foremost as an ally, but also as a council member, is to amplify and elevate the voices of Black leaders, of Black activists, of Black faith leaders, of Black moms and Black dads to elevate and amplify the voices of our Black neighbors. On Sunday, as Councilmember Snedden said so well, Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara gave us a gift. They gave us a gift that, frankly, we didn't deserve. They gave us a set of demands. They laid out a roadmap. They said to us, this is how you stand with us. If you are confused or afraid, or if you are stuck in the guilt of your own complicity, this is what you do. This, this is how you stand with us. So I wanna take this opportunity, and I thank you, Madam Mayor, for giving it to us, I wanna take this opportunity to lift up the demands put forth by Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara, to, to lift them up, um, to give them space, and to, um, to express my strong and full-throated support for these demands. Um, if you don't mind, I, I want to specifically call out very briefly two of them. Um, the first is the demand that we create a civilian complaint review board. This is an action that I have personally been supportive of for many, many years. It's something that I advocated for when I first joined this council a year ago, and I am committing today to using all levers available to me to see this through to fruition for, for our community. Um, I also quickly want to touch on the, the proclamation. Um, I, I guess it, it, well, it doesn't go without saying, I give my unreserved support to, um, to our council making such a, a declaration. Um, words have inherent value, but, and, and I guess I'm speaking directly to, to allies here when I say this, these words can be animated. They can have transformative power if we allow ourselves to be guided by the commitment that we make to them. I, I just keep thinking about the potential for the transformative power of these words if we commit in a unified way in each and every vote we make to centering our commitment to dismantling the racist structures of power and oppression that have served to undermine our black and brown neighbors and to keep them from reaching the fullest expression of their rights. Um, so to that end, I would also like to put put forth an additional action item for consideration by my colleagues, perhaps to be discussed next week if the proclamation comes before us. And that's to make a, a slight change to our council agenda reports. For those that may be watching, council agenda reports come to us every week. They describe the actions that we are gonna be voting on. They give us background information um, and they include discussions of budgetary impacts and environmental impacts. I ask that the council consider whether in these agenda reports each and every week, we can include a discussion of socioeconomic impacts. We can include a discussion of how the items that come before us reflect the commitment that this council is making if we vote to pass this proclamation. How do the actions before us reflect our commitment to equity? our commitment to justice. Um, it's a small change, it really is. But to me, um, I see this as an opportunity to hold ourselves 
accountable to the values that we proclaim, to hold ourselves accountable to the values that we proclaim when we vote on housing policy, when we vote on economic policy, when we vote on transportation and circulation and environmental policy, to hold ourselves accountable to the promises that we make through this proclamation. So I ask my colleagues to consider consider a discussion of that change. And I, I will close again by lifting up the demands of Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Oscar Gutierrez. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'd like to, to uh, also support the suggestions of uh, Council Member Harmon in having a discussion about those uh, uh, suggestions. Uh, I'm wholeheartedly in support of it. I uh, want to just share my my deepest respects to everyone who's been affected by by racism and discrimination and prejudice. Um, and for those who stepped up and chose to fight back so that people like me could be sitting here right now, so that people like me wouldn't be fearful of running for an elected office to represent the community that they were born and raised in. So I, I wanna give all those people who lost their lives, who experienced that abuse, my deepest respects and thanks for where I am today. And yeah, it's, it's just, it's, <laughs> It's just hard for me to try to put it into words of of what it's like to um, to just grow up feeling like I'm lesser than you know even now even on the council you know um, I just uh, I have a, I have a bit of a mix of emotions that now so many people want to speak up but I'm also glad that they are but I just hope that they're not just doing this temporarily because. There have been times where I, I looked around asking, where's my backup? Where's my support? And I'm glad that it's happening, but just like you're watching us right now, I'm gonna be watching all of you too, moving forward. Cause this isn't just like a temporary thing for us. Some of us can't jump on and off a bandwagon. Some of us were born on it and we don't have a choice of getting on and off. So I support Black Lives Matter. I support everything that they're suggesting and i hope that they'll support me when i ask them for their help as well thank you thank you uh mr jordan thank you madam mayor i would um as usual um council member harman manages to take what in my mind sometimes is a very complicated uh talking point and put it into tangible uh, points that we can look towards uh, implementing that. I would wholeheartedly um, uh, support also the proclamation process coming back next week. I in particular just love her idea of having a part of agenda items uh, be discussed, measure up to what we consider our values in a socioeconomic sense. Um, I think that's a great idea. I never would have thought of that, but that makes you um, not just say something once a year and then move on or say it when it's expedient because what's going on around you, but it makes you every week live and, and put those values forth in what you do. It's really interesting. <clears throat> she used the, the word complicit somewhere in her narrative and uh, I was called out this weekend at the dinner table by a couple of my kids because by that time, of course, you're seeing the unrest that's going on around the country. And um, I, of course, would start that as a phrase, I get this, but, and then say, but. And it's clear to me, they called me out for that because it's clear that it's, it's, it's way past the time to, um, to justify the point you're making, but have a but on the end of that and lead somewhere that, that cancels out that cancels out that thought, um, and it's it's funny looking back on that this weekend. Just the word complicit just kind of rang rang a tune to me when she said that because 
I'm sure we all are. Some of us are even more so than others. Um, and I personally will uh, pledge to work on that. I'll personally pledge to support what's going on with Black Lives Matter. Um, I won't bore you with my curriculum vitae of how many schools I went to or what sport teams I was on that I was the only white guy involved because I don't think it matters because somewhere I'll find a butt in there for much of my life. And it's time that the butts just stop being in the middle of the sentence and we honor the thought behind it and we look for ways to make tangible change. So, and again, I, I, I suggest uh, I'll, if it needs two people to come back or more than that, um, I really like the ideas she put forth for being a discussion item next week. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Friedman. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, first, my uh, my heart goes out to uh, Mr. Floyd and his family. Um, he is a uh, Mr. Floyd is a, is a son of God and, and brother in Christ with all of us, and um, his murder and those of um, of countless others uh, affects all of us. Sorry, it's very difficult. Um, my my job here is to listen to the hundreds of you who have contacted us over the last couple of days and we'll be speaking today and to work with my colleagues on the council to take action and and move forward and and respond to what we need as a city and our values as a city to honor the lives of those who were murdered and who their families are in pain and we have to take appropriate action to uh, have something that really gives us a path forward. So I look uh, forward to having these discussions on the resolution, funding Juneteenth and other measures and working with my colleagues to provide uh, the action uh, that the community demands of us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Friedman. Any other city council? Um, Ms. Gutierrez. We can't we can't hear you very well. Do you have ah there you go? Okay. So I wrote my uh, my thoughts down, so bear with me. The peaceful demonstration reflects the large community and the dis dissatisfaction with the maltreatment of black black lives and the disenfranchised people in American society. The outcome from the murder of George Floyd pushed people all over the globe to stand in solidarity with people who recognize system barriers and institutionalized racial arrangements in the US. We belong to each other and we must hold leadership accountable. This is not about blaming the victim, but as a politician to protect everybody. And I wanna say that I'm also in support of Ms. Harmon's um, request for the pro proclamation for next week. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will take that moment of silence now. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Gorman, let's go to public comment. And um, that seems appropriate. And when we're done with public comment, we will go to a report from closed session and some other items that we have on our agenda. Um, we anticipate hearing from people today about uh, uh, the tragic death and murder of George Floyd, and also about the Black Lives Matter um, uh, demands that came to us out of this weekend's very powerful uh, rally and demonstration in March. So Ms. Clerk, how many people have raised their hands? So in the, uh, the app, folks, you need to raise your hand as it says on the screen to speak. Um, how many, ma'am? Madam Mayor, approximately 
20 or 30 people have raised their hand, although a substantial larger number have have called in. Okay. So if you would like to speak on this, please raise your hand. Yeah, usually we do 30 minutes of public comment. I'm going to stretch it to an hour and ask people to, uh, uh, it, the, uh, the screen says you have three minutes. Ms. Clerk, are we are we teed up for three minutes or two minutes? We we want everybody to have a chance to speak because if we don't get everyone in this first flush right at the beginning of the meeting, we listen to everyone at the end of the meeting. And because of our new format and a lengthy agenda today, um, if you don't speak at the beginning of the meeting, you'll have to wait four or five hours for the, um, the public comment at the end of the meeting. So I do encourage people to, to uh, to try and do it in two minutes. Are we queued up for two, Ms. Clerk? Yes, Madam Mayor, we are we are queued up with the two minute timer. Okay, so thank you for bearing with that. I, I, three minutes is longer. We we hope that you can say everything that you need in two. We just want to try and get everyone now. If you're on the phone and you're waiting, so let's go ahead and go to the first person, Ms. Clerk. Wonderful. And Madam Mayor and members of the public, I'm going to list a number of names here so you can be ready when I do call your name. Please turn off the volume on your television and unmute yourself and you may state your name. Go ahead. You will have two minutes. So our first speakers are going to, going to be Amara Teague, Ana Rosa Rizzo Santino, Anna Gott, Anne Odile Thomas, and Anne Howard. Okay, first is Ms. Teague. Go ahead. Hi there, this is Amara Teague and I wanted to just share that I really appreciate everyone um, making comments in support of the Black Lives Matter demands. I do wanna also share that it was um, really saddening to know that um, Madam Mayor would not kneel during the Sunday protests um, and the riot gear that was being worn by the police was really um, kind of speaking to the way that we have been operating recently and it's been too complicit. There was a peaceful protest, unarmed people were participating and I think that that was your action and your choice to then make your stance clear there. I appreciate you taking the time to make it clear now that they needed it then. And I wish that you would have supported Crystal and Simone in the moment. Thank you. Um, next speaker, Ms. Cliff. Our next speaker is Ana Rosa uh, Rizzo Centino. Please go ahead. Hi, um, thank you for your time. Uh, speaking as board president of La Casa de la Raza and part of this effort, I'm going to start reading the letter. Um, Dear Mayor and City Council, we Juneteenth Santa Barbara and Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara are writing to you with urgency and deep concern for our community. As reported by the Santa Barbara Independent, over 3,000 of our community members, your constituents came together Sunday, May 31st, to condemn the brutal murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, Tina Pop, and Megan Hockaday, a Santa Barbara local who was killed by the Oxnard Police Department. We were moved by speakers who spoke out against anti-Blackness in our local community, and we were called to act by Black people and those who support them. We are a community that strongly values the lives of our neighbors, and as such, we're appalled and horrified at the response of the police department and sitting mayor. As noted in articles appearing in Ed Hat News Hawk, Santa Barbara Independent and KEYT, as protesters spoke of accountability and community building, the police department and mayor remained silent and continued erecting physical barriers. When protesters exited the courthouse, they were met with barricades on State Street. When protesters arrived peacefully, at the intersections of Figueroa and Santa Barbara Street and chanted, I can't breathe. They were met with police officers in riot gear, including bulletproof vests and shields. Protest leaders invited members of the black community, 
in a powerful, peaceful demonstration as they laid on the ground for eight minutes and 46 seconds. The approximate amount of time a white officer held his knee into the neck of George Floyd. Members of the non-Black community were asked to kneel in solidarity, which led to the crowd in a chat towards Santa Barbara police officers, asking them to join by taking a knee. None of them did. Contrast, members of the Santa Cruz Police Department, including Chief Andy Mills, were seen taking a knee with protesters this weekend. New York Police Department officers were also seen taking a knee alongside protesters in Manhattan. Rather than stand and uplift her constituents, the Independent notes that Santa Barbara Mayor Kathy Murillo emerged from behind the line of police officers. In videos that have now been shared widely, Mayor Murillo is seen shouting over protesters and demanding that protest leaders allow her to speak. During the heated exchange, demonstrators asked her to acknowledge the ongoing police violence against Black people and explain why she arrived at the demonstration in an armored vehicle with Police Department Public Engagement Manager Anthony Wagner. Mayor Murillo never responded to these questions but left with police and then issued a statement thanking the library and chief of police for their support, erasing the Black people with whom she had engaged just hours earlier. As the community that often states goals of equity and inclusion, we were shocked and dismayed by Mayor Murillo's insensitivity. Her alignment with police as they refused to join protesters in condemning the murder of George Floyd was disturbing and deeply saddening. We have included the original demand shared by Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara and Juneteenth Santa Barbara for your review. Considering the actions of the police department and mayor, neither of whom have reached out to court organizers since, we will continue to develop further demands to address the additional harm caused by the inconsiderate and system systemically violent actions. Our demands are as follows. We demand that Santa Barbara City Council adopt a resolution condemning police brutality and declare racism a public health emergency. We demand transparency and accountability from the Santa Barbara Police Department. No more community conversation without changes to policy and practices. No more internal investigations of misconduct. Create a civilian review board with members selected by the community. Prioritize mental health and service and rehabilitation. We demand transparency and accountability from the Santa Barbara County Sheriff. Update use of force policy to, see, to center de-escalation. No isolation or quarantine for inmates attending court or contacting their lawyers. Reduce jail admissions by redirecting people to community-based mental health and substance abuse treatment services. We demand protection and preservation of black landmarks rather than monuments to white supremacy. St. Paul AME, Friendship Baptist Church and Franklin Neighborhood Center have been symbols for black unity and peace. Prioritize the restoration of these spaces and name their black creators. We demand institutional support for an annual Juneteenth celebration. A city and county commitment to allocate funds for this annual celebration of black emancipation and liberation. 3,000 people watch these events unfold in person and countless more watch live or replays of these interactions. Mayor and city council, your response is required and absolutely urgent. In community, Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara and Juneteenth Santa Barbara. Thank you. I gave you time so you could finish the letter and we all got it. Ms. Rizzo Centeno, thank you very much. Uh, next speaker, please. Our next speaker will be Anna Gott, then Ann Odile Thomas, then Ann Howard, then Charles Romero. Okay, our next speaker is Anna Gott. You two minutes. Please go ahead. Sally Jensen, the wash from with the Washington Post said it best when she wrote, There is only the knee of protest or the knee on the neck. Each of us has to choose which knee we are going to support. I choose protest, but on Sunday, the mayor chose the neck when she refused to take a knee at the end of the Black, Matter, Black Lives Matter protest. Taking a knee to kneel is a simple way to begin to call to attention the issues of racial inequity and police brutality. 
and neither the mayor or anyone else on city council who were all MIA could take a knee at the police station. And I'd really like to know why. Frankly, I don't believe that anything has fundamentally changed here today, even with all these nice speeches. That is because I don't trust the city council to live up to what they just talked about. From all of the meetings that I have attended for years, you say one thing and you do something else. You can try going ahead and agendizing something weekly to start, but then you actually must take action. This council needs to acknowledge and take action on the ongoing gentrification that displaces our residents, primarily minorities, that bulldozes our affordable housing, that the city actually has failed to even implement a living wage ordinance, and that its planning policies of the city prioritizes businesses and developments that produce low wage jobs, which just increase in equity. All of this really has to stop. And if you really are serious about doing this, then item 11 should be completely just ignored today because that's the total government giveaway to the people that have the most in the city. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Um, Mr. Gutierrez, you have a question for the speaker? No, I just have a statement towards her. You know, Ms. Gott, you know I'm a, I'm a big proponent of the First Amendment and freedom of speech and expression, but I honestly, what you just said, I was there. I was there at the protest. I didn't see you there. You know where I saw you? I saw you the day after I announced that I was going to run for office. I saw you go to City Hall on camera and call me a puppet, a person of color from this community who chose to step up and serve his city, you called a puppet. Why? Because a Latin woman, a Latina woman, decided to endorse me. So you're gonna go on during this time right now and lecture me, lecture us about what's right? Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. Um, we'll continue with public comment. Um, is um, Odile is the next speaker. Yes, Anne Odile Thomas, Anne please Odile. go ahead. Dear Madam Mayor and members of the City Council, I understand that you have urgent matters on your plate right now and that we are going through some unprecedented times in our local community and as a nation. And I'm grateful for all the great work you're all doing locally. You will have the opportunity to make a vote um, on the Verizon Wireless Ordinance next week. The science is well established that microwave radiations have severe impact on people's health, especially young children and elderly people. More and more people like myself no longer use wireless devices in our homes in an effort to reduce our exposure to such microwave radiation. We can somewhat limit our exposure within our homes. However, once we step outside of our homes, we are exposed to increasing levels of radiation that none of us consented to and that none of us can escape from. Unlike cigarette smoke, you cannot see microwave radiation and you cannot avoid it by simply holding your breath while walking past a wireless telecommunication facility. The city has an obligation to protect the health and well-being of the local community. You do have the power and obligation to protect the local community from the harm that such an agreement with Verizon will cause. I have four requests today. One, Please meet with representatives of the 5G Free Santa Barbara group before the June 9 council meeting to provide you with information ahead of your vote on the Verizon wireless ordinance. Two, please allow the 5G Free representatives to put on the June 9 city council agenda to make a formal presentation in relation to the Verizon ordinance. Three, please vote no to the Verizon wireless ordinance on June 9, 2020. And four, in the event that you are not ready to vote no, Please vote, please vote in a 90 day extension on the cause of your decision. It is especially critical to not rush into signing off an ordinance that will give away a local authority to a wireless industry that will not look out for the well being of our local community. You are responsible for this. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <clears throat> um, another comment, Ms. Howard? Our next speaker will be Ann Howard. After that, Aris Romero, Athena Tan, Azura Stewart, Chantel Fordyce, and Colleen Conroy. Okay, Ms. Howard, please go ahead. 
Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you for beginning uh, today's meeting in the manner in which you did um, in recognition of the murder of George Floyd. Thank you all council members for what you've said. Uh, council member Harmon for your proposal. I'm here uh, as the board president of Santa Barbara Public Library Foundation today. I'm here to clarify what I said at last Wednesday's library budget presentation. And after that meeting and my Thursday emails to all of you, I'm here to advocate for Measure C funding for Library Plaza, 1.15 million in fiscal year 21. And to emphasize what's essential in order for the foundation to fundraise for the plaza. As several of you said last week, our library is a critical resource for our community. It is the home of our city's Juneteenth celebration. It's our local free educational institution that demonstrates and celebrates diversity and equality in all of its daily mission. It's a center for social justice in this community. In this pandemic, we've seen our librarians, despite huge staff reductions, pivot and innovate once again to bring literacy and connection to patrons of all walks of life, online and through the mail. Even COVID hasn't stopped the library or our valiant team of librarians. But because of COVID, the foundation paused our capital campaign assessment interviews in March, intending to get those interviews started up as soon as things begin to open up and people can once again focus on building an inviting library plaza at the heart of our downtown. It's our hope to get those interviews back on later this summer, but we can't do that unless the city is willing to uphold its commitment of 1.15 million in Measure C funds. We already know from potential local donors that they need to see the city is committed to building this plaza. The Santa Barbara Public Library Foundation has been eager for the public-private partnership that can remove the blight surrounding our library and begin to revitalize our downtown. I know I need to stop because of the two minute limit. I Thanks, will stop. Howard. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Aris Romero. Please go ahead. Hi, um, thank you for um, just opening up the space for community members to speak. And I actually live in Ventura County, but I grew up in Santa Barbara County and I wasn't able to participate in the protest because I can't risk the possibility of getting arrested. Otherwise I face deportation. And I didn't grow up black in America, but I did grow up undocumented in Santa Barbara County. And um, it's just really heartbreaking to see that police showed up in riot gear um, because it has been proven that the militariz militarization of police can increase deaths up to 50% in as little as one year. And I just want to know what the County of Santa Barbara is doing to reduce um, police violence and what is the county doing to protect all voices and lives during protests, which is our right and community organizing. And I would also like to um, just say that it would be really great to have you participate in these events as a resident and as, you know, a human and not just a mayor, but, you know, really take inventory of all of your own experiences growing up in this county and seeing how many people are affected by gentrification and all of the issues that we face with income inequality and lack of affordable housing and um, really join join our cause. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Athena Tan or Tan after after that person. It is Azur Stewart, Chantel Fordyce and Colleen Conroy. Okay, Ms. Tan, go ahead. I'm here first because I want to make sure all of you on the council understand the gift you received on Sunday when two black women, Simone Ruskamp and Crystal Farmer Sieghart took leadership and held space. That is what true leadership and community look like, amplifying the voices of the people among us who are least heard. This was a vision of real change in action. Mayor Murillo, shame on you for shutting down Crystal Farmer Sieghart when she was engaging with you directly. 
You are a representative. You answer to your constituency. You don't tell people to listen to you. You listen to the people. Shame on you for spreading lies about the protest organizers asking you to be there. If your pride and ego are stronger than your commitment to racial justice, you should not be in your position. That goes for all of you on city council. This moment is not for us people of color who are not black. The Santa Barbara Police Department is answerable to you on the council and to the city manager. You are not their PR staff. Chief Luna released a feel good statement knowing full well that she shut down conversation with a black led organization three years ago. If you on the council want to be anti-racist, you need to start by holding your own police accountable. Community policing extends the police's harmful tentacles deeper into communities, and it still values police lives over black lives when it comes down to it, as we saw. So I demand that you declare racism a public health emergency and act on it. Condemn police brutality. Demand a civilian review board for Santa Barbara Police for the Santa Barbara Police Department and make sure it's community members who conduct use of force investigations. Urge the Historical Landmarks Commission to protect the city's black landmarks. Institutionalize Juneteenth as a celebration and put resources behind it. And Council Member Eric Friedman, collect your white supremacist mother. Stop building political capital off of empty words and gestures when you are not listening to your own black constituents. Follow your, your the vision that black women leaders up, gifted you with on Sunday. Thank you so much. Next speaker. Next speaker is Azur Stewart. Please go ahead. Zuer Stewart, please go ahead. Okay, we will come back to Azur Stewart. Our next speaker is Chantel Fordyce. Fordyce? Please go ahead, Chantel. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much. I just wanted to share that I moved to Santa Barbara six months ago after a lifetime of dreaming about living in this community. I've honestly spent my entire life swooning over its beauty and the people and wanting to be a part of it. And it's extremely heartbreaking to now be here and now realizing that our leadership is choosing fear and intimidation over support and solidarity. Now hear me out when I say I'm super grateful. I'm grateful for your willingness to add action items to your weekly agenda. And I hope that you all continue to challenge yourselves to have these conversations. I think I read this awesome quote where commitment means staying loyal to what you said you were going to do long after the mood, the mood in which you said it has left you. So I urge you to create foundations now, right now that are sustainable, they're tangible, they're real, they're bold and they're in congruency of not only what your community members are needing, but what they're begging you, they're begging you to do for them. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Colleen Conroy. Ms. Conroy, please go ahead. Hi. I wanna say thank you for the words shared by the city council members and for opening up this space for the community to speak. However, I am here as a citizen and an ally not to speak on these words we heard now, but the actions or lack thereof that we witnessed at the peaceful protest on Sunday. I'm asking that it be known and shared publicly that our mayor and our police department refused to engage in any form of solidarity with the black community and the peaceful protest they led. I would like to note that the protest itself doesn't count as solidarity, that is a right. The lack of empathy, engagement, or support from the police department and mayor set a glaring example that the city does not care enough about its black community, their history, nor their futures here. It is crucial that the city itself makes these facts known or the erasure and silencing of black voices and community here in Santa Barbara will only continue. These leaders and officials are setting the tone and example for the entire community. This actively creates an environment in which it's okay to silence black voices and erase the value and beauty of black lives, experiences, and bodies. Santa Barbara city officials must do better and we as citizens must hold them accountable. 
As an ally, I will not be quiet and will continue to demand their accountability for our Black community. And I ask that demands outlined by our protest organizers and leaders from Juneteenth be met with swiftness. I agree with former remarks that what we received on Sunday was a gift we do not deserve. After Crystal and Simone and the other speakers explained to us how we as allies could begin our roadmap to showing solidarity, the mayor and police department still chose not to engage in a simple yet powerful act of kneeling with the protesters. This must change. Thank you. Very good. <clears throat> next speaker. Our next speaker is Cressida Silvers. After Cressida Silvers, David Moore, Diana Collins Puente, Dominique Bittner, and Dylan Griffith. Cressida Silvers. Cressida Silvers, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I was at Sunday's peaceful courthouse rally for Black Lives and in protest against police brutalization of our citizens. I have attended several rallies in Santa Barbara in the past. And as I recall, those all had a friendly police presence to assist with perimeters and traffic safety. Sunday was different and I wonder why. At Sunday's event, the only police presence I noticed were a few officers on bicycles observing from a distance as we set up. During the rally, speakers stated several times throughout the afternoon that we were a peaceful crowd. Emotional, yes, sad and mad, but peaceful. I marched with the crowd down State Street and up Figueroa to be met with police tape blocking our path and a wall of police officers with riot gear and shields who refused to join us in kneeling as a show of respect for the murdered. Even as black individuals in the crowd laid down in the street in front of them for a full eight minutes and 46 seconds. And let me tell you, that's a long time to be laying on the ground. And as, as non-black participants kneeled in silence around them for that same amount of time, the officers refused to join us in any way. For our grieving crowd, this was the antithesis of the compassionate policing the mayor and police chief described in their recent statements. It was tone deaf and an enormous missed opportunity for healing. I'm sad to say it was not unexpected as it was consistent with the city's lack of communication with black leaders following George Floyd's murder and in preparation for Sunday's event. Thank goodness for the leadership of Ms. Baker and Ms. Farmer with Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara. They refused to take the bait for the riot, from the riot ready police. They were able to conduct that powerful protest, say their piece and de-escalate the situation masterfully. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is David Moore. Go ahead. Hello, uh, Mayor Kathy Murillo um, and City Council. All I have to say now is uh, I, I heartily agree with the statements made by so many women today um, friend, that I consider to be friends like Ana Rosa and Athena and the rest of you following in the wake of uh, the words of Crystal Farmer and um, Akila Simone Ruskamp this past Sunday. I am so proud. I am moved to tears at these uh, younger than myself. These these women uh, are so refreshing to me that I feel like I'm going to live longer just because they're here. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Pastor Moore. Uh, another speaker. Our next speaker is Diana Collins Puente. After her, Dominique Bittner, Dylan Griffith, Eve Sandford, and Heather Hagen. Diana Collins Puente. Please go ahead. Um, thank you. My name is Diana Collins Puente. I am a resident of Toledo. And I echo and endorse the entire statement made by 
Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara and Juneteenth Santa Barbara at the beginning of this public comment period. I joined Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara and all the demands they have made to our elected officials. On Saturday, I joined Black, on Sunday, excuse me, I joined Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara, Juneteenth Santa Barbara, and thousands of supporters in demonstrating against police brutality and for Black lives. It's hard to find words to speak to the experience of um, what we saw um, on Saturday from the city. The city's decision to have police lined up in riot gear sent an extremely negative and very powerful message to the entire community, and specifically to the participants of the demonstration, and even more specifically to the Black women who led it. Santa Barbara is a small community. You knew exactly who would be leading this demonstration. You knew exactly how to reach out. And this is how you choose to respond. Where was the solidarity? What message are you sending? Who is creating fear? It is unacceptable. Major Murillo, seeing your interaction with our Black leaders on Saturday at the police line, as you used your power and privilege to interrupt and try to exert control over the two Black women who were leading this effort, is deeply troubling, whatever your intentions were. Saturday was the manifestation of the problem. This is a critical opportunity for deep reflection, listening, and anti-racist action. You have been provided with a clear set of demands and a clear roadmap. The time to act is now. Thank you. Next speaker. Next speaker is Dominique Bittner. Dominique Bittner, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, Madam Mayor, you have heard from many people and definitely countless reports as well on the internet um, of people that felt disgraced by your actions on Sunday. I was there and I was definitely disheartened by the, the well, anyway, I, I didn't even want to talk about that. I just got kind of emotional hearing the last speaker. I, I really just wanted to say that protests are meant for the people who are protesting. They, it's their time to have a voice and it's important for them to be heard and that we stand in solidarity and listen. And then after we can respond in a thoughtful way with contemplation and take action after hearing what they have to say and um, what the movement needs. And now is your time to take action and it is your time to have listened to what the demands are and for the change in the system because we really need it. It's a change that has been long overdue and we can't stop until we see change. We can't stop until the system of oppression that this entire country has been founded on is broken. And we can only do that by policies being made by people like you, Madam Mayor. I 100% support what Council Member Harmon brought up. I think it's very important and I really respect um, this open forum and also the space that all the council members are holding. And I hope to keep seeing this continue and the support and action being taken. Thank you very much. Thank you. Another speaker? Our next speaker is Dylan Griffith. After that, Eve Sanford, Heather Hagen, and Jamie Sawyer. Dylan Griffith, please go ahead. Awesome, thank you so much. So uh, first and foremost, I wanna say that uh, I absolutely insist explicitly on the implementation of the demands made by Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara. Five very clear, very urgent, very necessary, and ultimately very reasonable demands uh, made by and led by primarily Black women organizers. I want us to put this in a context here. Um, I hope all of us have heard of Brown v. Board of Education in 1954, um, leading to the integration of public schooling Right, but a lot of people don't know about what happened the following year with the next Supreme Court ruling and what we call Brown v. Board 2, if you want to call it that, um, where it said that schools must integrate, and I quote, with all deliberate speed. And I'll translate that for everyone here. That means there's no system of accountability for the implementation. And I want to put that in a Santa Barbara context. Um, people in the community of Santa Barbara are tired 
of having whiteness run on whiteness time. Okay, and when I say whiteness, I'm not talking about specifically white people. I'm talking about the system, structures, policies, procedures that reinforce the status quo, right? And status quo being racism uh, and, and other forms of isms and so on and so forth. So I want us to understand racism through the context of how Dr. Ruth Wilson Gilmore, um, a black woman, defines racism. And she says that racism, I'm going to loosely kind of paraphrase here, but it's um, the state sanctioned or extra legal group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. So racism is not just unequal access, unequal opportunity to, or unequal access to opportunity. Racism is talking about leading to the premature death of people of color, black people and indigenous people. So we really need to keep that in mind here. We're tired of running on whiteness time and we need to implement these demands as soon as possible. And the last thing I want to end it with is uh, George Floyd was murdered on May 25th. How did everyone here feel on May 24th? If you were not outraged on May 24th, then I think you have a lot of questions to ask yourself. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next speaker. Next speaker is Eve Sanford. Eve Sanford, please go ahead. Hi, thank you. I'm calling in to speak my support for Black Lives Matter and for all of the asks that they've outlined today and all of, all of the leaders of Black Lives Matter. Um, and I want to call attention to the role of our, of our increasing police budget and the fact that Santa Barbara has increased our police budget by more than $9 million over the past three years or budget cycles. Um, and that, that collectively adds up to th about 32.32% of our entire city budget. And I want to draw attention to the fact that anytime we're increasing our police budget, it's leading to the policing of people of color. And I, I, I asked that our city council rethink the proposal that came before them on May 20th, which would again, increase our, our city budget. And that that total accounts for more than we spend in our community, on community development, on parks, in our library budget, and with our public works department fixing bridges and roads. And anytime you're investing in police, it's at the cost of other programs and other resources that our community needs to actually and meaningfully ad advance equity. Um, and again, I just wanna echo that you strongly consider the leaders of Black Lives Matter here and the things they're asking for. But I want I want to call attention to the fact that this spending is exactly at odds with the kind of future and um, the things that we need in our community today. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Sanford. Ms. Gorman, how many uh, more speakers? We can give a little more time. Um, I'm concerned. I, uh, Madam Mayor, I would say we have approximately 30 to 40 more speakers. Okay. Um, let's go another 30 minutes. And if people could do a one minute um, presentation, then we can fit everybody in right at this time period. We don't want you to wait four or five hours at the end of our meeting. So that would be my request, hoping that people could could make their comments in, in one minute. Thank you. And just keep the keep the same um, timer, Ms. Ms. Gorman. Thanks. Very good. Our our upcoming speakers are Heather Hagen, Jamie Sawyer, Jim Knell, Jonathan Abood, Jordan Killebrew, Jordan Victorian, and Julia Bickford. Heather Hagen, please go ahead. My name is Heather Hagen. First, Kathy, the performative knee that you took at the beginning of this meeting and the paltry moment of silence you called for do not excuse or make up for your behavior at the protest on Sunday. I was there and I'm here to hold you accountable. You, Kathy, disrespected, interrupted, and repeatedly attempted to talk over the black women who organized the protest. I was horrified and deeply embarrassed to see you, an elected official, silence black voices. 
I call on this council to immediately and unreservedly comply with the list of demands compiled by Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara. While Black people may be a minority in this city, I think the mayor, the council, and the police will find that their allies are not. You will be held accountable. Reallocate police funds to community support and care. Defund the police. Do not build a new police station. Redistribute those funds to community care, mental health, food, and housing for our community members. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Jamie Sawyer. Jamie Sawyer, please go ahead. I just want to briefly say that I fully support the demands of Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara and their asks, and I support Black Lives Matter. And I just want to quickly comment on the contrast and the leadership uh, between the extraordinary women at the head of Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara and the actions of our mayor who didn't act at the time when it mattered. And I can tell from what I heard at the beginning of this meeting that you probably are not real happy with yourself about what you did at the time. So now that you've made the commitments and the council has made the commitments and the statements that they have, we're all just gonna sit and wait and see whether these were nice words or whether there's gonna be actions to follow them up. Thank you. Very good. Next speaker. And thanks folks for going, taking one minute, very helpful. Our next speaker is Jim Cannell. He has he has lowered his hand. So our next speaker is Jonathan Abood. Mr. Abood, please go ahead. Mr. Abood. Okay, we will come back to Mr. Abood. Next is Jordan Killebrew. Jordan. Hello, everyone. My name is Jordan Killebrew. Uh, can everybody hear me? Awesome. So I um, have stood with Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara and Juneteenth Santa Barbara, and I stand with my sisters, Crystal and Simone, and I was there all Sunday. And for me, what I need is action from the police chief and action from the mayor to reach out to them directly to open the dialogue. This needs to happen. This is common sense. It should have happened Sunday. I'm hurting as a community member, and I'm disappointed in our leaders right now. And so I wanna see action. I wanna see it happen very soon. Please do this as soon as possible. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Jordan Victorian. Jordan Victorian, please go ahead. So I'm speaking as a Black student at UC Santa Barbara. I earned my master's at UCSB and I'm working on my PhD here. I mean, I'm really grateful to see and to have been a part of the action put together on Sunday um, and the leadership of Black women in particular. And I was really heartened by the showing of solidarity from and with Indigenous peoples, with Latinx people. Um, I think there were beautiful examples of solidarity there. And I was really truly appalled to see the response by the Santa Barbara mayor and the police department here. Um, I believe it's important for university students to be connected to the communities where they live, the communities that provide the labor that makes our universities run. And to me, what Sunday's response by the mayor and the police showed is that Santa Barbara is not a place that feels the same about me and about black students who may come to the university here. It shows me that Santa Barbara is an American Riviera that represents the worst of America, the lack of value for Black people and Black life on which this country is built. It shows me that to live in Santa Barbara is to be Black by the ocean, to try to appreciate the beauty of the earth, while officers don riot gear and prepare to stand in clear opposition to the very people that they're allegedly supposed to serve, although history tells us that that's not true. It shows me that Santa Barbara is a place where tourists can visit the monument to the dispossession of indigenous people before having a wine tour and ignoring the violence that this place is founded on. It's a place where people of color have to fight for their youth to be able to learn their own histories in high school and to have their knowledge and the knowledge of their ancestors be valued. I wanna share my support for the demands that Black Lives Matter and Juneteenth put forward 
and I'm going to say that as a grad student at Santa Barbara, um, I want to do what I can to push the UC to support and uplift these demands and to put forth the resources to do so. Part of this includes calling for the UC to divest from police contracts. And to the city council, I want to say, as a scholar, I recognize the importance of words and statements. I spend a lot of my time reading and writing, learning, and Thank engaging you. with the power of words and knowledge. But history shows us that words without actions are little more than meaningless. To Mayor Murillo, Thank you. you did not have to do this. You did not have to respond to your community with neglect and uh, Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Julia Bickford. Julia Bickford, please Hello. go ahead. Uh, thank you for giving people time to speak today. Uh, I would like to speak as an ally to the Black community in full support of the demands made by Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, I was there on Sunday and want to express my deep disappointment in the police force who showed up in riot gear. That was the wrong thing to do. They were given the opportunity to kneel with the protesters, kneel with the Black community in solidarity and in grief for the full eight minutes and 46 seconds that we did. They refused this opportunity. They stood and were disrespectful. They should be held accountable and everything that goes along with that. Uh, I would also like to say thank you to uh, Mayor Kathy Murillo and to the city council members for their nice speeches at the beginning of this meeting. And I hope to see those words translated into action. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Okay. Our next speaker is Justin West. Justin West, please go ahead. Justin West, please unmute yourself oh, and go sorry. ahead. Yep, I'm here now. Sorry, just trying to figure this out for the first time. Um, thank you for uh, giving me the chance to speak here. I too was at the uh, rally on Sunday and uh, I just wanna take a quick moment to say too little too late on the knee today, uh, Mayor Murillo. The time was with the people on the street on Sunday and you missed that opportunity and that's really a shame. Kind of showed us and, and, the, and the riot gear I felt was way overboard as well. So, you know, like everybody else today, I'm here to voice my support with the black community here in Santa Barbara on their demands for protection and preservation of black landmarks rather than monuments to white supremacy. Uh, I would like to see the St. Mark Baptist Church and Franklin Neighborhood Center restoration happen and have those be named after their black creators. Uh, the most important here I, I, for me, I think, is that the uh, declaration of racism as a public health emergency as a father in this community um, you know racism is something that we can't stand for and we need to actively work on anti-racism simply not being racist isn't good enough and I appreciate the words of the council members at the beginning of the meeting today but uh, along with most of the other public commenters today actions speak louder than words and we will believe it when we see it um, so you know, please take seriously the, the gift that you were given by the black community on Sunday. They, they laid out a pretty clear roadmap and recipe for success and uh, at least a starting point for good flavors. So let's all work together to make it happen, but it's up to you. Thanks. Another speaker? Our next speaker is Catherine Olson, then Katie Mickey, then Kimberly Syracuse. Katherine Olson, please go ahead. Hi. Yeah, I was trying to meet you myself. Um, I uh, just want to say that I was so present in the protest on Sunday. It was a peaceful demonstration demanding long overdue change to protect Black lives. The police showing up in riot gear and intimidating peaceful protesters goes against everything that Mayor Murillo and the Santa Barbara Police Department claim to value with, com with community policing. There is no community in that type of policing and there is no real safety in our community until black lives are safe. BLM Santa Barbara has given and gifted us with specific 
signs for change that you can implement now. It's time to act. We demand better. And thank you. Thank you. Another speaker? Our next speaker is Katie Mickey. Katie Mickey, please go ahead. Dear Santa Barbara City Council and Honorable Mayor Murillo, on June 9th, you'll be called to vote on a license agreement to deregulate Verizon's ability to construct and operate small cell wireless facilities on streetlights in public rights of way to facilitate the deployment of a close proximity microwave irradiating network, enabling not only internet data, voice, text transmissions, but also surveillance, crowd control, and personal injury by means of pushed pulsed data modulating microwave irradiation. As such, this deployment is a social justice issue. As public officials, it is your duty to ensure that equipment designed in such a way as to inflict biological harm upon the public, not be a building permit or permission to operate as it would be a violation in the intent of established local and national building codes. My request is that on June 9th, you enact a moratorium on further installations. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for truncating your time, Ms. Mickey. I really appreciate that. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Kimberly Syracuse. After that, Kimmy Van Dyke, Crystal Sieghart, and Kim Paskowitz. Kimberly Syracuse. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I would just like to say um, thank you for having me. And um, I am a little disturbed at the fact that you did not kneel with everybody um, at the protest the other day. Um, I think it really shows, um, I don't know, I feel like that you we need to stand together through all of this. And um, there are a few things that I feel like we could do to help Black Lives Matter. Um, and one of them could be to protect the Black landmarks that we have, the Mark St. Mark Baptist Church in the Franklin neighborhood. Um, also, if we could, um, you know, condemn, condemn police brutality and declare racism as a public health emergency. Um, um, also, if we can demand institutional support for the annual Juneteenth celebration, um, thank you for your time. Thank you. More speakers? Next speaker is Kimmy Van Dyke. Kimmy Van Dyke, please go ahead. Hello, my name is Kimmy Van Dyke, and I'm a founding member of 5G Free Santa Barbara. We have uh, sent multiple emails and invitations over the past three months to set meetings with you prior to next Tuesday's Rise and Wireless License Agreement discussion. Only one of you has agreed to meet about this important decision to date. It is clear to us that both the public works staff and your legal department are not experienced or up to speed on high level court cases and nuances of the latest FCC regulations that empower the city to regulate and protect against the biological harms of this technology. We have extensive research on legal precedents and national and statewide trends to share. While your staff is characterizing the Verizon wireless agreement as good for the city and can be amended at any time, however, any amendments being proposed by your public works director would need to be agreed upon by Verizon Wireless. The city has, not, um, has no assurance that Verizon would agree, especially if the amendments cost them time or money. Your staff is stating that if you don't execute this agreement, Verizon Wireless can start installing facilities on separate poles due to the 60 or 90 day shot clock for approving permits. While the telecom industry has done a good job lobbying and convincing officials that a shot clock exists in California, it does not. 
According to FCC regulations, the local permitting agency can take a reasonable period of time taking into account the nature and scope of each request. We demand a moratorium on all WTF permits until a new ordinance is vetted and adopted and that you not approve the Verizon Wireless License Agreement. Executing this long-term agreement without understanding what it is and what it commits you to over the next 10 to 20 years exposes the city to significant liabilities. This has been successfully done in other cities in California and across the country. Again, we ask that you meet with us for 20 to 30 minutes prior to next Tuesday to review this complex and evolving matter. All lives matter. Uh, we'll go to the next speaker, please. Thanks. Next speaker is Crystal Seekhart. Crystal Seekhart, please go ahead. Kathy, 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 you should absolutely be ashamed of yourself. Sitting up there, not even empathizing with speakers after how you treated me and Simone after we led the most peaceful protest. We brought beautiful energy into this community, something that this community needed. We are literally going through a pandemic and we were able to collect over 3,000 of your constituents together to gather to condemn police brutality, to stand in solidarity with black lives and to call out a lot of corruption in this community. We are tired, we are tired and we very well put you in your position. So let, you let me remind you who you work for since you want to tell me something. We are here, we are loud, and we are proud, and we will not be silenced. Y'all will listen, and y'all will learn from us, and y'all will pay us to do this work as we have deserved to. A lot of organizers have been in this community putting down for vulnerable folks, and we are tired. We aren't getting taken scraps no more. Y'all need to do your jobs. Hold yourselves accountable for the harm that you have caused people in this community we require transparency. Even in this situation right now, on this webinar, this is an inequity in itself. You know how hard it is to log on to here and do this, and you expect vulnerable folks to be able to come and say their piece? This is ridiculous. Do better. Come on. Y'all have to do your jobs. And don't ever in your life again try to silence or speak over a black women. We are the most marginalized group in the world and we will be heard, we are tired. We built social justice movements on our back and the SB community saw an example of that. We won't be silenced and we will keep going. And I hope you reach out so we can teach you how to do your job. Go to the next speaker, please. Next speaker is Kim Paskowitz. Kim Paskowitz. Please go ahead. Hello, Mayor and City and Council members. On Sunday, May 31st, Black women organizers in Santa Barbara created a peaceful, heartfelt, truth-telling demonstration at the courthouse. Speaker after speaker voiced their truth, fear, and the pain they have experienced here in Santa Barbara. On Sunday, we heard and saw in person how communities of color have been ignored and how they have not been invited to the table where policies and decisions are made about their own communities. The response by the Santa Barbara Police Department was shameful on Sunday. Our peaceful protest was met with a barricade and police in riot gear. Over and over again, the police were asked to kneel like other departments have done around the country to show their solidarity and they refused as BLM laid down on the ground for eight minutes and 46 seconds in front of the police barricade. The silence from Santa Barbara police was loud and clear. It was painful to see this response. The chief of police released a statement without even consulting the community she was making statements about. In her statement, she claimed that she is exposed every day to the high moral standards, respect, and empathy that her officers demonstrate. That was not seen on Sunday. Community policing is not to make sure that white Santa Barbara feels safe. Community policing means that all communities feel safe and have a place at the table to create and advise police task force policies and procedures. No more gang injunctions, handpicked task force and lack of transparency. I too was dismayed that the mayor did not show the support and respect needed in the moment for Black Lives Matter on Sunday. The mayor and Santa Barbara Police Office, uh, Department did the opposite of solidarity and instead of building trust, they drove a stake deeper between our communities and further distrust and rage. 
I'm here to listen to the mayor and each council member, their response to each demand Black Lives Matter has laid out for you. I am listening to concrete in actions you tend to take to support their Thank demands. You. Thank you so much. Next speaker. Next speaker is Lauren Trujillo after Lauren Trujillo, Lizette Barriman, Maciela Morales and Mallory Stevens. Lauren Trujillo, please go ahead. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and City Council members. My name is Lauren Trujillo and I'm the Foundation Director of the Santa Barbara Public Library Foundation. First, I would like to recognize George Floyd and stand by our local Black Lives Matter organizers. I also wanna share that our library is committed to honoring Black history, amplifying Black voices and building brighter futures for the Black community with programs like the Juneteenth celebration, the oral history collection of Black people in Santa Barbara and celebrating Black artists. Please use the free resources the library provides to get educated, get uncomfortable, listen, and read. Second, I am here today to speak on behalf of the Library Foundation in response to the library budget hearing last week. I would like to thank you for supporting the library and recognizing the vital role it plays in the community, especially during crisis. Following the library budget hearing last week, we were disappointed to discover that the $4 million cuts from Measure C, more than half of that, 2.4 million, has been taken from the library. The library and foundation have been working with the city for well over a year to get this project off the ground. And we were encouraged by the 1.15 million in Measure C funds budgeted for Library Plaza. Uh, we successfully made it through the rigorous HLC process this past November, but we can't move forward without the 1.15 committed from the city. Now more than ever is the time for Santa Barbara to invest in a revitalized public square that offers safe, ramped accessibility to learners of all ages, as well as a safe community outdoor space for a variety of cultural and educational programs for the library, for our cultural arts neighbors and partners closed during this time, and for our downtown. Thank you for leading our city through these uncertain times and for reconsidering the 1.15 million Measure C funds for our library plaza. Thank you. Thank you. Another speaker? Next speaker is Lizette Barriman. She has she is now offline. Next speaker is um, uh, Maisela Morales. Maisela Morales, please go ahead. Yes, hello, good afternoon, mayor and council members. My name is Maricela Morales and I'm executive director of CAUSE and the CAUSE Action Fund. And it's with a heavy heart that um, I make public comment today. Um, black lives are being murdered. Um, we still have our life. And um, to, to hear that, that the police showed up in riot gear to a peaceful protest, um, to, to hear that, um, that Mayor Murillo, that you did not take a knee um, is, is really disappointing, is really painful. And as has been said before, um, there is a lot um, that is going to have to be rebuilt um, following Sunday's protest. And there's an invitation to do that. Um, we now have a city council here in Santa Barbara that is majority women. And as women, we know what it is to be silenced. We know what it is to be disproportionately at, at risk at the, at the harm of uh, our own loved ones. This is our time as women to be in solidarity with black women's leadership. The council is almost 50% um, uh, Latino, people of color now in Santa Barbara. So as brown people, this is our time to stand in solidarity along with and behind our black brothers and sisters and follow their lead. There is no more time for us to um, you know, sit and wait uh, it's time for us as women, as people of color in elected office to show true leadership. And we look forward to working with you for Black Lives Matter and their demands. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our speaker? Yes, our next speaker is Mallory Stevens, then Samoz Reskamp, then Marge Perko, then Maria Elaine Drost. Mallory Stevens?
We'll come back to Mallory Stevens, um, Simone Roskamp. One moment. Okay, Simone Roskamp, please go ahead. Yes, I'm here. Um, first, I wanna start off by addressing the city council members. You mentioned that you were touched by what Crystal and I did, but when you had an opportunity to call out the mayor for her inaction, for her aligning with violent police, you refused to do so, so I expect you to do better. Kathy Mario, as the mayor, I expect you to resign. Even though I was entertained by your encore performance that you gave today and the words that came out of your mouth, your actions have already spoken for you. You still, as of now, have not reached out to any of the leaders of the protest, even though you have our emails. After the event that you attended, where you yelled in our faces, you issued a statement erasing the Black people that you had just talked to, and you thank the chief. It is so obviously insincere, and how dare you mention the names of Black people who have died violently in vain. You were fine asking and reaching out to Black people to go door to door for you to get you elected. But as soon as you got in that office, you revealed that you had stolen our votes. To the chief, you have had my email for years. I got an email from you minutes before this meeting, again showing that your commitment to this is not sincere. I guess you wanted to do that to make sure I couldn't say in public that you still didn't reach out to Black people, but your efforts are paper thin. Why would you issue a statement without speaking to Black people if you were trying to support them? Why would you tell your officers to refuse to kneel? Why would you refuse to come out for conversation and then send out Kathy Mario in an armored vehicle with your PR person? Why would you tell your officers to not only refuse to kneel, but then allow them to deny the humans laying at their feet? It was so silent in those eight minutes, I could hear the leaves rustling, so I could hear your officers snickering and making comments as we cried on the ground. You all should be ashamed. And I want to make sure you know that the community is watching. And your request to have millions of dollars to build a police building, we will make sure that does not happen. You will not be awarded for showing yourself to not be community-minded police. You all need to be ashamed. Thank you, Ms. Ruskamp. Uh, next speaker. Next speaker is Marge Perko, then Maria Elaine Drost, then Marissa Quintana, then Matt Lowe. Maria Elaine Drost, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Maria Dross. Um, I moved to the community two years ago when I was relocated to manage a business here um, when my, the people I work for purchased a franchisee that was already existing. When I moved here, I moved here blindly. I had never been to Santa Barbara before. I'm originally from upstate New York, but I was coming from Portland, Oregon, and I moved here with my ex-boyfriend who's a black man. There was no diversity in Portland, so I was kind of feeling optimistic when I moved here because I saw more people of color and it's something that I really value in the community that I'm living in and that I'm participating in. Um, I'm here to share my experience from Sunday and I'm here to make a quick comment on the opening statement. Uh, when my first apartment, so moving here blindly, I had never been here before. I couldn't believe my eyes. It was like, it was a postcard. I couldn't believe it. My first apartment was on Garden Street between Annapamu and Figueroa. I'm very familiar with the police station. On Sunday, which was my 29th birthday, it was no question where I was gonna be. I'm fully in support of the Black Lives Matter community in Santa Barbara. I think you guys should feel fortunate that you have women who organize and that you're not seeing any disruption that's happening in all of these other cities. My best friends are in Minneapolis, the Bronx. I mean, you all know it, right? So you guys should feel fortunate right now. Sunday was beautiful. And so I was dropped off on the corner I used to live on, on Garden in Anapamu, and I walked down. And my first impression of that protest was seeing everyone already in riot gear. Everyone had helmets on. And when they saw me take a picture of them, everyone's body language immediately tensed up. And I'm a white woman. So what does that say? And then I was there and it was beautiful. It was such a beautiful afternoon. I'm a yoga teacher in the community. And when we sat and knelt, I knelt on the ground. That was the hardest close to nine minutes that I've ever been in stillness. And that's someone who's used to being in stillness. Just made a comment on listening to the, the leaves rustle. My sensory thing, I kept watching the stoplight go red, yellow, green, red, yellow, green, and thinking like how many cars would have passed that situation and not said anything. My comment on the opening statement is that, well, I think it's great that we had a moment of silence, to be honest, hearing 
the words George Floyd and me out of the mayor's mouth after not seeing her deal when we chanted and gave that opportunity was triggering to me. And then to have the moment of silence, but to have the moment of silence, there was a really clear distinction that I think needs to be made here. He was not murdered by an officer. He was murdered by four officers. And it's the three other officers and the complicity that exists within this system. That's the problem. Another, I'm out of time, I'm sorry. So I'll pass it over from here. My other quick Thank note you. actually while I'm here, because I feel like I'm on a roll, State Street has opportunity, gives opportunity to black business owners to have brick and mortar businesses so that we are not passing empty storefronts every day. Thank you. Thank you. Another speaker? Next speaker is Marissa Quintana, then Matt Lowe, then Maura Sullivan, then Megan Spencer. Marissa Quintana, go ahead. Hi, so first of all, thank you Chrissy, Simone, and the team for a beautiful Sunday. I'm here to also demand changes in our local community as demanded by Black Lives Matter and Juneteenth Santa Barbara. I do demand you finally reach out to them, Mayor. I am appalled and disappointed by your actions and Santa Barbara PD's actions on Sunday. Mayor, your reaction was uncalled for and shows your true stance when it comes to the Black Lives Matter movement. It is your job to listen to the people of Santa Barbara. The disrespect from the officers shows that they believe this is a joke, and it scares me to think that they are the ones out in our community serving to bring peace and protect us. I am curious as to why communities of minorities are also brought up during election seasons, but often forgotten afterwards. As a predominantly Latino council and as a Latina, I demand better from all of you. Know that I and thousands of others will truly be looking at your response from here on out and you will be held accountable. Thank you. Next speaker. And we are asking people if they could do a one minute um, presentation, we would be grateful. Thank you. Our next speaker is Matt Lowe. One moment. Mr. Lowe, please go ahead. Hi, Mayor Murillo and city council members. Um, I've heard many nice responses by you and your mourning and condolences for um, the death of George Floyd and in the uprising that has thus taken place. And I don't wanna talk about the actions on Sunday right now. The demands are clear and I think they need to be followed through. But right now I also wanna talk about the city and the officials from the city council to all the way to the um, economic development department to our police department. We need to hire, hire a racial equity consultant and do a full through, thorough analysis of our full city's um, construction and systems to make sure that racial equity is intertwined and deepened throughout our, the way our city is run. The call for public health addressing racism right now is de deeply urgent and should be addressed and put forth by the city council and affirmed. In this process, it is a truth hearing that needs to be heard to hear the harms of the community and to understand what our community is dealing with We need to do this as a healing process so that restoration can take place in our community. I believe in each of one of you that you want to do good for our community and you are here to serve and to be a healing force for good in our community. And we need you to step up now and move forward. And we can do this together, but we need to address the underlying systems. So please address a racial equity consultant for the city and all of the city's departments so that we can move through on a path of healing and address racism as a public health concern because it is hurting our community and many of my friends are hurting and crying and mourning. And please address this issue. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Maura Sullivan, then Megan Spencer, Miranda Vasquez, and Peter Tilton. Maura Sullivan. Maura Sullivan, please. Go ahead. Haku Mapchumawish Molakati Shmochino. My name is Maura Sullivan. 
I'm a local Native American woman born at the village of Hel'o, Goleta. I am Chumash. As the caretakers of our unceded and ancestral homelands, it is our ancestral mandate and duty to care for all people in our territories. And at this time, I urge everyone to put that focus and that care on our black friends and family. The event on Sunday was beautiful. It was tragic. It was heartbreaking to hear the direct testimony of black people in Santa Barbara. What was worse was the mayor and SBPD's behavior at the police station. The crowd kneeled and the mayor and the police did not. There was clearly no threat. Do the police not have the capacity to express humanity and honor our black friends and family for less than 10 minutes? I honestly do not have any faith in the police to assess real threats. I demand you meet all demands of BLM Santa Barbara, honor black history in Santa Barbara, support and fund mental health and alternative community security that is not SBPD. Do not continue to perpetuate the state and colonial violence that began with my ancestors. Do not erase black lives and black pain. Shame on the mayor for her posturing and also for not wearing her face mask during the exchange. She directly threatened the health and safety of the young women and she forced them to take a position to defend their voices. How dare you? I also demand all council members take serious anti-racist training to address white supremacy and uh, white privilege. I demand that of all council members. Thank you. Mep Shumawish, Shumawish, Atipa Shumawish, Shumash people for Black Lives. Very nice. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Megan Spencer, then Miranda Vasquez, then Peter Tilton, then Roseanne Crawford. Megan Spencer, please go ahead. Megan Spencer, please unmute yourself and go ahead. You had logged in twice. Go ahead. Thank you. Mayor Mario, you did not have to do this. You did not have to respond to your community with neglect and opposition. You did not have to further the harm of anti-blackness in the streets of the place you serve. You have a choice, as do all members of the council and the entire community of Santa Barbara. I hope you and the council will put your feelings to the side and will do what needs to be done. If you believe Black Lives Matter, you must put your time, resources, and energy toward material changes. You must look to the leadership of Black Lives Matter, Santa Barbara, and Juneteenth, and the Black community of Santa Barbara, and allow them to lead. And on a personal note, I want to share the immense and visceral feel, uh, fear that I felt being in a crowd of people confronted with police in riot gear and wondering what might happen to me and to the other Black people around me. Finally, I want to say that as a Black woman living in Santa Barbara, a place where I rarely feel welcomed, I wish to express my deep gratitude to the Black and Indigenous women who organized Sunday's demonstration. Thank you so much for your powerful leadership. Thank you, ma'am. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Miranda Vasquez. Miranda Vasquez, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Miranda Vasquez and I was born and raised here in Santa Barbara and I've recently returned to my hometown after getting a degree in critical race and ethnic studies at UC Santa Cruz. I'm here today to condemn the actions taken by Mayor Murillo on Sunday afternoon. At the beginning of today's meeting, it was acknowledged that Black Americans are dying of COVID-19 at a disproportionate rate. However, on Sunday afternoon, I witnessed Mayor Murillo remove her mask before attempting to speak over and silence a Black woman who organized the protest. Your actions are not only an act of white supremacy, but of potential biological warfare. This act, in addition to your refusal to take a knee alongside non-Black allies and approval of the hyper-militarization of SPPD against protesters, prove your utter disregard for Black lives. Mayor Murillo, your actions are utterly reprehensible, and I hope you understand that the words you've said today will not overshadow the anti-Black actions you've taken in the past. Thank you. Very good. Next speaker. 
Our next speaker is Peter Tilton. Peter Tilton, please go ahead. Hello, um, I'm a local physician and longtime resident of Santa Barbara, and I want to switch topics to talk about um, Santa Barbara County Health Officer Order number 2020-8 that does not permit hotels, motels, et cetera, to allow for non-essential guests in our city. Uh, over the Memorial Day weekend, the uh, State Street Promenade was filled with tourists and locals alike also not wearing masks. Why are these ordinances not being enforced? That also considers um, the other ordinance of um, order number 2020-10 that talks about having masks on when doing business in public. I called several hotels and motels and they're all accepting out of town guests without regard to whether or not they are essential workers. It's simple. You have to enforce this if you wanna keep the COVID numbers low. Our communities had a low number because of social distancing, wearing masks and relative isolation from other communities. Now that commerce is opening up, the tourists are coming, people are more cavalier, they're not wearing their masks and where is local enforcement? Without enforcement, these orders are meaningless. If you want to protect the community members from a virus that doesn't care what color you are, what race you are, what religion you are, it causes infections, hospitalizations, and death. I implore you, once again, as I did to prevent the cruise ships from coming in, to get the police on the streets, finding people if they refuse to put on masks, going to the hotels and the motels and finding people the thousand dollars required if they are not following the orders. Thank it's you so much. Thank you for your Good. time. Thanks. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Roseanne Crawford. One moment. Ms. Crawford, please go ahead. Roseanne Crawford, please go ahead. You may unmute yourself and speak. There we go, sorry, I couldn't unmute. Um, I hear so much anger here and justifiable that there's so much anger and sadness. As Santa Barbara stands in solidarity and sadness, Mayor Murillo, I really want to commend your courage in directly approaching the crowd on State Street. Your motive was so clearly and sadly misunderstood in the heat of the moment. I watched the video and what I saw was compassion in an attempt to communicate from a hands-on mayor. Thank you very much, Mayor Murillo, for your leadership, commitment, and sensitivity to this community, I am proud to be a member of this community that is so caring to everyone of all colors. Thank you. Thank you. More speakers, Ms. Clerk? Yes, our next speakers are Sage Gaspar, Sofia Stefanovic, Sofia Zatorsky, Stacy Castillo, and Una Lama. Sage Gaspar. and I believe Sage Gaspar may have left. So we will go to Sofia Stefanovic. Sofia Stefanovic, please go ahead. Sofia Stefanovic, go ahead. Sofia Stefanovic, we, we can't hear you, we will come back. Sophia Zatorsky, you are next. Uh, Sophia Zatorsky, please go ahead. Hello, my name is Sophia Zatorsky and I'm a local resident here. Um, I just wanna start off by saying that I was extremely disappointed in Kathy Murillo's performance and the SBPD's performance in Sunday's demonstration. Um, 
the two women, Simone and Crystal, who were really leading us had showed such leadership and really opened a door for healing and for change. They had opened their hearts to, to allow you to speak up and stand up for the right thing. And, and to even allow that forgiveness is such a dignifying thing for them to do. And just your response to have turned it down, not taken the knee and even tried to speak over them and remove your mask just showed the insidious problem that America has. And your opening remarks seem so polite and so quaint, but we are all looking for action and we will be watching. We really demand that the police start to take a look at these violent methods that were used on the black men of America and that we're addressing these by certain demands. Um, we demand that there are new policies set into the SBD police and the SB Sheriff's Department. We also demand that mental health be a forefront and a goal of the Santa Barbara County. We also demand, excuse me a moment. We also demand that there are more internal investigations of misconduct, no more inv internal investigations of misconduct, and that we create a civilian review board with members selected by community so that all of us can truly speak up and we can hear the black people of our community and listen to them for a change. Thank you. Very good. <clears throat> Another speaker? Our next speaker is Stacy Castillo. After Stacy Castillo, Uma Lama, Vivian Avia, Avia, Wendy Aguilar, Javier Alvarez, and Jack, Zach Mendez. Stacy Castillo, please go ahead. Witness the officers not even trying to make eye contact with the protesters wearing um, wearing layers of riot gear as they took as we took a knee and our black sisters and brothers laid on the ground crying and holding each other's hands. Not one officer kneeled. And when I saw Mayor Kathy, who is a Mexican American like myself, I was ashamed to see one of my own people act so cold to look the other way. That is not okay. You need to see what is wrong. You need to open your eyes and not look the other way. We celebrate fiestas in Santa Barbara like it's Christmas, but we don't even acknowledge black history or black people in this city. I'm so sick of this. We need to see change. This is not okay. We need to defund the police. We don't need another police department. We don't need that. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Uma Lama. Uma Lama, please go ahead. We, I'm so, we can't hear you. Ma Madam Mayor, we will come back to Uma Lama. Our next speaker is Vivian Avila. Vivian Avila, please go ahead. Vivian, and I'm here to show my support for the Santa Barbara Black Lives Matters demands. I believe that racism should be considered a health emergency and that we should, in Santa Barbara, we should condemn police brutality because that is not okay. And I can't believe, I was not able to go to the protest, but I am so sad that I saw my own community, the people, police in our own community wearing riot gear. like. And even like the mayor, the mayor going to the black leaders and trying to silence them, that is not okay. So I am just here to show my support and that the Santa Barbara community needs to change and that we need to actively be anti-racist because all of this is just not okay. Thank you. Another speaker, Ms. Gorman. We will come back to Uma Lama. Uma Lama, please unmute yourself and go ahead. 
Hi, can you hear me? Okay. Hi, my name is Uma Lama and I'm a local high school student. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Um, I will keep this short and sweet since I know time is um, of the essence or whatever. Okay. I attended the peaceful protest on Sunday with the Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara and I was deeply empowered and touched by the speeches I heard and to see our community come together in an unprecedented time in all of our lives. But I was extremely disappointed and appalled with the Santa Barbara Police Department. Crystal Seigart said directly to them, and I quote, if you condemn police brutality, if there's no bad people on the police department, then you should be standing with us in your community in solidarity. They did not in their action or inaction will, be, will not be forgotten and neither will your attempt, Madam Mayor, to silence Crystal and Simone at the protest. We need serious change within our own community and I wholeheartedly stand with the demands that Black Lives Matter, Santa Barbara and Juneteenth put forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another speaker? Our next speaker is Wendy Aguilara, then Javier Alvarez, Zach Mendez, Ana Zepeda, and Andrea Medina. Wendy Aguilara, please go ahead. Wendy Aguilara, please go ahead. We will come back to Wendy Aguilara. Javier Alvarez, Javier Alvarez, please go ahead. Good afternoon. My name is Javier Alvarez. I'll keep this brief. I attended the event this past Sunday, and I want to voice my support for every single demand Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara put forward. As others have mentioned, they gave you a gift, and you did not deserve that gift. I want to reiterate that actions speak louder than words. Your inaction on Sunday speaks volumes in itself. Your continued lack of outreach to the leaders speaks volumes. Shame on you. I also want to call out Council Member Oscar. How dare you talk back to your constituents the way you have, not only today, but I've also seen the emails you have sent and replied to my wife, voicing her support for this movement. You are an elected official held to a higher standard. This is not about you. Lastly, all residents combining the microwave with this movement, shame on you. You are part of the problem and part of the systemic racism here. I see my time. Thank you, sir. Next speaker. We'll come back to Wendy Aguilera. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Um, Mayor Kathy and city council members who benefit from white privilege, socioeconomic privilege, and any other non-black privilege. I want to emphasize that although it was nice to hear your lovey dovey opening statements, we don't need words, we demand actions. When the SBPD and Mayor Kathy Murillo openly chose not to take a knee in memory of George Floyd and the hundreds of other black people murdered, know that if we had any faith and trust in you, we lost it. Police and riot gear and shields were not necessary. You added to the negative narrative that black and brown people are innately criminals. Shame on you. You traumatized my 10 year old daughter and the other children in the crowd and every other black and brown person there. You knew the peaceful, the protest was peaceful and that's how it was planned. And yet your behavior was evident that you did not and do not stand with us. Comply with the demands of Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara and Juneteenth. Actions speak louder than words. And don't even think for a second that we're not watching you and your facial expressions that you did when Crystal was speaking. We see your body language, we see your facial expressions, and that is a problem. Hold yourself and your council accountable. Crystal and Simone and everyone here, we stand with you. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is, um, excuse me, Andrea Medina, then Azura Stewart, then Chloe Chu, then Kristen Brown.
Anna, excuse me. Anna Zapeta, please go ahead. Hello. Okay, Mayor, I joined Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara in demanding that Santa Barbara City Council adopt a resolution condemning police brutality and declare racism a public health emergency. Because I was born and raised in Santa Barbara and I have seen too many of the black community be silenced in this community. I have seen the black community be pushed out, a prime example at the Sunday Black Lives Matter rally. As a mother and a community member who works with youth of color, I challenge you to really be different. Show your community that we can be different. This is your opportunity to spark true change in our community. And if you believe that Santa Barbara is exempt from the violence, you are very blinding. Not one more. Let's show everybody that we can be different. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gorman? Are there other speakers, Ms. Gorman? Can you hear me? This is Andrea Medina. Oh, go ahead, Ms. Medina. Thank you. Thank you. As a Mexicana and active community member, I've closely witnessed and experienced the SBPD's and city representatives' continuous aggressions by action or inaction towards the indigenous, black, and brown communities in our home. Today, I feel profound indignation and pain from the response of Mayor Murillo and the SBPD, as well as your statements. I ask the demands put forth by Black Lives Matter SB be followed immediately. You chose to serve our community and the community is speaking to you. You must work with local native and black leaders, saying you're implementing restorative approaches because you're working with white led organizations is not restorative justice. Thank you, Simone Baker, Crystal Farmer, and the black community for embodying justice and speaking the truth. Let's listen, Santa Barbara, and let's support their call for action. We don't need moments of silence. We're in much need of justice and healing. Thank you. Thank you. Another speaker? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, we have 10 more speakers who have raised, raised their hand. Um, Azur, next order is Azur Stewart, Chloe Chu, Kristen Brown, Alejandra Mendoza. Azur Stewart, please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Hi, um, hello, Mayor and City Council. Um, my name is Azure Stewart. I've been a resident and an employee of Santa Barbara, and I can attest to the events that happened on Sunday. I'm thoroughly disappointed by the police department's response, the mayor's actions in relation to the protests, and the non-acknowledgement of Crystal Seacart Farmer and uh, Simone Russ Camp, um, who organized this beautiful event. These behaviors have been a typical pattern of folks in this community to make those of us who are Black feel invisible, including myself. I urge you to follow through on their demands and support our community and to quit speaking out on our behalf without including us in conversations. I encourage you to take actions. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Chloe Chu. Chloe Chu, please go ahead. Hi, all right. I just want to remind everyone that the actions you make are extremely powerful. You may have decided to make a stance today, but that still does not excuse you. I need to emphasize this, that even if you had decided to take a knee, and even if you had knelt with all of the police officers, that still would not change the systematic problems. The fact that you could not even do that says a lot. But from here on out, the fact that you've decided to change your mind and take a knee here, means that you're willing to listen to change and i'd like to advocate for you to not only make continue making the sense now but keep making that and follow up behind your words with actual actions thank you that's all our next thank speaker you. our next speaker is kristen brown then alejandra mendoza david behana jennifer hale jessica brown kristen brown please go ahead Hi there, um, my name is Kristen Brown and my wife and I are both um, black business owners here in Santa Barbara. We own two businesses and we have for the past 11 years. 
We're originally from Oakland, California. And when my parents first found out that we were moving to Santa Barbara, they were thrilled because they knew that it was going to be safer. Although Oakland now is a lot safer than what it was years ago. I mean, there are places where, you know, we know that we have white allies who live in these places that used to be called the murder dubs that are now like super gentrified. And it has become so apparent to us that the way that we felt unsafe sometimes in Oakland, we felt unsafe here in Santa Barbara. And unfortunately, we're not able to make the Sunday um, rally. And the, the reason was actually quite simple. Um, some of the ways that have been expressed, not only with us being Black business owners, but a lot of the injustices that we have faced as just members of the community have been so hard. And I commend highly to Crystal and to Simone for organizing such an absolutely incredible, and I do, I, I thoroughly am sorry that we were not able to be there because um, it's heartbreaking and we would all love to see a lot more action. For us being business owners too, this is a, a major stand that we are taking for people who come into our store, who come into our storefront and know that you are supporting a black business. Again, the, in, um, the situation was simple that we were unable to make it. And it was because I wanted to be able to go home to my daughter. Protests from around the country have shown that a lot of people are showing up and they are not able to go home. And even though Santa Barbara is considered to be super safe, um, the fact that people did show up in riot gear, the police definitely proved that it's otherwise not the same. So thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Gorman, you say another five people have raised their hands. I'm, we'll have to cut it off after that. <laughs> We've been going for two hours and we will reopen public comment at the end of our meeting. But let's go ahead and take the there's several people in line still yes and you have two minutes but if you can speak your piece in one minute um we would be grateful thank you we have alejandra mendoza then david behena then jennifer hale then jessica brown alejandra mendoza please go ahead no goza sorry We can't hear you, Ms. Mel Melgoza. Sorry. Um, Madam Mayor and City Council, I am here in full support of the Black Lives Matter demands created by Black Lives Matter SB. I am asking you to make this a personal commitment to listen to Black voices, prioritize Black life, Black joy, and Black communities. The militarization of police at Sunday's action demonstrates your commitment to upholding state violence while black women were in all their power and ensuring everyone's spiritual mental and physical safety in contrast the city turned away and did not provide that work on the demands and follow the lead of the organizers thank you thank you next speaker next speaker is david bahena david bahena please go ahead Hi, um, my name is David Baena. The H is silent, by the way. Um, I just want to say, um, I'm a Mexica resident right here from Carpinteria, and I just want to say to the mayor from Santa Barbara that I think that was wrong what you did, and I just want you to conflict and just think back, because you know I don't have a fancy like like language for what everybody's saying right now. I don't have a fancy like like talk or whatever, but I'm here for black black lives. And if, and when I saw that man get killed, oh, I'm just so heated, like, because I'm, I'm dark brown. I'm not black, but I'm dark brown, and I know what it feels like. When I saw that man get killed on TV under a white man's knee, it, that took me back to where I'm from. I'm from Mexico City. We got colonized by white people, all this. I, I'm not going to give you a history story right now, but honestly, just think back. All, all natives, all dark people, every color, I saw every every dark color under that man's knee. So I just want to let you know it's us men getting it. Even females, brown females, black females, man. Like I, I've been had enough. The only reason why I didn't act upon because I saw your cops smirking. You never been in the ground. 
You've never been arrested. I don't think you have. What I have, I've been, I've been Deltopia and IV. I got hit by freaking math, by freaking whatever, the freaking rubber bullets, all that. I've been in real riots. That's why I didn't want to start one this time because I knew it was friendly. And But I understand what's going on around the world, honestly. And the only reason why I didn't act upon this because the sisters right there, they held me back. But I, I'm done with all this bullshit too. Honestly, I'm done with the color. Like, I didn't grow up like that. So it's just fucked up what you did. It's take. It's just a knee. That's it. That's all you could have done. I, that was the least you could have done. Thank you for your comments. Next speaker. The next speaker is Jennifer Hale. Jennifer Hale, please go ahead. Hello, Council. First and foremost, I want to express my full support that the Council integrate immediately the demands put forth by Black Lives Matter. Anything less is absolutely unacceptable. I heard a few of you saying the right thing at the start of this call two hours ago, but we don't need nice words. We need action. Stop silencing and dismissing Black lives as you did on Sunday, and I witnessed firsthand, and ignoring the voices of our Black community leaders. Your actions on Sunday and for years have been shameful. Crystal and Simone are the true leaders, and they and all of our Black community members deserve immediate support and action. As leaders, it's time to stop being part of the problem and use your power to dismantle the oppressive systems in Santa Barbara. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hale. Next speaker. Next speaker is Jessica Brown. Jessica Brown, please go ahead. Hello, Mayor and City Council. Um, my name is Jessica Brown. I'm a 17 year old high school student and I was just here to observe and attempt to involve myself in the Black Lives Matter movement in any way possible. But I don't wanna repeat the powerful messages of other speakers in regards to time. I merely want to address the actions of the council members that I've noticed. Each time a new speaker begins, Mayor Maria's face flashes with optimism and a small smile as if she hopes that a different topic would be addressed and that she would not have to be challenged again. I noticed the way that the council members become personally offended and defensive when constituents come forward with direct actions that challenge them. This is my own interpretation, but I'm sure it is observed by, by my fellow speakers today. This is not the example that I expected when joining the council meeting. I expected courage, empathy, understanding, and an apology. I challenge you to handle the situation in a way that alters history for the better, that brings forward the demands of the Black Lives Matter SB and creates a future that is better for the youth that will soon be inheriting a structure of racism and pre-built white privilege. I am not a person of color. I am not entitled to speaking for anyone else, but I can speak on the necessity of maturity in a city council that's responsibility is to speak up for all of us and whose responsibility is to speak up for black lives today and every day in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speakers are Jonathan Abood, Sophia Stefanovic, Leslie Weinstock, Marge Perko, and Ashley Henning. You know, Jonathan just, Abood. I think that form of like. One moment. Jonathan Abood, please go ahead. Jonathan Abood, you're up. Please go ahead. I've been I've been speaking. Am I am I going now? It's your time. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you the to the council for hearing us today and may, and the mayor. I just wanted to add my voice to the support for the Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara demands and hope that they're implemented quickly. And I'd also like to add my voice expressing disappointment that you know, the mayor and the Santa Barbara Police Department refused to kneel with the community on Sunday, bringing an armored car and riot gear in the first place and interrupting the protest leaders, Crystal Farmer and Simone Ruskamp. And I just want to thank you for some of the comments that were made at the beginning and uh, who supported the demands. And big thank you to Councilmember Harmon for proposing the additional idea of social impact analysis. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Sofia Stefanovic. I don't believe Sofia Sofanovic is, is on the line. Leslie Weinstock. Leslie Weinstock. Leslie Weinstock, please go ahead. Thank you. Leslie Weinstock, physician assistant. Health is of paramount importance, especially during COVID-19. Science has established microwave radiation is harmful to health. We remind you that RF microwave radiation is a man-made toxic agent that causes systemic biological damages at frequency levels thousands of times lower than the current extremely outdated FCC radiation exposure guidelines. People are getting sick from RF exposure. In the US, over 13 million people are severely affected by radio frequency radiation. I have had patients who were very sensitive to microwave radiation and went to extremes to try to escape it. If we cover the planet with densely placed wireless facilities, there will be no escape for anyone. It's like asking all of us to live 24 seven breathing in toxic cigarette smoke. We have important new information to share with you related to the Verizon wireless license agreement before your vote on June 9th. The good news is that local officials have full regulatory authority over the operations of WTF. We can provide references for that authority in detail. In addition, you are not preempted by the FCC and your hands are not tied. As you know, we request a moratorium, a protective ordinance, that you halt approval of wireless installations, that you vote against the license agreement on June 9th. We request to meet with you, secure 5G free Santa Barbara presentation on June 9th. We also have requested to collaborate with the city attorneys and there has been an unexplained breakdown in communication, which we would like to correct. We will provide substantial legal policy information to you to better understand the issues and empower you to protect our city and environment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weinstock. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Marge Perko. After Marge Perko, Ashley Henning, Dante Gonzalez, Gabriella O'Neill, and Justina Hall. Marge Perko. Oh, Marge Perko has left the meeting. Ashley Henning. Ashley Henning, please go ahead. Hi, I just wanted to express my um, support of Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara and of Crystal and Simone. And I want their demands to be acted on quickly and swiftly. And I really think it's important that the council revisit the funding of the new police station because we have so many bigger needs in this community like mental health services, healthcare services, and housing services. So I hope that that will be heard. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Dante Gonzalez. Dante Gonzalez, please go ahead. Um, my name is Dante Gonzalez. I'm a second generation born and raised Santa Barbarian. First of all, I want to say thank you to all the women of color and black women organizers, especially Crystal and Simone for allowing people like me to share in this fight for justice. You've been so vocal about everything and have been educating me and the whole community on what to do and where to go from here. I cannot thank you enough. It's my job right now as an ally to listen to black voices and to follow in their footsteps. The protest on Sunday was powerful. One of the last women who spoke, I'm forgetting her name, said, black people, black women, we've earned our seat at the table. What will you as white people do to earn yours? This is the time to stand up and to earn our seat at the table for humanity. We're here to love one another, but that's impossible to do now until there is justice. I'm very disappointed in our mayor, Kathy Murillo, for refusing to acknowledge Black Lives Matter, but also our police who have refused to take a knee in solidarity. There needs to be change, please. There's a list of demands and ways on how to execute those demands. Now do the work. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Gabriella O'Neill, then Justina Hall, then Megan Spencer, then Patrick Fleming. Gabriella O'Neill, please go ahead. 
Hello, I would like to say thank you to everyone who is here, who has come to speak their voice, who has come to be courageous. I am so grateful to the leaders of Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara for really representing black and brown people and our resistance to this system of violence. I stand with the demands and they are that, they are demands and we will come together and we will make those demands clear. I just want us to ask everyone who's listening, if we know where our city stands. Sunday showed us many things about Santa Barbara. Our, par our politicians are more focused on the order of policing brown and black bodies rather than having constructive dialogue. Rather than creating safety for our rightful outcry, the SP SBPD prepared to repress our voices. Our mayor approached the courageous leaders like it was an event for her campaign. This is not what leadership looks like. I just wanna say thank you so much to Simone and Chrissy and Black Lives Matter again for creating a safe space for us to honor life, to cry out for justice. And I support you all, I'm ready. Um, Santa Barbara, I hope all of y'all who are out there are ready because Santa Barbara City Council, SBPD, they've already made their side pretty clear. So this is activism. Thank you again. That's all. Thanks. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Justina Hall, then Megan Ms. Spencer. Ms. Gorman, Ms. Gutierrez has uh, turned on her light. Go ahead, Ms. Gutierrez. Right. Uh, Ms. Maria, I see that the chief is on the panelists. So after public comment, I I would like for her to have at least three minutes because I do have the question of where was she on Sunday and for her to give an explanation why she had her officers in those type of uniforms. Uh, very good. Thank you so much. If the chief is available, yes. Uh, oh, can I have come on, that motherfucker. She. I'm is sorry. a white who doubled forces when she came in and like got all kinds of money. Who's speaking, please? Ms. Gorman, I'm sorry, I, I lost track. Our next speaker is Justina Hall, who had not been unmuted yet. So it'll be Justina Hall, then Megan Spencer, then Patrick Fleming, then Peter Latta. Justina Hall. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Justina Hall. I just want to add my voice to support for the Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara um, demands that I think are extremely reasonable. Um, and I just want to let you know that I'll be doing my part to vote based on the actions taken by city officials, as well as encourage my friends and family to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next speaker. Our next speaker. Speaker is Megan Spencer. I believe that may also be Emma. Megan Spencer, Emma, please go ahead. Hi, so yes, I'm actually not Megan Spencer. Um, she spoke really beautifully earlier. Um, my name is Emma Schuster um, and I wanna keep it brief. I'm a resident here in Santa Barbara and I just wanna add my voice um, to the chorus of others who are urging you to meet the demands of Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara and Juneteenth Santa Barbara. Um, you have been provided with a straightforward list of what you need to do to take steps towards racial justice. You cannot claim that you don't know what to do. It is up to you whether you follow through on it or whether you refuse to stand in solidarity with the Black members of this community, as you disgustingly did on Sunday, Mayor Murillo. As others have already mentioned again and again, you are lucky to have such powerful leadership. We, we are lucky to have such powerful leadership from Black women here in Santa Barbara. We do not deserve it, you do not deserve it, but the very least you could do would be to listen to them and meet their demands. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Patrick Fleming. Patrick Fleming, please go ahead. First and foremost, I wanna say that I stand and give my strong support for the demands laid out by Black Lives, Santa Barbara, Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara and the Juneteenth organization. I believe that we should, be look, we should be reallocating the funds for the new police station, given the fact that we're facing one of the 
hardest economic times moving forward along with the violence that we've seen the last few weeks and or the history of this country. And finally, I'm relatively concerned but interested to hear from the police chief uh, her statement that she issued when she said, we must not shy away from courageous conversations and dialogue seems to be completely counter to her actions. What is courageous about a barrier? What is courageous about riot gear? Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Peter Latta, then Rachel Ng, then Sarah Cunningham. Peter Latta, please go ahead. Hello. Can Hello, we can hear you. Hi, Kathy. Thanks for having me. You look really stoked to be here. Nobody else is. I'd like to um, express my support for Black Lives Matter and Juneteenth. I would like to stand in solidarity with Black Lives Matter and Juneteenth. The demands they put forward must be honored. And I think I speak for everyone when I say that I'm eager to see some swift action on these demands. At the very least, I want somebody from our leadership on this call to acknowledge that you guys are actually gonna get to work on this as soon as possible. I'm not seeing a ton of emotion from the city council members here and I'd hope that with something this heavy going on, we'd have some leadership that wasn't so clinical in their response. You need to show us that you actually care. Please show us that you care and do something. Lastly, I just want to say to the 5G lady that said all lives matter, you're missing the point. All lives don't matter if black lives don't matter. Thank you. And I'm eager to respond to Kathy. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker, excuse me, our next speaker is Rachel Ng, then Sarah Cunningham, Sarah Murphy, Timo Rodriguez. Rachel Ng, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Rachel Ng and I was at the protest on Sunday. I was also a lead organizer for Santa Barbara March for Our Lives. And the treatment I had organizing that protest was such a different experience. During our march only a few years ago, the police marched with us. Why couldn't they do that on Sunday? Was it because black voices were being centered and not white voices? I'd also like to remind you that moving forward with these demands, they must be executed with black and women in the conversation and not in isolation of them. Furthermore, this work should be paid and the organizers compensated for their time and energy. Their labor should not be treated freely and that we should not exploit their work even further. The demonstration that happened on Sunday was done with no cost, but a large amount of their time was spent on it. Why do we continue to treat rallies and protests as if these organizers don't have other lives and don't deserve to be paid? Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Sarah Cunningham, then Sarah Murphy then Timo Rod Rodriguez, then Sofia Stefanovic. Sarah Cunningham, please go ahead. Hello, I'm Sarah Cunningham. Black Lives Matter. I thank the Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara um, organization led by Simone Ruskamp and Crystal Stighart for their gift of wisdom and leadership. I am disappointed and angry that you, Mayor Murillo and our police department who performatively, performatively issued Black Lives Matter statements in advance, did not join protesters on Sunday in kneeling, but instead stood in riot gear and behind armored vehicles. Actions speak louder than words, and these actions directly undermine your words. I wholeheartedly support the Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara's demands, and I demand that you and the council do so as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Sofia Stefanovic. One moment here. I believe that Sofia Stefanovic 
is no longer on the call. Karina Amaro. Karina Amaro, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Karina Amaro, and I wanted to just go ahead and quickly address Mayor Kathy and the police that were present. You guys missed your chance to take a knee, which was a simple yet powerful, powerful way of showing support. I'd like to know why you guys didn't take this opportunity. Also to the rest of the council, I heard a lot of people today saying that they heard you all saying the right things. Personally, I disagree. I don't think it's the time for saying, I'm showing up for you, where was my backup? Where were you when, you, when I needed you? And I also don't think it's the time to say, I was the only white guy on numerous teams. I'm here to remind you guys to please be mindful about how you respond. And I think it's the time for these responses to be actions, um, which lead into all of the demands put forth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker. Next speaker is Rochelle Monet. One moment. Rochelle, Rochelle Monet, please go ahead. Yes, can you hear me? Perfect. So there's four things I want to address today. And uh, the first one, of course, is your failure to me, as long as the police force's failure to me. I believe in redemption and second chances, and I'm assuming now you're probably realizing that was a horrible mistake. So what I would like to do is organize an event where you and those city of police um, come with us for those eight minutes and kneel while we lie um, out of, you know, remembrance from the murder that happened on national television. The second thing that I want to address is what I would consider as modern day redlining. Uh, you guys have only issued two cannabis licenses to two companies that are owned by uh, white males. African American and brown communities have been for hundreds of years uh, enslaved because of our sale um, and you know our involvement with marijuana. And once it's legal, you push us out. So I would like that reform to happen. The third thing I would like to happen is the racist name uh, Sambos on our waterfront. Uh, the city of Rhode Island actually prevented them from using that name, as did other cities nationwide. Yet in the city of Santa Barbara, you still allow a racial slur to, uh, you know, be present on our waterfront. And whenever you're asking for money, I understand that you need to find where do we take this money from? And uh, public records would actually show that Paul Casey makes $389,000 a year. He recently had a 2.5% pay increase, despite the fact that we're in a pandemic. So any and all funding that we need for our June 19th, I believe should and definitely uh, can come from his salary as the governor of California only makes $202,000 a year. Thank you. Thank you. More speakers, Ms. Gorman? Yes, Madam Mayor, three more. Manjo Singh. Maggie Burke and Emma Wilkins. Manjo Singh, please go ahead. Hi, thank you for um, allowing for this opportunity for the community to speak up. I just want to call out the space in which the first almost 15 to 20 minutes of this meeting, I kept hearing that we wanted to keep the Black voices in the center, yet I heard um, really, especially from the people of color on this panel, um, a missed opportunity to put our experiences aside and uplift the black community's um, voice. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, but I believe it's Oscar. In that time, I understand your sentiment, but I only heard about half a sentence uh, in which the Black community was mentioned in your statement. Um, please just recognize that when you have this voice and this place of power that you can, you have to be intentional about how you use your voice. Um, and our mayor, please, please take this chance to not make mistakes, especially when our black community has so graciously 
put what you need to do out on a silver platter. Thanks. Thank you. More speakers? <clears throat> Two more speakers, Maggie Burke and then Emma Wilkins. Maggie Burke, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Maggie Burke, and I'm not here to congratulate any of the comments um, that city council or the mayor has made today. And I want to echo what's already been said about the outrage um, and that your actions revealed, your actions on Sunday have revealed your true alliance lied or lies with the state sponsored terrorism. Uh, terrorism. And I know you heard the public support and applause for each and every one of those demands. I was standing not far from you and you stood there unmoved. Um, you even dipped out before you could even march in solidarity. We marched because you left and the police um, set up that barricade. But why do you choose silence um, until after you're called out and you make this symbolic gesture? City Council, your comments at the top of the meeting were centered around you. You say you're going to listen and amplify Black voices, but you spent quite a bit of time to talk about yourselves. If you want to do better, you have to center the voices and the needs of those people um, in the Indigenous, Black, and Brown communities, and you need to put those at the forefront, at the center. And um, you've heard it from a number of people here, but we are going to hold you accountable to what you say, and we'll be paying attention, um, and we will be on top of it. Thank you. Thanks. Next speaker. Next speaker is Emma Wilkins and Stanley Sankov. Emma Wilkins, one moment, please. Emma Wilkins, please go ahead. Emma Wilkins, please unmute yourself and go ahead. We'll go to our, our last speaker, Stanley Sankov. Stanley Sankov, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Stanley Sankov, and I'm here to first and foremost to listen and provide support to our Black community who have so powerfully and clearly laid out their needs and demands. Thank you, Black Lives Matter, Santa Barbara and Juneteenth, among others. Personally, more than um, the mayors and police's failure to show an act of, of healing and solidarity by taking a knee on Sunday, I'm more concerned about the repeated attempts from Black community leaders who have apparently been unwelcomed. Uh, the details to which I'm not privy, but those do concern me. Um, Mayor Mario and city council members, this to me seems like it's an opportunity to change course and to use your power and privilege to chip away at the systems of oppression right here in our community. I'm uh, hopeful and optimistic that you will hear and meet the needs that are proposed. I also want to add that I'm, I'm concerned to hear why the police uh, officers not only missed the opportunity to kneel alongside us like so many did around the country, but why they showed up in riot gear. Instead of uh, militarizing the space around the police station during a very visibly peaceful demonstration. I would have preferred to see them controlling traffic to protect marchers. Instead, the organizers of the march had to thoughtfully anticipate this, recruit and train volunteers to do that. Um, I and others were faced with two aggressive men on motorcycles who threatened to plow through the crowd on multiple occasions. And there were only uh, fellow volunteers to discourage them and almost no traffic control from the police. Um, I just want to add that to the conversation. Again, I would like to center the voices of uh, those in the Black community who have, again, so powerfully and clearly laid out their needs and demands, and I'm hopeful and optimistic that you will hear them and meet those needs. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mr. Sankoff. Ms. Gorman, that was the last speaker? Madam Mayor, correct. Thank you. We'll close public comment. And before we go to the chief, I just want the public to know and our city council members to know, I see you, Ms. Denton. I'll be asking Mr. Casey how we would bring back the Black Lives Matter uh, demands and the timetable for doing so in hearing my colleagues speak 
at the beginning of the meeting, I'm perceiving that we are embracing those demands. And so we that's a question I'll ask Mr. Casey. I also have a note to ask about library funding, but Ms. Uh, Ms. Snedden, go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I just, I wanna reiterate that at the bare minimum, we need to adopt a resolution condemning police brutality. We need to declare racism as a public health emergency, create a civilian review board, prioritize mental health services and rehabilitation, protect and preserve black landmarks, institute support for the Juneteenth celebration. And these are the very bare minimum. And hearing the speakers today, so much damage has been done. I believe we need a summit and not to decide today beyond the demands of the Black Lives Matter and Juneteenth groups, what it is to address it, but really bring them to the table to have their voices in that. As, as much as I appreciate um, Council Member Harmon's very thoughtful um, impact analysis for each meeting, I think we should really allow the space and make it formalized that we are inviting, not just inviting, I mean, it, it sounds like it's, uh, we, we, we need to celebrate the voices to come to the table and guide us in what we need to do. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Police Chief Lori Luno, are you available, please? I am, Madam okay. Mayor. Were you able to hear Councilmember Alejandra Gutierrez's inquiry? Um, it's been conveyed to me. Um, I, I have to apologize. I was actually meeting with some of my management team because of a lot of these comments that I've been listening listening to for the last, um, how long has it been? Two hours and 40 minutes. Um, I have heard them and we were talking about how we make this up, how do we do this better? And um, I want to say we've had officers in LA actively deployed in riots. Um, that have been violent. And our training dictates we wear extra gear when, when we do that. Um, I'm not at all saying that we saw that violence here, um, but I'm saying that we can do better than we did. And I'm hearing that strongly from our community. And again, I'm here with my leadership team and, and we were just discussing that. But um, the one thing is certain, we're at our best when our community partners with us. And we're not trained to be in vulnerable positions, but that's the learning that needs to occur. We pride ourselves on being a learning organization. And, and this, uh, this whole day um, of, of listening to this in the last week is highlighting the opportunity for our profession to grow um, in partnership with our community. And I am vowing my partnership and leadership to be there. I heard a previous speaker talk about future events and marching. Um, I have this will that willingness. We have that willingness to participate in those acts of solidarity. I don't want to make excuses um, as to why it didn't happen before, but definitely reinforce my willingness, our willingness to move forward and meet some of these objectives um, and desires by Black Lives Matter. Um, well, part of the question was, where, where were you on Sunday? I, I can answer that I uh, chose to be the representative from our city to speak with the protesters. And I apologize if um, I could have done a better job and I certainly want to connect with them uh, as we go forward. And I think we're going to, we, the demands are not on our city council agenda. I hope people understand we can't talk about them right now and have a big robust discussion, but I'm gonna ask uh, Mr. Casey to lay out how we, how we do uh, charge forward. And uh, if there, are there any other questions for the chief 
while she has the floor. Chief Luno, thank you. I look, Ms. Gutierrez, go ahead, please. So just to be clear, Chief, you were here on Sunday. I was returning to Santa Barbara. So no, my command staff handled the protest. Thank you, Chief. We'll go to Mr. Casey about how we would start calendaring um, these items. Certainly the proclamation would be the easiest thing to do. We might even be able to get it uh, back in front of us next week. Um, but please, you have the floor, sir. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council Members. I, I would be prepared to bring back next week. Uh, uh, which is a quick turnaround, but we'll bring the proclamation back for action by council for next Tuesday. And we'll also agendize the item and list for uh, direction from council about the Historic Landmarks Commission and our Historic Resources Planner, looking at the consideration, protection, preservation, and recognition of, of black landmarks as referenced uh, today. Uh, I think at next Tuesday, you could ask the city attorney's office to return within a short period of time with options about some sort of review board for the police department. Uh, I think you can also give us direction about funding support for an annual Juneteenth celebration. And then individual council members have brought something up and I will set the agenda such that you can have conversation about some of those other options as well. So we can do all that by next Tuesday. Very good. And um, our library does sponsor a Juneteenth event already. And I, you know, I guess we would be asking uh, what it costs now, how could we expand it? And then also I saw that the, um, uh, that uh, Black Lives Matter asked for the county uh, to cooperate with that. So we would reach out to the county uh, on that, on that particular item. So, we are going to can oh can then can I ask about the library funding as well, Mr. Casey? Um, if someone wanted that uh, 1.3 million, I'm not I. It was a, about a million dollars in Measure C money to be to go back into the budget. How would that happen? Madam Mayor and Council Members, that's not on your agenda today. You do have the budget balancing decision on June 15th. And uh, I can certainly make sure that's an item for your consideration at that point, if you would like. But that's an appropriate time uh, to look at Measure C priorities and make that adjustment. Thank you. We'll go ahead and close public comment. And this section of the agenda will take a five minute break to let our uh, technical staff know we'll be taking a break. And when we come back, we'll do the rest of the uh, agenda. Mr. Kalan, did, did you want to squeeze in the report from closed session at this point? It might be less disruptive, Madam Mayor. Please go ahead then. Um, um, we're taking a, a report from closed session that we had earlier today. Mr. Kalan, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The open meeting law, the transparency law in California requires us to report when the council takes certain actions in closed meetings. This morning, the council, uh, on a motion by Council Member Harmon, seconded by Council Member Friedman, uh, voted unanim unanimously to bring a lawsuit against Southern California Edison relating to the matter manner in which Edison collects utility user taxes for the city. Thank you. Thank you, sir. This meeting is in recess.
Ms. Gorman, are we ready to restart the meeting? I don't think so. Oh, there you are. Madam Mayor, we are ready to start the meeting. Okay. <clears throat> we are reconvening the June 2nd, 2020 meeting of the Santa Barbara City Council. Uh, Mr. Casey, are there any changes to the agenda? Yes, Madam Mayor, there is one change to the agenda on item two on the consent calendar. The subject is introduction of ordinance for the execution of a grant funding agreement related to the desalinization plant. I had a number of questions that came up with that. We'd like to continue that item for two weeks. We will bring that back on June 16th. June 16th, item two is off the calendar. Um, any of my colleagues uh, want to pull something off of the consent calendar? Oh, I forgot to ask Ms. Gorman to read the items that she needs to from the consent calendar. And then we'll go to you, Mr. Jordan. Ms. Gorman? It, Madam Mayor, if I just could real briefly, uh, we have a ceremonial item before the consent calendar, if we could. Please forgive me. We're going to our ceremonial item. Go ahead, sir. I, I will just read it very briefly. Uh, item one, employee recognition service award pins. Thank you, Madam Mayor. A little uh, out of out of sync these days with the agenda, so I appreciate that. Uh, Thank you, Madam Mayor. So each month we like to recognize uh, employees for their service to the city and read their names for achieving certain milestones of that service. So I just have a few names to read. And again, uh, under this technology, we don't have people here in person receiving their pins. Hopefully we can do that uh, at a later time when we are back convening as a group. With five years of service to the city, Natalie Uribe, Accounting Assistant, Finance Department. Crystal Vaughn, Administrative Assistant, Community Development Department. Melissa Hetrick, Project Planner, Community Development Department. Jessica Cadiente, Library Director, Library Department. And Alvaro Garcia, Grounds Maintenance Crew Leader, Parks and Recreation Department. With 10 years of service to the city, Gwendolyn Wiggy, Librarian 2, Library Department. 15 years of service to the city, Linda Szymanski, Principal Engineer, Public Works Department. Brian Reed, Senior Airport Maintenance Worker, Airport Department. And with 30 years of service to the city, Jesse Oliver, Police Records Specialist, Police Department, and Todd Heldorn, uh, Wastewater Treatment Superintendent, Public Works Department. Thank you, Madam Mayor.
Thank you, Mr. Casey. So when the pandemic allows us, we will have our employees with uh, long lengths of time come into the chambers. Let's actually, let's invite them all. Five, five years is a, is a good long time too. We'll close our ceremonial item with uh, thanks and congratulations to our employees uh, who have uh, served us so long. And we're going to the consent calendar now. Ms. Gorman, please read the items that you need to read into the, well, Mr. Jordan, why don't you go ahead since you're right there. You need to pull an item. Sorry, I keep jumping up the wrong time. Um, I'll need to vote separately on items three and four, please. Gotcha. Ms. Gorman, go ahead. Very good. Item two, introduction of ordinance for the execution of a grant funding agreement related to the, I'm sorry, item two, we have pulled. Yeah. I'm with you. Item three, adoption of ordinance approving a 2019-2021 TAP Memorandum of Understanding. Recommendation that council ratify the Memorandum of Understanding between the city and the Service Employees International Union, Local 320 Airport and Harbor Patrols and Treatment Plants Bargaining Units for the period of October, 20, October 1, 2019 through September 30th, 2021. By adoption of, by reading of title only, an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara adopting the 2019 to 2021 Memorandum of Understanding between the City of Santa Barbara and the Patrol Officers and Treatment Plants Bargaining Units, TAP units. Item four, adoption of ordinance approving the 2020 through 2022 General Unit Memorandum of Understanding, recommendation that Council adopt by reading of title only, an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara adopting the 2020 through 2020, 20, sorry, 2020 through 2022 Memorandum of Understanding between the City of Santa Barbara and the Santa Barbara City Employees Association general unit and providing for compensation changes for confidential employees. So um, I need, um, uh, excuse me, I, we need a, a motion for item three. We need to vote on that separately. It's the TAP memorandum of understanding. Ms. Harmon? So moved, Madam Mayor. And I'll second it for convenience. Is there any other discussion on uh, consent item number three? Are there any public speakers, Ms. Uh, Gorman, for any of the consent items? We can't hear you, Ms. Gorman. Sorry. Uh, Madam Mayor and Council, we have uh, three or four uh, hands raised people that would like to speak on consent items. Um, is there anyone raising their hand for item number three? We're I taking them one at a time. Okay. Yes. Item three. Yes. Uh, looks like we have at least, at least two speakers, maybe three on that. Go ahead, please. Very and good. We're back. We're back to three minutes, but if you do it in two minutes, we're grateful. Thank you. And one moment, please. And I will ask for patience with this timer. We're switching to the three minute again. That may be maybe challenging for a moment here and showing it with the timer. Our speakers are Daryl Sheck, Kathleen Gu, and Thomas Welch are the speakers on this item. Daryl Sheck, you have three minutes. Please go ahead. I'll keep track. Wonderful. Thank you very Go much, ahead, Madam Mayor. Mr. Sheck. Thanks. Good afternoon, Mayor Murillo and City Council members. My name is Daryl Sheck, field rep for SEIU Local 620, which represents many of your fine workforce here at the city, including the general unit and the TAP unit. And I'd like to speak to consent agenda items three and four today. Um, getting straight to the point, generally, um, our members are the lowest paid employees of the city, the general unit and the treatment and patrol unit. And we're just asking for the, the same equity and the same consideration afforded uh, other units 
um, who managed to complete their ratification process recently for their memorandums of understanding. Um, council member Harmon very eloquently spoke at the last council meeting about how our members um, are contributing during the troubling times we're all living through. And I know that our members appreciated those words and the kind words of other council members as well. Your praise certainly is valued and I believe also provided a timely morale boost for many of our members in a time of uncertainty. Our members also live in this community and um, also are experiencing the pain that the community has felt. Our diverse membership has also had dependent care issues, caring for those impacted by illness, working in mutual aid situations, sometimes assisting the effort against COVID-19, all while, while ensuring that critical infrastructure also remains operational to ensure health and safety for all. We thank you all for your service to the community in a time of great challenges, great education, great learning, to working with the city upon ratification of our agreements in finding constructive and creative solutions to partner and restore what was lost and with perseverance and resolve, find ways to improve upon what we have in Santa Barbara. And I wanna thank you for your valuable service and your time today. And we ask for your support for ratification. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Sheck. And I will count that as a commentary for items three and four, as you stated. Ms. Clerk, anyone else for item three or item three and four, since we've set a precedent, go ahead. Yes, Madam Mayor and Council, we have one more speaker, Kathleen Gu. Ms. Gu, please go ahead. Okay, um, I also want to reiterate what um, Daryl uh, has mentioned, um, that I wanted to express my gratitude and health for appreciation for the uh, approval um, vote on May 19th and hopefully today. Um, it really means a lot to me that the um, mayor and council supports um, me as a member of the SEIU Local 620 and as a city employee. Um, during this um, difficult time with the COVID global pandemic, uh, these are challenging times and there are, I know there are other important demands upon city and council and the mayor for fellow on their involving their fellow constituents constituents and that are also suffering your your support for the general unit city employees through these difficult times means that frontline employees like me who have been um at work during these two and a half months and are, are considered essential staff and that we really matter to management and for continuing to be on the job and providing our outstanding service to the community to help fellow citizens weather the global pandemic. Your support also demonstrates to me that you're fully aware of the dire impact this situation has made and continues to make on city employees and their family members, both with their living situations and their financial situations. I myself, um, have a brother who has been made homeless due to being laid off their job. And uh, my niece and nephew didn't get to celebrate their graduation and has been, which has been postponed. They also have to face uh, a dire unemployment situation that has, that is unprecedented since the depression era of a century ago. I look forward um, to your positive vote for our final ratification today. And I know that with this ratification behind us, we can move effectively forward to help ensure the city of Santa Barbara maintains its high standards um, and for solutions to help the city recover faster with our shared strategies and cooperation. I thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Gu. Anyone else to speak to item three and or four? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, we do have additional speakers. We have Brad Klein, Dana Hoffenberg, Thomas Welch, and Rochelle Monet. Brad Klein, please go ahead. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and members of council. Can you hear me all right? 
Okay. Uh, as many of you already know me, I represent SEIU Local 620. Uh, I just wanted to take a moment to add some clarity to uh, the members of the public that may be out there listening right now. Uh, we, being SEIU, uh, we represent the majority of the people that are providing services for our community. Uh, our, serve, our members have uh, continued serving the community throughout this epidemic. Our members have continued serving this community through the fires, through the floods, through the mudslides, through every instance that has hit the city. Our members have been first responders. Uh, we've diligently showed up for all uh, emergencies to the city. Uh, we get up and walk away from our Christmas dinner to help the city when the city needs us. Uh, all that we're asking for is to be treated as equals. Um, when I represent SEIU members uh, as a member of the executive board, I'm representing TAP members, our hourly employees, our general unit employees. These are the janitors, the groundskeepers, the maintenance workers, the people that provide you with clean drinking water and prevent pollution to our creeks and oceans. We are the people that clean the graffiti in our streets. We are the people that safely dispose of hypodermic needles and other hazardous wastes that get discarded in the public. Uh, and all we're asking for is to be treated as equals with all other units. Uh, thank you for your time. Please everyone be safe and be kind to each other. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Dana Hoffenberg. Dana Hoffenberg, please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Mayor and City Council. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Dana Hoffenberg and I'm a member of SEIU Local 620, a member of the general unit, and I'm also a resident of the city of Santa Barbara. I ask you all to please vote to ratify the general unit and TAP contracts today. These contracts are not new and were negotiated in good faith with this council. Um, we ask that you please afford us the same treatment and respect as the other bargaining units so we may enter further labor management dis discussions on an equal playing field. Um, and, and I do want to say that, you know, I don't see a dichotomy between supporting city essential workers and supporting the local business community and the community as a whole. It was my coworkers in the TAP and general units who created curbside pickup areas and signs for restaurants, who worked to get State Street open almost overnight, who created the parklet guides, who serve in the community joint information, the county joint information center to disseminate critical information to the public, who treat and deliver our water, and who perform so many other critical tasks. Um, so we are so thankful to be employed right now um, and are honored to use that privilege to support the community. After all, lo local business owners and community members are our friends our housemates, our spouses, and our family members. When so many of us are losing their jobs, the responsibility falls on us to support those around us. We are one community supporting each other. So thank you again for your support. It is so deeply needed and appreciated in these difficult times. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to speak on this item. You're welcome. Thank you for your comment. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Thomas Welsh and then Rochelle Monet. Thomas Welsh, please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Mayor, members of the council. My name is Thomas Welsh. I will be brief. I am um, the chairperson for the Treatment and Patrol Bargaining Unit, and I'm on the board for SEIU Local 620. I urge you to ratify our agreements and approve the ordinances for both the TAP and general MOUs. For the TAP unit, this has been a process that started over nine months ago and um, faced several delays. We want to finish this process so we can move on and start working on the new matters that our community is facing. Approving our MOUs puts us in parity with the other bargaining units and levels of playing field. Um, as we've already heard today, actions speak louder than words, and we hope to have your support and your vote in addition to your words of praise. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker. Next speaker is Rochelle Monet and then Timo Rodriguez. Rochelle Monet, please go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Hello, Madam Mayor and City Council. I'm Rochelle Monet and I am an entrepreneur and inventor and now a activist in Santa Barbara. So our city administrator, Paul Casey, indicated on April 20th of this year, he would be willing to take a pay cut 
In a News Hawk article, Paul Casey was quoted saying, I will leave. I'm not going to ask my employees to do something that I would not myself do, if not more. Despite saying this, on May 20th of this year, there was a 2.5 increase in wages for all city union employees, including himself. Where is a shared sacrifice during this global pandemic and once in a hundred year economic depression? As of today, there are over 3,000 signed signatures for a 30% pay cut from the top city managers. We need this pay cut to happen now. Our city administrator is costing, us all, of, is costing all of us $389,000 while we suffer. California Governor Gavin Newsom is the highest paid governor in the country, earning more than two times the salary of the lowest paid governor. He is currently only paid $201,000. Um, there's currently a two month waiting list for the homeless shelters in Santa Barbara. So I wonder how much money could go to those most vulnerable in our community if uh, people like Paul Casey would take a pay cut as he said he would do on April 20th. Thank you, Madam Mayor and City Councilman. Paul Casey, I hope you do the right thing. Cheers. You're welcome. We'll go to the next um, speaker. Our next speaker is Timo Rodriguez. Timo Rodriguez, please go ahead. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, City Council members. I would like to applaud you all for standing up uh, this weekend at the protest. I would also like to applaud the police department. I was off gone this weekend and I was able to come back to a beautiful city that we all enjoy and call home. So I applaud you, Madam Mayor, council members who were at the protest as well as the police department. I am a SEIU, SEIU Local 620 union member. I work currently work for the Community Development Department and Building and Safety. I would like to let you know, ratify our bargaining unit agreement. We have been helping our community continue to do the work that they're doing as far as construction goes, how the restaurants are operating. We are doing our diligent work to ensure that our community is still moving forward into the processes that are going on. I want to applaud again, all of you for doing the right thing and thank you very much for your time and patience. Thank you, sir. If that's the last speaker, Ms. Gorman, I'll close public comment on item three. We might get another person for four maybe, but we have a motion on the floor, uh, Harmon Murillo and if there's no other discussion, my uh, council colleagues, we'll go ahead and have Ms. Gorman take a roll call vote. That's how we do it when we participate from remote. Thank you. Council member Jordan. No. Council member Alejandra Gutierrez. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sneddon. Yes. Council member Friedman. No. Councilmember Harmon. Yes. Councilmember Oscar Gutierrez. Aye. Mayor Murillo. Aye. That passes five to two with Jordan and Friedman dissenting. We'll go to item four now. Um, it was already read into the uh, into the record, but just to refresh us, it's the general unit. Uh, memorandum of understanding. I need a motion, please. I'd, I'd like to move to ratify. And Ms. Harmon, are you second? Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Is there any other discussion? We'll go to our roll call vote again, Ms. Gorman, thank you. Madam Mayor and Council, I'm, I'm sorry, that was a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Sneddon, seconded by whom? Ms. Harmon, Megan Harmon. Thank you very much. Uh, item number four, um, motion by Mayor Pro Tem Sneddon, seconded by Council Member Harmon. Council Member Alejandra Gutierrez. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sneddon. Yes. Council Member Friedman. No. Councilmember Harmon. Yes. Councilmember Oscar Gutierrez. 
Aye. Councilmember Jordan. No. And Mayor Murillo. Aye. That passed five to two, Friedman Jordan dissenting. I need a motion for the remainder of the consent calendar. If there's no further objection, we'll waive further reading. Anyone? I'll move the consent calendar. Will you second me, Ms. Snedden? I will, Madam Mayor. Can you confirm for me, um, I, I missed the beginning when we had the agenda. Did we have the, the agenda change that the detail item is being moved? Thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, um, it's the consent. I moved the consent calendar minus item two because we're rescheduling that and then three and four because we voted on them separately. Second, thank you. Okay, okay. We'll take a, a roll call vote. Okay, thank you. One moment, please. Okay, we have a motion by Mayor Murillo, seconded by uh, Mayor Protem Snedden for the remainder of consent, which is items five through eight. Mayor Protem Snedden? Yes. Councilmember Friedman? Yes. Councilmember Harmon? Yes. Councilmember Oscar Gutierrez? Aye. Councilmember Jordan? Yes. Councilmember Alejandro Gutierrez? Yes. And Mayor Murillo? Aye. That was unanimous, Ms. Clerk. Uh, yes, it seven was. to zero vote. So that moves all the consent items uh, one way or the other. And we will move on to our first uh, administrative item, which is number nine. If you would read that into the record, please. And let me thank everyone who's waited. Uh, it was an important uh, public comment that we had today. So thanks to staff and members of the public who have waited for these uh, other items on the agenda. Go ahead, Ms. Clerk. Very good. And this is item nine, renewal of levy for fiscal year 2021 for the Wildland Fire Suppression Assessment District. Recommendation the council adopt by reading of title only a resolution of the council of the city of Santa Barbara declaring its intention intention to continue vegetation road clearance implementation of a defensible space inspection and assistance program and implementation of a vegetation management program within the foothill and extreme foothill zones declaring the work to be of more than general or ordinary benefit and describing the district to be assessed to pay the costs and expenses thereof approving the updated engineers report confirming diagram and assessment and ordering continuation of the wildland fire suppression assessment district for fiscal year 2021. We are ready for our staff report. Um, Mr. Poirier, thank you so much. Welcome to the meeting. Mr. Braden, welcome to the meeting. Go ahead, please. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor and uh, members of the city council. Um, I'm, I'm going to be brief. I know that you have a very busy calendar today. Um, the uh, We're here with, uh, I'm here obviously with Chris Braden, fire service specialist, and also with our engineer, John Bliss of SCI, uh, for the annual renewal of the Wildland Fire Suppression Assessment District. Um, as you know, we adopted it in 2006, and uh, it is a levy, and uh, so we adopted it under uh, uh, Article 13 of the Constitution and the Government Code. And uh, as such, it requires that uh, we come back to Council every year for a presentation of renewal. Um, and I'm not going to take up any more time or reiterate what the CAR says, but uh, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Braden to uh, review uh, the activities of the Assessment District for 2020. Joe, thank you for that introduction. Madam Mayor, members of City Council, it's my pleasure to be here today to present and promote the Wildland Fire Suppression Assessment District. And today I'll be going over our programs, the projects we completed in fiscal year 2020, and then also what we have planned for fiscal year 2021. Okay, next slide. Uh, 
Uh, let's see here. Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties. Okay. Um, so it, the Wildland Fire Suppression Assessment District was established in 2006 with our annual renewal process, uh, or excuse me, with an annual renewal process. So as we move into the 14th year, we really look forward to being able to continue to provide the services that improve homeowner safety and then also reduce the potential loss in a wildfire event. Next slide. So the two zones in the Wildland Fire Suppression Assessment District are the foothill zone, which is 100 foot defensible space clearance, and then the uh, extreme foothill zone, which is 150 foot defensible space clearance. Um, and as you can see this map, it just shows um, the darker shaded green areas to the north, our assessment district. Um, the gray area that you see in the middle, that's just north of Highway 192, that's the Mission Canyon area. So that's not incorporated within the city. Therefore, it's not included inside of our assessment district. Just wanted to point that out. Next slide. So the four primary services we provide within the assessment district are vegetation road clearance program, uh, which is conducted from September through January each year, defensible space assistance, which is comprised of voluntary defensible space evaluations, and then also our chipping services, which are offered uh, annually from March through June. So we're currently in the process of wrapping that program up this year. And then finally, vegetation management, which is conducted in our vegetation management units, and then also within the community fuels treatment network in the city of Santa Barbara. Um, and these vegetation management units were identified and prioritized in our 2004 wildland fire plan. And then in 2011, the city wildland fire plan was officially recognized as the city's community wildland, or excuse me, community wildfire protection plan or CWPP, which is currently in the process of being renewed. Next slide. So the first service I'll be going into is uh, our vegetation road clearance program. And um, each year we clear approximately 14 miles of roadways inside of uh, the Wildland Fire Suppression Assessment District. And each year when we're looking at which roads to actually clear, we wanna prioritize our major evacuation routes or our main thoroughfares uh, in case there's an evacuation. So this service is really important to improve the ingress of first responders in emergency situation. And then also the egress of homeowners uh, that would be evacuating during events such as a wildfire. So we do this by raising up tree canopies 13.5 feet vertically, and then also clearing back vegetation 10 feet horizontally along the roadways uh, and our high fire hazard areas in the assessment district. Um, and it's also important for us to make sure that we're working with homeowners so that they understand their responsibility uh, for maintaining that vegetation along the roadways in front of their property um, in years that our crews aren't able to make it um, to those roadways. Next slide. So with hedges encroaching onto roadways, we really wanna make sure that we give homeowners a better understanding of why it's so important for us to maintain the vegetation uh, that is bordering the roadways in front of their homes or adjacent to their homes. Um, and we also wanna make sure that we're paying attention to things like screening, privacy, aesthetics, while also making sure that ultimately our safety goals are being met. So these pictures just show some before and afters of um, vegetation work that's been conducted along roadways this previous year uh, and kind of the dramatic difference it can make in areas that have been uh, rather overgrown. Next slide. So the second service we provide are defensible space evaluations, and these are offered year round to all homeowners inside the Wildland Fire Suppression Assessment District. So this is one of my favorite programs, and it's a really great way for us to work one on one with homeowners, uh, look at things like hardening structures on their property, and also discussing strategies to overall improve their defensible, uh, their defensible space landscaping to make it less susceptible to the impacts of wildfire. So once homeowners have a better idea of how to improve their defensible space, we really encourage them to take advantage of our chipping services. Um, and each year, uh, homeowners are uh, can put out their vegetation that they've uh, cut from doing their defensible space clearance, put it on the roadway, and our crew will come through and chip it and remove it for them uh, at no additional cost. So this service is a really great way to incentivize homeowners to maintain their defensible space because it really alleviates some of that cost that's associated with clearing that overgrown vegetation. Um, so this year has been a record breaking year for us, I think, because a lot of people have been um, at home, they've been able to maintain their defensible space clearance, get vegetation on the side of the roadway for us. And uh, we've chipped over 600 tons as of now this, uh, this year, uh, we have a few weeks left. So I expect us to get closer to 700 tons, which is uh, almost double of what we get in a regular year. So just a phenomenal turnout of everybody in the assessment district uh, with chipping this year. And so far we've removed 4,600 tons uh, since 2008. Um, with our chipping program, just really phenomenal. 
So this map just shows each of our nine different shipping areas, and we provide this map annually to all homeowners inside of our newsletter. And we also want to provide periodic, or we continue to provide periodic updates uh, through signage, door hangers, uh, prior to crews actually conducting shipping in that area, just so everybody has a, plenty of heads up to get their vegetation out in time. Um, and then finally, we post updates through Facebook, nextdoor.com, our blog, uh, just reminding homeowners of when our crews are going to be in those neighborhoods. So the final program we'll be covering is vegetation management and vegetation management uh, projects take place outside of that homeowner's required defensible space area. So outside that 100 and 150 foot deface, defensible space area, homeowners are required to maintain um, in our vegetation management units. We want to expand that um, defensible space area uh, by bringing crews in and removing excess and overgrown vegetation. Um, so uh, the way we do that, we remove flammable vegetation, dead vegetation, ladder fuels, and then also exotic and invasive uh, plant species. And when we're doing this work, we want to make sure that we're working one on one with homeowners. Uh, we enter in letters of understanding with them so that they understand the importance of the project, uh, but also their maintenance requirement once project work has been completed. So at the top of this map, you can see the two project areas uh, are two project areas we conducted work on in fiscal year 2020, which were the St. Mary's and Las Canoas vegetation management units. And in total, we cleared a total of 10 acres of hazardous vegetation of, of each of these management areas. So a really successful year for us. So some of the challenges we encounter uh, with vegetation management projects are steep slopes, um, uneven terrain, inclement weather, uh, difficult access, of course, poison oak, uh, and then all other biological constraints we have in project areas. So when we conduct work, we also wanna make sure that we're protecting our natural resources and that our crews are following best management practices while making sure that overall impact of a wildfire would have in a project area is reduced. So these are just a couple before and after pictures showing how we reduce things like ladder fuels. Um, again, the ladder fuels are things where you have grasses that are growing in a brush, brush growing in a canopy, and then that creates a continuous vertical ladder uh, of vegetation, which fire will, will end up moving up in, in a wildfire. So uh, when we're removing ladder fuels, we wanna really make sure that uh, we minimize anything, any stress on things like oak and sycamore trees, and we're preserving as much of our native landscaping as possible while making sure that our goals are being met. Again, just a, a really quick before and after uh, showing the removal of tall grass and vegetation, and it could really reduce the overall amount of fuel in an area um, in our project areas. And we also wanna make sure that we're not removing too much native landscaping. Um, and we work, make sure that we work with crews to main things like native sagebrush and annuals uh, that are important to our Chaparral ecosystem. So the wildland program funding is a combination of the general appropriation fund and also the wildland fire suppression assessment fund. And the general appropriation fund is a combination of monies from the fire, fire prevention bureau uh, and other city departments. So for fiscal year 2021, the total is $491,107. And each year, the annual, each year, the rate for homeowners is determined by our annual engineers report. And the engineer's report outlines the estimated cost based off of the consumer price index. So for this year, it's gonna be 2.9%, excuse me, 2.96% increase. Um, so for, for fiscal year 2021, uh, the rate for single family parcels in the foothill zone is $87.37. While in the extreme foothill zone, it will be $108.34 per single family parcel. And this table is just a quick breakdown of the proposed budget for fiscal 2021 uh, and breaks down essentially how we're paying for each of these services. So with these monies, we'll be able to co continue to provide vegetation road clearance program, our chipping services, voluntary defensible space evaluations year round and continue vegetation management projects in the vegetation management units and also in the community fuels treatment network. So with that, I'd like to recommend that the city council adopt the resolution to renew the services as outlined in the wildland fire suppression assessment district. Thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. And Madam Mayor, uh, just as a reminder, John Bliss, our engineer of record, if you have any technical questions on the engineer's report, he is on the line. Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Nedden. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Do we have public comment on this item or is it appropriate to make a comment at this time? Ms. Clerk, are there people waiting to speak? 
Madam Mayor and Council, nope, no members of public to speak on this item. Okay, if you, a question or a comment would be appropriate then, thank you. Um, I, I just as a comment, I am so grateful for this program, living in the high fire uh, district and, and my neighbors and constituents and how grateful we are that this is something that is available. And um, I know uh, uh, Fire Marshal Poirier that we've, we've both had conversations where people are concerned that their neighbors are clearing enough and that you've gone in extra time to, to, to clear areas and um, just such gratitude that this is beneficial for our whole city to, to keep this, um, the fire suppression district going. Um, and when it comes time, I'm be very happy to move the recommendation forward to renew the services as outlined in the Wildland Fire Suppression Assessment District. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Snowden, thank you very much. Uh, the uh, it, the more popular the program gets, the uh, the more work Chris has to do, and that's the way we like yeah. it. <laughs> but thank you <laughs> for that extra work. I it was a, a heavy duty year this year, and um, very grateful. You can go ahead and make a motion at this point, Ms. Um, Ms. Snedden. Okay. We'll um, move the item. Then I'd like to move that council adopt the resolution to renew the services as outlined in the Wildland Fire Suppression Assessment District. I'll wait for a second and any council member can jump in if they have a question or a comment at this point. Ms. Harmon? I will. Oh, I just wanted a second it. Okay, so seconded by Council Member Alejandra Gutierrez. And you did such a good job. It, we don't need to, to ask too many questions. So thank you very much. And we'll uh, go ahead and ask Ms. Uh, Gorman to take a roll call vote. Thanks. Very good. This is for item nine, motion by Mayor Pro Tem Snedden, seconded by Council Member Alejandra Gutierrez to approve the recommended action. Council Member Frieden. Yes. Council Member Harmon. Yes. Council Member Oscar Gutierrez. Aye. Council Member Jordan. Yes. Council Member Alejandra Gutierrez. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Snedden. Yes. And Mayor Murillo. Aye. Well, that was unanimous, Mr. Braden, Mr. Poirier. Thank you so much and keep up the good work <clears throat> and we'll close this item. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you for your time, Madam Mayor, members of council. Thank you. So Ms. Clerk, we're on number 10. If you would read that into the record, please. We are number 10. Introduction of an ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara amending section 9.97.010 of the Santa Barbara Municipal Code pertaining to sitting or lying down on public sidewalks on certain high traffic portions of Cacique and Milpas streets. A recommendation that Council introduce and subsequently adopt by reading of title only. An ordinance of the Council of the City of Santa Barbara amending section 9.97.010 of the Santa Barbara Municipal Code pertaining to sitting or lying down on public sidewalks on certain high traffic portions of Cacique and Milpas streets. Mr. Kalan, we're ready for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the council. On April 28th of this year, the council had a discussion around the emergent blockage of the sidewalk under the Cacique Street underpass. At that time, Mr. Casey issued an order to assure safe housing for the people who were there, but at the same time to apply the same prohibition on sitting and lying down on the sidewalk that the city has had on State Street for a number of years. Uh, next slide, please. On uh, May 19th, at your direction, I took this to the ordinance committee and the ordinance committee reviewed the proposal. Uh, the sit lie ordinance was amended uh, back in May of 2015. It goes back to 1997 and uh, follows the case of roulette versus city of Seattle, which is mentioned in my report. Uh, over the years, the council has been pretty careful to leave the sit lie ordinance uh, 
to apply only in limited areas. Next slide, please. Currently, before this amendment, the law only applies on State Street and to the 100 block of East Haley. Uh, the council will recall that it was asked to and did extend the ordinance off of State Street onto Haley to address, again, a sidewalk obstruction problem that was happening uh, on Haley. Um, next slide, please. Oh, I, I apologize. Uh, back up one for me, Mr. Four. I'm sorry. Uh, the council in April asked me to give a legal report on the issues related to this kind of ordinance. I've done that in the council agenda report. I don't intend to uh, emphasize all of those points of law today. I'm happy to answer questions, but suffice it to say that a citywide ordinance forbidding sitting and lying down on the sidewalk would not pass legal muster uh, because it would have the effect of making it impossible for people experiencing homelessness to gain rest or respite in a public setting. And we learned recently in the case Martin v. City of Boise that before camping is criminalized, there needs to be a determination by the enforcing officers that there is available housing, shelter space or other safe housing before those kinds of laws are enforced. And that constraint applies here. So next slide. What's the legal rationale that justifies this kind of law? It's very simple, sidewalks are for walking. Uh, people sitting or lying down can obstruct walking, particularly on, on narrow sidewalks or sidewalks where there's an abundance of street furniture or other uh, blockages. So in busy commercial areas, sidewalk obstructions create danger. And the reason they do is because pedestrians are naturally going to move out into the street. And in the busy commercial areas, there is uh, vehicle traffic and it's just not an option for a pedestrian to walk safely in the street. Likewise, uh, groups of people congregated on the sidewalks can lead to recurrent nuisance and criminal behavior. But I emphasize in red, the, the factual justification needs to be solid and it needs to be based on sidewalk obstruction. What the courts will not tolerate is either an ordinance that is designed in its inception by the council to eradicate homelessness and excuse the expression that's I'm taking that from the courts, uh, nor will the courts tolerate enforcement, which is uh, done in a way that singles out the homeless. So much like the advice I offered the city council in connection with the oversized vehicle ordinance, we want to remove discretion to the greatest extent possible so that the enforcing officer uh, does not have uh, difficult choices to make about whether the law should be enforced. In other words, we want this law to be applied equally to someone who's experiencing homelessness as it would be to uh, anyone else. Next slide, please. Where are we talking about? You'll excuse this uh, Google Earth image. That was the, the best I could do. Uh, the general vicinity that you're looking at, at the bottom of the slide, you'll see Cabrillo Boulevard and a little bit of sand. And moving from the lower right towards the upper left of this slide is Milpas Street. And that can be identified with a few little orange dots indicating various businesses along Milpas. At the bottom end of the frame, on the lower right, you'll also see uh, Calle Puerto Vallarta. That would be the southernmost terminus of the sit lie prohibition on Milpas. Next slide. This is a bigger overview that uh, has less distortion. Next slide. So 
when we went to the ordinance committee, we carried forward the sit lie prohibition that Mr. Casey had in his order. And that extended from Calle Puerto Vallarta to Carpinteria Street and the roundabout at the intersection of Milpas and US 101. That's what this red line indicates. Next uh, advance, please, Mr. Poor. The second leg that we proposed to the ordinance committee was the span of Cacique Street from Milpas to South Alisos, including the underpass. And uh, one more advance, please, Mr. Four. The proposal also included the roundabout area. Now, during the ordinance committee deliberations, there was considerable discussion and evidence about blockages going further up Milpas. Next slide, please. And so in the final analysis, the ordinance committee recommended a couple of things that were responsive to the evidence they saw about blockages further up Milpas. First, they extended the sit lie zone from Carpinteria and the roundabout up beyond Quinientos to East Mason Street. And uh, you can see that in the upper left quadrant of this slide. The second thing, uh, next slide. The second thing that the ordinance committee added, and, and this is in the agenda report as well, is a request to the council that my office and police staff, along with other supporting staff, be directed to look at extending the sit lie ordinance on Milpas up as far as Cannon Perdido and that that work effort include a civic engagement process whereby we can take public testimony from residents in the area. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mayor, quick on the draw, Ms. Harmon, go ahead with your question. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Khan. Um, I have have a couple of questions here, and I think if you don't mind, um, if we could start with some questions I have on the legal issues, I'll just say first, I really appreciated the time and effort you put into um, the memo that we received about these issues. They are extremely complicated legal issues, so I thank you very much for that. Um, on page three in the first paragraph, this is of the council agenda report, um, you note that ordinances um, are lawful so long as they aren't specifically targeted at people experiencing homelessness. And I think what I'm, what's happening for me right now is I'm experiencing some cognitive dissonance here, and I'm hoping you can help me through it, because when this first came to us six weeks ago or so, it was specifically in response to the emergency circumstances created by individuals experiencing homelessness under cacique. Given that that's true, how am I supposed to wrap my mind around the fact that this ordinance is only legal if it's not specifically related to those experiencing homelessness? I think the approach is to look at what the ordinance does to the people experiencing homelessness. The emergency order that Mr. Casey issued on April 28th took pains to require not only a warning to move, which this ordinance requires, but also uh, required that safe housing be provided before anyone was relocated. So that order uh, recognized that it was impacting encampments and people experiencing homelessness and dealt with that by following what I believe the dictates of Martin v. City of Boise were, namely that we not criminalize people experiencing homelessness if we uh, don't have shelter for them. So everyone on Cacique was offered housing and most were actually provided housing. So uh, there, there is dissonance and uh, I, I wanna add a, a piece to that. The council's in a particularly difficult position because the courts have said that while the community may react to homelessness and the problems it brings, the, the city council cannot. 
and it, it creates a, a very challenging problem in working with the community. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, I'm just really struggling to thread this needle. Um, I really appreciate that um, specific actions were taken to assist our those experiencing homelessness. But but again, I still don't don't quite see how I can uh, wrap my head around the idea that this ordinance is not targeting them, given those facts that you described. Um, but that does lead me uh, it's a perfect segue into my next question. On page four, um, first paragraph, you note that in the past, the council has been careful to couple social remedies with any new ordinances that might disproportionately affect people experiencing homelessness. You've already described what we did in the area of Cacique, but what additional social remedies are we proposing today for the extension of this ordinance that was supported by um, the ordinance committee? Uh, Council Member Harmon, if, uh, let me grab my hard copy of the ordinance. In the ordinance itself, we have a number of protections uh, built in and let's look at those. Thank you, sorry. That's okay, I, I should have been better prepared. So number one, uh, if you'll refer to uh, page uh, three of the ordinance, which is the second to last page of the hard copy or the, uh, excuse me, yeah, second to last page of the PDF or the hard copy. There are a number of exceptions where the ordinance does not apply. Uh, so for example, if a person is sitting or lying down due to a medical emergency, including disability, they're not subject to uh, arrest or prosecution. If they're using a wheelchair walker or other device to sit down uh, or people participating in parades or protests, uh, similar events. In addition, in section D on page four, the ordinance requires that uh, there be a prior warning before anyone can be prosecuted. So our police reports take special uh, pain to A, document whether housing's available, B, document that the person has been warned that they're in a place where it's dangerous. And uh, we review each of those citations to assure that the constitutional rights of the, the uh, uh, suspects are are uh, or rather the accused are uh, protected. So in this sentence, when we say social remedies, we really mean those legislative protections that you describe, not so much, for example, offering hotel rooms to people ex experiencing homelessness. Is that correct? Well, no, we do mean that. That has been okay. happening currently. But I also mean the many hundreds of thousands of dollars that the city has and continues to spend on human services. I tallied that in connection with the oversized vehicle ordinance and it is quite a substantial uh, sum. Okay. Thank you. I just have one more question and then I will um, cede the floor. Changing, changing gears a little bit, I'm hoping that you can provide some additional color for me on the extension of this ordinance as was um, voted on at ordinance committee. So again, my understanding of how this came about was that it was specifically related to the dangerous circumstances under the Cacique Bridge, related to um, the narrowness of that passage. Are, are we required, if we are, to move forward this ordinance to make similar emergency findings about all of the areas covered by this ordinance today? Thank you. That's a, that is an important concern. And part of why in discussions with the ordinance committee, uh, I suggested that a, a substantial amount of evidence gathering has to happen before this is pushed up to Ken and Perdido on Milpas. The ordinance committee had evidence that it felt showed sidewalk obstruction and blockage up beyond Carpinteria as far as Mason. Uh, what wasn't clear is 
the evidence between Mason and Canon Perdido, and that is why they, the ordinance committee has asked the council to uh, direct further study there, if you wish. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Go ahead, Mr. Freeman. So, uh, Mr. Glow, I'm going to follow up on, on that specific conversation. This relates to my question. Um, when the original action was taken in relation to the Cacique and um, Milpas under, underpassings, it was, one part of it was related to the COVID emergency and the six foot distancing and the inability of the community at large to be able to access um, the walkways. As it expanded up to Mason Street, my understanding you wouldn't bring this forward unless there was findings that, that could also uh, support the facts as has been presented today. But my concern is that the, the reasoning for the two underpasses might be slightly different than for the extension to Mason Street. And if this full ordinance were challenged on just the extension to Mason Street, would we run the risk? Is there a different level of standard right now or evidence and therefore run the risk of um, the two underpasses uh, becoming or losing it all coming out of the ordinance as well? Where my, let me articulate. If we went just to the two ordinances, we, we would be on more solid ground. But if for some reason the Mason Street component of it isn't as on solid ground and it's challenged, then all three of them would come out, the two underpasses plus the Mason Street extension. Is that right? Yeah. Yes and no, uh, Councilmember Friedman. The, the, if, if we were, uh, if the city were sued and uh, we lost, the council would have the opportunity to amend the ordinance either to remove the offending parts or otherwise modify it. So I can't say that pushing to Mason would impair the underpasses. Uh, okay. I, okay. Um, that, that's, that's what I wanted to understand is that component of it because the underpasses are so critical as points for the community um, as a public health and safety. I, I wouldn't want to jeopardize the ability for the community to be able to utilize those those two specific locations but from what you're telling me um you've you and staff have found the evidence that supports the extension to mason uh, i didn't say that i said that the that's ordinance why i'm asking this now that you understand this point very clearly i, I, I said that the ordinance committee uh, had found the evidence and the extension from carpenteria to mason makes sense the sidewalks there are very narrow and uh it suffers from the same high traffic as Cacique and the other portions of, of Milpas. So I didn't think it was particularly uh, risky. Okay. Um, Thank you. That the answers other, Go ahead. The, the other saving uh, point that the council should keep in mind is we're talking about small sections of two streets in the entire city plus Haley. And so it's, it's, there are four streets actually, you can see Cayley, State, and Milpas, but they're very small sections. So if you were to compare it to the overall availability of places for people to sleep or rest, we, we're really not uh, preventing people from seeking rest and respite. We're saying that in certain locations, it's unacceptably dangerous. Okay, thank you very much for that clarification. Ms. Snedden, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Is this a time to just mention what um, from ordinance committee, from my perspective on ordinance committee, how we justified or how I felt justified, or is that for later for discussion? Well, let's ask Ms. Gorman if there are people waiting for public comment. Um, but you were, go ahead, Ms. Gorman. Madam Mayor and Council, there are three persons with their hands hand raised for this item. Okay. Um, uh, let's, let's go ahead and wait then, Ms. Snedden, for we know you are on the ordinance committee and that you um, approved this. Um, the question that I would ask Mr. Kalan if, if you would come back. Um, so how did the ordinance committee resolve the legal questions that um, council member Harmon raised? The, 
the ordinance committee didn't directly uh, address uh, the impacts on uh, homelessness. Uh, the uh, order will definitely not be applied in a discriminatory manner. Um, thus far, I think the city council by coupling social remedies with the few laws that you've enacted that impact people experiencing homelessness disproportionately sends a very strong message that your intention is not to drive a particular class of people from the streets, but is to regulate safety and health and safety for the people who are experiencing homelessness. Yeah, I think we could hear from Ms. Snedden, but what I just, if I interpret you correctly, there's people who are not experiencing homelessness who sit and lie on the sidewalk. I think that's what I'm hearing. Ms. Snedden, what was the thinking over at the Ordinance Committee? Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. And I will limit it to just this question. Um, so the thinking was that the, the sidewalk is very narrow in that portion, and this is not targeted to people experiencing homelessness. This is anything that's obstructing that very narrow pathway. We had just heard um, from Rob Dayton about possibly widening the sidewalk and that strollers have a hard time passing through there. And uh, the thinking for up to Canon Perdido is that during the school year, which is really hard to imagine now with COVID, but, but during lunch hour, before school, after school, that area right there is highly impacted with foot traffic of students um, coming through um, back and forth to the junior high, the high school, um, all through that area. So this wasn't uh, particularly to target um, any population, but to have that, um, you know, in light of some of the photographs we're seeing of just a, a accumulations, um, that it was not a safe passage. And so um, linking that to Kasike, that that, that is um, a thoroughfare. Um, Milpas is very much a thoroughfare um, for school age and on to the ocean corridor there. So that was that was the thinking on that. And I'll just leave it narrow at that and save discussion for later. Thank you. Mr. Jordan, you have a question? I was going, I was going to sneak in a, another comment from the ordinance committee. Is that okay? Okay, if you're explaining for yeah, the so rest. Yeah. Similar to Ms. Snedden, you know, the three points I remember is it's very, very similar logistics to the ordinance already put in place in the ground constraints. So the, the skinny sidewalks that the pedestrian use is extremely high and that the danger level of uh, those, those particular areas on uh, streets the cars are moving fast and there's lots of cars. And so your options aren't like in front of a normal uh, single family neighborhood, you can uh, walk out in the street to get around an obstruction on the sidewalk. You literally cannot walk around this, out on the street there without uh, taking your life in your hands or your health in your hands. And so that, was, that, was, uh, that seemed clear to me to make that connection. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gutierrez, a question for Mr. Kalan. Yes, Madam Mayor. Mr. Kalan, can you uh, remind me on how many other areas in in the city have this type of ordinance? Madam Mayor, Councilmember Oscar Gutierrez, the first uh, 13 blocks of State Street, the okay. 100 block of East Haley, and then uh, Milpas and Kasik if the council enacts this law. I, I would clarify, Mr. Kalan, it's the zero, zero block of East Haley, not the uh, 100. I'm sorry. It's the first block, yeah. Z zero to 100, I apologize, Mayor. Okay, yeah, and um, I understand the concerns about, about how this maybe, it seems like it could be targeting homeless, but for, like I mentioned in the other meetings, you speak to any of the residents on the east side around Milpa streets, they'll tell you that it's not just the homeless and growing up here, you heard some pretty horrific stories of the type of people that used to hang out on those sidewalks and in those streets or possibly still do. So this isn't just something that's gonna be affecting the homeless people. And, and from what I remember, 
I asked if there was any way to have some kind of uh, workshop for the community to give their input because you were relying on data and, and I highlighted how the population in that part of the city don't tend to call and report things. So was that able to be done? Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Oscar Gutierrez, I understood that to be part of the extension to Ken and Perdido. And so if the council directs the uh, us to look at that, I'd be absolutely wanting to speak to the neighborhood. I, I, I should say there, there are a couple of ways to imagine uh, this. Um, one is that the Milpas corridor is uh, a tourist corridor and a commercial corridor that gets a lot of traffic, not only from the residents who are impeded by blockages on the sidewalk, but the people who are uh, using the hotels down around Cabrillo. So there, in light of your conversation earlier, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that there's a social equity issue here too. And that is that the residents in the east side should have safe sidewalks uh, just like any other commercial district. Yeah, thank you. Ms. Gutierrez, go ahead. I'll wait after public comment. To, mine's more of a comment than a question. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your discipline. Um, to public comment in that case, Ms. Gorman, are you ready? Yes, Madam Mayor and Council, we have uh, several members for, of the public for public comment. I will read their names out here and then we will go through them. Emma Wilkins, Kevin Pormier, Mark Alvarado, Nick Kuntz, Rochelle Monet, Richard Clausen, Sebastian Aldana, Stacy Walk, I'm sorry, Sebastian Aldana, and Tino de Guevara. And one moment, I'm gonna get the timer going. Okay, I think we're good to go with the timer. Okay. Um, Emma Wilkins, please go ahead. Um, hi, I am I was trying to speak at the beginning, but my microphone was having issues. And I just wanted to show my support for both Juneteenth Santa Barbara and Black Lives Matter Santa Barbara. And I would also like to state that I'm extremely disappointed by the actions performed during Sunday's protest by both Mayor Murillo and SPPD. Sunday's gathering was beautiful and it was made possible by black, the black women that organized the event. Um, this event was a gift to us from them and was absolutely not required for them to lay out all of the actions we need to take. That's our responsibility. And I just wanted to say it was disappointing the way you chose to talk down to them and also undermine their actions. Thank you. Uh, next commenter. Our next commenter is Kevin Pormier. Kevin Pormier, please go ahead. Hi, good evening, uh, council persons, Madam Mayor. Um, I suppose the, the place I'd like to begin with respect to this ordinance is, is to request some clarification uh, because so far what I've been hearing is in in almost whole part just rank speculation um as to dangerousness uh as to a a an idea that this new ordinance will somehow not be used to target the homeless population uh where historically speaking such ordinances have almost unilaterally been used to target the homeless population. In fact, nearly every court case that has come out on this issue deals specifically with how these ordinances target the homeless population. Um, I'm mindful, of course, that, that the word dangerousness has been 
thrown around rather casually. Um, and I'm, I'm mindful that dangerousness is a, is a buzzword. It's a buzzword uh, that I think maybe ironically or unironically is being used to justify violence against people right now uh, that has historically been used to justify violence against uh, minorities, uh, black people, Hispanics, and homeless people. Um, and I'm, I'm concerned, very concerned that there does not seem to be any statistical data being brought forth, that this is really just a ordinance that's being born from speculation. Um, and I, I suppose I'm curious and I would like to know what the council intends to do to uh, ensure ensure that homeless people are not being unfairly targeted. Now, I, I'm, I have about a minute, maybe less than a minute here, and I just want to say one last thing, and that is the law is very often neutral on its face. That is, that is the reality of it. I mean, any law that is not neutral on its face is struck down as unconstitutional almost immediately. But the law as applied is never neutral. It is applied by human beings. And as we know, human beings are not necessarily applying that law fairly. Thank you. I'll make a note about statistical data when we finish public comment. Go ahead, Ms. Gorman. Our next speaker is Mark Alvarado, then Rochelle Monet, Sebastian Aldana, Tina Ducavera, and Zoe Ortiz. Uh, Mark Alvarado, please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Do you have do I have audio? Thank you so much. Um, I appreciated uh, City Attorney using the term um, social equity. Um, part of what we've been doing is our our outreach um, on the east side is really trying to align ourselves with resources for the issue, um, partly homelessness. And the other issue really is you need to understand that there's a commingling of residents with dual diagnosis of addiction, uh, mental health issues that congregate um, along the Milpas corridor. Um, there's also, you know, high drug use, uh, prostitution that takes place. You know, we're not going to enforce our way out of homelessness at all. We need more resources. We need to get in service providers that can build relationships with our homeless community, identify who the troublemakers are, who are the people that enforcement needs to interact with, and, and then refer those folks that are chronically sick that need help and, get, and help to get them off the street. We know it's very difficult. We know that there's no cookie cutter program that, that addresses homelessness across the board, but we don't have any outreach right now on Milpa Street, and that's what we need. And we feel that the ordinance, especially by just piloting it within the small sector up to Mason Street will allow us to get more data so that we can look at an expansion up to Cannon Perdido. But right now we support the ordinance because it's gonna give us at least the ability to start working with service providers to identify who's out there, who needs help, working with, you know, Chuck Flax is on board with this idea. You know, we are working with Rob Drayton on this because he understands that we need to figure out how we're going to best serve the, the, the neighborhood serving businesses and the community on this on this issue. You know, we need compassion for our homeless folks. This isn't about just, you know, you know, just moving them out and, and get them out of our neighborhood. That's not that's not our focus. That's not our goal. In fact, we just want to be exclusive to what we're looking at up to Mason Street in order to have that social equity to bring in the resources and identify those folks to continue to create havoc on Milpa Street. And uh, Representative Senate is correct. We have kids that walk up and down that street, irregardless if they're in school or out of school through the pandemic. We have kids that walk up and down that street every day. So we really, really need something that's going to help us move the dial forward in order for us to really build those relationships with those homeless folks that need help and, and those other folks that are creating those bad behaviors and that element on our street so that we're able to have a healthier lifestyle and really, you know, have the quality of life that we deserve on Milpas as every other, other place of Santa Barbara deserves equally as well. So I'll stop right there. Very good. Another commenter? Our next commenter is uh, Rochelle Monet. 
Rochelle Manet, please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Perfect. Um, so I find it fascinating that Paul Casey is behind this um, ordinance. Uh, so it seems as though you guys are distru you guys are concerned about the destruction of the walkway. So if Paul Casey takes a three hundred ninety eight thousand dollars salary, thirty uh, percent uh, pay cut on his nine hundred thirty eight thousand uh, dollars that he makes a year, that it would save the city one hundred and nineteen thousand four hundred dollars. A simple Google search can show you that a city park bench only costs $188. So if he took the 30% pay cut that 3,000 Santa Barbara's are demanding, we would actually be able to buy 635 park benches, which would solve the problem of homeless people sitting on the sidewalk and street because then they would have benches to sit on. Now, another concern I heard is safe passage for our children. So the average salary in Santa Barbara is actually $38,000 a year. If Paul Casey took a 30% pay cut on his $398,000 salary benefits and pensions per year, which would save the city $119,400, we would actually be able to hire three individuals making the average salary in Santa Barbara at $38,000 a year to reach out and help our homeless. And the question that I have for my city council management and my city council um, leadership is why does it take a high school dropout to be able to solve this problem, but our leadership can't? Thank you. Thank you. Another speaker, Ms. Garman? Our next speaker is Sebastian Aldana. Sebastian Aldana, please go ahead. Sebastian Aldana, please go ahead. Okay, we will come back to Mr. Aldana. Uh, Tino de Guevara. Tino de Guevara, please go ahead. Yes, good afternoon, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Tino de Guevara. I am a member of the Eastside Regional Action Plan, or Eastside RAP. This was a group that was created under Jeff Schaefer's auspices, and we have been working hard to be able to assist homeless people on our side of Santa Barbara. I just want to thank you all for working with us in cleaning up Casica Street. I think it was a marvelous uh, effort by all of us, by the government and by local citizens to get that cleaned up. I have heard some concerns here today regarding homeless being singled out as uh, the point of the ordinance. And let me assure you, I walk Milpas every day because I live uh, on Voluntario Street. When you are walking uh, north to Mason, then it is a very narrow sidewalk. The trees have broken that sidewalk and people who are standing there, sometimes they're homeless, sometimes they're people just drinking, sometimes they're people just talking, which means that the average walker has to go into the street. And it was mentioned, I believe, that Mr. Jordan, that can be a real challenge, especially when it's busy. And if it's a young person, they aren't that cognizant sometimes, they run a high risk of being hit or injured. Uh, also, I wanted to address that uh, Mr. Gutierrez mentioned, uh, Councilman Gutierrez mentioned that they are not just homeless people. That's true. Up on the north end uh, by Canyon Perdido Street, I have come out of having some lunch and there's people sitting on the sidewalk, sitting on the, on the um, wall, drinking. And I have to get out of the way. With the COVID now, you, they don't have masks, can't have a mask on when you're drinking. So it does put you a person in a precarious position. But in terms of having the ordinance extended to Mason Street, I think it's very reasonable. Um, I would certainly encourage the council to focus on that and uh, pass this ordinance, as I think people will feel a lot more safer uh, as they walk on the sidewalk on that part of the of town. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. Next speaker. 
Oh, now we'll go back to Sebastian Aldana. Mr. Aldana, please go ahead. Sebastian Aldana, please go ahead. Okay, we will move on and return. Um, Zoe Ortiz, Zoe Ortiz, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, so I'm just hearing personally a lot of justification for this ordinance in reference to the Haley and Kasik Milpis area, which are heavily trafficked in residential and I um, completely understand the concerns there, but um, I'm a little lost about extending this ordinance to the first 13 blocks of State Street as I am understanding it. Um, seems a little unjustified. The sidewalks are ample for two-way traffic plus some, um, and especially right now with the closure of State Street for COVID-19 social distancing, this place has especially, I've noticed, become a safe haven for our homeless because they are not it's in the way. Um, they don't feel as problematic. Um, and I would love to see the receipts. I'm obviously just a citizen and this whole thing is new to me, but um, would love to see how and at what rate these people are being assisted and helped into the safe housing um, as a result of this ordinance in the past and if it does pass going into the future. Um, I just want to see that our homeless population is being prioritized and assisted, especially during a pandemic, um, because they are some of our most vulnerable in this community. And I just wanna make sure that they're being protected. That's all, thank you. Thanks. Uh, did we get Mr. Aldana back? Uh, we, oh, he had, looks like he, he has left or maybe returning, but we have a couple other people. Uh, we'll talk to Anna Marie Gott, then Patrick Fleming, then Richard Clausen, and we'll come back to Mr. Aldana. Ms. Gott, please go ahead. Good afternoon, City Council. I'm very heartened that you guys have gotten um, Kasik as well as Milpis uh, overpasses uh, on the sit light ordinance, and I would really recommend that you look at Quarantina. Quarantina is also a heavily trafficked uh, pedestrian traffic uh, uh, overpass and there are individuals uh, every night and during the day that have taken up uh, you know residents basically on a what I estimate is about a five foot sidewalk so that means that anyone who wants to get to the beach um, or use uses that area um, to uh, get to the high school uh, or anywhere else on uh, the east side they actually have to navigate, uh, you know, in the middle of the street. And there are Marburg, uh, you know, vehicles that go up and down that street all day long. So I would really recommend that you look at that street as a next overpass in which to ensure that we do not have anyone occupying the sidewalk when pedestrians should actually be using it to go from one side of the highway to the next and not having to walk in the street. In regards to, to State Street, uh, you know, I do think that we need a sit lie ordinance um, to make sure that we actually have social distancing. However, I would just, you know, like to state again that the social distancing that you have approved last week is for a four foot um, accessible pathway through the middle of restaurants. And if you consider that each individual is approximately two feet in width for your shoulders, that means that you are basically one foot away from people that are sitting, having dinner or brunch or a happy hour at a restaurant, you are one foot away from unmasked individuals. And in some cases, it's not a 10 foot walk, it is not a 20 foot walk. In some cases, it's over 90 feet that you have to wait, weave in and out of tables on our sidewalk. So I really do think that it was short-sighted of you to actually approve that. We should have had all the dining on the street versus providing only a four foot accessible path for those with disabilities. Four feet is just simply inadequate. And I just don't believe that it complies with the RISE guidelines, and you should be actually 
complying with the RISE guidelines. But in everything else, I do support this particular ordinance. I just have you relook at uh, Quarantina because that is a, a heavily trafficked a pedestrian sidewalk under the overpass. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Patrick Fleming. Patrick Fleming, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just want to stay as a east side resident living on uh, East Ortega. Uh, I feel and have always felt safe walking up and down Milpas. Um, my wife and I also walk up and down Voluntario very often. Uh, it's a great form of exercise and a great way to get down to the beach. I have never felt, even during COVID, that I find myself concerned with social distancing. I find that it's just as when I walk on State Street, I might need to be a little more cognizant of waiting for people to pass by. Uh, I feel that there's a lot of comments that have been made here that sounds like people are trying to use the sit-stay ordinance and COVID as a way to advance an agenda that existed far beyond COVID or far before COVID. Uh, I also want to highlight that the ordinance that the city council, uh, that the legal council highlighted was that it, it is illegal to extend to the entire city. And so as we talk about this, numerous people talk, well, let's go here and let's go to here and let's add there. I think that highlights that there's far more of a systemic problem than there is necessarily just the need to expand it to one over overpass, similar to the California problem of adding lanes to a freeway, similar to getting a bigger belt to solve a weight problem. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, another commenter, Ms. Clark? Yes, Madam Mayor, our next commenter is Richard Clausen, then Sebastian Aldana. Richard Clausen, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I don't, uh, I don't live on the east side, but I am interested in the social equity issue that uh, all residents of the city have the same or approach the same advantages I have here in my own neighborhood. Um, so I appreciate very much, Mr. Colon, bringing that issue up. I, um, this is not the topic that I am uh, observing uh, the meeting for, but I felt compelled to, to speak on this in the strength of Mr. Colon's comment. Um, it sounds to me like uh, there is a, a good reason to collect some, some data on this. I, I think that if this were a vehicular traffic issue that uh, Mr. Dayton would be collecting that sort of data, and I think that both foot traffic and vehicular traffic, both as to volume and times of day, would be useful in having uh, or useful to uh, to support uh, any ordinance that the uh, council uh, activates. And I think finally, um, it could be important to distinguish between the initiating concern or the precipitating event, which may rightly have been. Um, homeless uh, people in particular areas, but which uncovered a more general issue that the council can address, and that is widen the pedestrian sidewalks in a neighborhood friendly way to a neighborhood that doesn't already have them, has other stuff, but doesn't have those good sidewalks. And so I, I think that that's an important distinction. Uh, the entire ordinance doesn't have to be colored by one aspect that may have been predominant in the early looking, but which uncovered a community good. Let's pursue that. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Clausen. Next speaker. Sebastian Aldana. Sebastian Aldana. Please go ahead. Mr. Aldana, I see you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. And he has muted himself again. He may be having some issues. Mr. Aldana, if you would send an email to the clerk at Santa Barbara CA.gov message, we'll pass it along to mayor and council. And uh, Madam Mayor, one person has just raised their hand just now on this item. Uh, oh, his hand is down. Okay, we are done on this item. Thank you. Thank you. We'll close public comment. And I, I, I assume that Mr. Aldana supports 
the sit lie ordinance. Um, but uh, Council Member Alejandro Gutierrez, who is his uh, district representative, probably knows better what Mr. Aldana wants. You can speak for him if you like. Um, so let's close public comment. And uh, I, I'm sorry, Ms. Gutierrez, I, I took a couple of notes, if you don't mind, just one second. Um, for people to understand, the sit lie ordinance is already on the 1300 blocks of State Street. So it's there. That's not what we're looking at. We're looking at um, the east side area. Um, and then, Mr. Kalan, the, the ordinance committee did have statistical data. I didn't see any attached to the report, but you're saying you and the police department have evidence. No, I am not saying that we have statistical data. Right. We would generate that if the council wishes to pursue this up as far as Ken and Perdido. We, the data we have uh, for the current proposal from staff and the ordinance committee is anecdotal, but uncontrovertible. We have photographs showing the entire sidewalk blocked off uh, for an extended period of time. Thank you. We'll go to Ms. Gutierrez. Go ahead, please. I just want to thank you, Madam Mayor. I want to let my colleagues in the council and the public that I've been working very closely with organizations that help provide those wraparound services to the homeless. I've been working with SB Act, uh, CityNet, PATH, and, and the community as well in my district. Yes, this is an issue that has been um, in my district for many, many years. And one of the main uh, reasons is, is what um, some of the council members that are in the ordinance committee had mentioned in, in the community, safety uh, for all of our youth and children that walk up and down in Milpas uh, for the business owners and also safety for for the homeless. I mean, we're, we're not trying to kick them out. We are giving them resource, but it is a very narrow sidewalk. And I mean, I've had numerous times have to walk on the street because I have children with me or um, it's, you can't, you can't walk. And yes, I'm going to recommend that we push it all the way to Cañon Perdido because I think also what our, the council members need to understand and the community that doesn't live in that district, a lot of these families and children, they don't have a, a safe uh, place in their homes or even in their homes to to play. They don't have a backyard, a front yard. They you, they rely on the city parks, on the playgrounds of the schools and the beach to have that um, outing. So Milpas is, is a place where not only, you know, you have the business owners, but you have that whole community out there, out and about. Um, so I just want to make it clear that we are working with organizations that are helping the homeless with those wraparound services. And that we are also, I'm also working with the community members, but we're also advocating um, for more funding to provide, you know, maybe the extend the ambassador program to the Milpas area to keep on having those follow ups, connections, and build that trust with the homeless community. Thank you, Madam Mayor. That's it. Thank you so much. So, Mr. Kalan, if you would come back. Oh, Mr. Friedman. Uh, I was just going to try and frame the question. Um, did you have a slide, Mr. Kalan, that kind of described it all? Um, the action would be to uh, introduce and subsequently adopt by reading of title only the proposed ordinance. The secondary action that the ordinance committee wanted the council to consider was the additional work up as far as uh, Canon Perdido. Okay. Uh, you know, Mr. Uh, Friedman, you were waiting first. You want to go first and then Mr. Jordan? Go ahead. Um, sure. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, first, uh, I'll just make my comments. I, I will be supporting the, um, the proposal today. Um, and as far as uh, second action or, sec or direction that we'll give, however that's worded, I, I do support looking at ex 
extending it up to Canyon Perdido. But I also would like to have an understanding of the information on that, of what some potential unintended consequences of it would be in terms of surrounding streets and neighborhoods. Because I think if we if we do that, I want to ensure that we um, are protecting the neighborhood streets that could be impacted with, with our actions. So it's not just the data for Milpas, but for the neighborhoods that surround it as well, that I want to uh, fully understand on that. Um, and that's for the, the residents uh, in that area. But just in terms of supporting this effort, um, I, the questions I had were, were answered before on the extension to Mason. I appreciate uh, the work of the Ordinance Committee and also the, uh, the residents who spoke today. And I, I do want to thank Councilmember Alejandra Gutierrez. Um, uh, she and I and the residents um, she invited me in, in to go and look at the, the Cacique and uh, Milpas underpass. And we did take that walk with some of the residents there. And I am also familiar with, the, with that area, having lived in the community for a long time, but further up to Mason Street. And with the reasoning that the ordinance committee provided, the narrowness of the sidewalks, I will be supporting the effort uh, going forward today. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, just, I, I think Mr. Colon almost answered my question. That's what I really wanted clarification on is the uh, potential question today, two different um, motions. The first motion would be to, if that was the motion to, um, to introduce and adopt the part up to Mason. And then a second action would be to direct you to do the work uh, to make the case up to Canon Perdido? Madam Mayor, Councilmember Jordan, not necessarily to make the case, but to see whether the case exists. Correct. Uh, Mr. Pormier is uh, from our public defender's office and he would uh, insist that we have data. But, and I think you made that clear at the Ordinance Committee is you were very comfortable with the data up to Mason Street and the data past that point was unknown to you, correct? Correct, and it's essential that the city be data driven. Okay, um, Madam Mayor, I'll be happy to make the first motion or do you wanna hear the rest of the comments? Can't hear you. Let's wait for a motion until Very everybody well. speaks, speaks okay, their piece. Ms. Harmon, go ahead and then Ms. Gutierrez. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm just going to make some very brief comments. And I first want to say it is with all due respect to my colleagues for their perspectives on this. I, Your comments were all so eloquent and um, clearly well thought out. So I, I really want to make that clear that speaking only for myself here, I feel like I am doing intellectual backflips to convince myself that this order is legal. Um, I, I appreciate the arguments laid out by our city attorney. I, I understand um, the reasoning that my colleagues have articulated. I, I just keep coming back for myself, again, speaking only for me, to this, this um, point that, that laws can't be pretextual. And I, I can't convince myself that this order is anything but blatantly designed to um, to eliminate the presence of people experiencing homelessness on our sidewalks. Um, again, I, I want to specifically note, I understand and appreciate the um, really important concerns, Council Member Gutierrez, that you articulated in those areas. Um, I share those concerns and I really respect the amazing work you have done specifically to try to ameliorate those concerns. But I, uh, again, I'm just, not convinced that the expansion of this ordinance truly is legal. To me, it feels um, nebulous at best. I, I think that I was prepared just, just barely to support this ordinance when it's specifically related to Cacique. And to me, that was connected to um, the narrowness of that space and the information that I, I had received and the work I had done to understand the urgency of that situation. I, I'm just not comfortable with the expansion. So with, again, with respect to my colleagues, I will be voting no today. Thank you. Ms. Gutierrez, go ahead. In regards of the Cacique Bridge, I, I do wanna clarify, and Eric can probably back me up in this comment, 
the Kasika Bridge, um, the sidewalk is is not narrow at all. Um, it's it's a pretty good space. You could easily have three people walking uh, down that sidewalk. Um, in I would like to make that recommendation to extend to Cañón Perdido, but I would also like to respect my colleagues and some of the concerns that the public brought up and and have that public meeting um, and also have that data because I, I feel very confident that the community will um, back up these concerns and and I, the data is there. I'm I'm committed to do the work and I, I want to be able to um, give some understanding to my colleagues that are uncertain about this ordinance. So I'm I'm glad to to help with putting a community um, meeting together. I know it's going to be a little difficult with the social distancing, but also to collect that data to extend um, the ordinance to Cañón Perdido. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. I was trying to figure out if there's a way that Ms. Uh, Harmon could vote for a portion of it that she uh, does support uh, under the Cacique Bridge, but I I don't see a way to tease it out. So, um, but go ahead, Mr. Gutierrez. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, I, I just want to want to state that th this is an issue that the people of that area have been asking for a some sort of uh, some some sort of resolution for generations. They've been asking for the city to do something about it, and and we're talking about equity. It, you know, 13 blocks of State Street has had it for years. And here's a group, here's an area of town that's populated mainly by underrepresented people asking for the same treatment. And we're telling them no, that it's not right. But again, State Street has 13 blocks of it. And um, so if it's an issue, then we need to re-examine it everywhere then. But as of right now, those people specifically are asking us to do something they've been asking us for, like I said, generations. And it's not just the homeless people. Again, ask the people that grew up there, ask the people that lived there for generations, they'll tell you it's not just the homeless people that are an issue on those sidewalks. And this is just gonna make them feel safer and, and um, make it better for the small businesses that operate there as well. So I'll be supporting it, thank you. Well, if you would hold on, Mr. Gutierrez, since you have the floor, I'm going to read this and you can make the motion. So the ordinance would add two new location, two new locations, South Milpa Street between Calle Puerta Vallarta and Mason Street, including the U.S. Route 101 Milpas Roundabout, located at the intersection of U.S. Route 101, South Milpa Street and Carpinteria Street, and along Cacique Street between South Milpa Street and South Aliso Street, and to study it from Mason up to Canon Perdido. That would be the motion. Does that sound good? Ms. Gutierrez, do you wanna make the motion? So, um, Mr. City Attorney, it is going, the ordinance is to go up to Mason, right? And the recommendation is to study it, to extend it to Cañón Perdido. Correct. Okay. Um, yes, I would like to make the motion. Okay. We need I'll, a second. I'll second it. Okay. Any other discussion? If everyone understands the motion, we'll ask Ms. Gorman to do a roll call vote. This is a motion by Councilmember Alejandra Gutierrez, seconded by Councilmember Friedman uh, for item number 10 as described by the mayor a moment ago. Councilmember Jordan. Sorry, caught me out of order, yes. Councilmember Alejandra Gutierrez. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Sneddon. Yes. Councilmember Friedman. Yes. Councilmember Harmon. No. Councilmember Oscar Gutierrez. Aye. Mayor Murillo. Aye. That was a six to one vote with uh, Harmon dissenting. Mr. Colon, something else you need? 
I just, uh, Madam Mayor, I would like to uh, clarify that I'll let the council know within a couple of weeks what kind of time frame we're talking about for this project in, in light of the other work we're doing. Thank you. We'll go ahead and close this item. Let's start on the next one. We might take a break in between um, the presentation and public comment. Um, it's a big item. And so, Ms. Clerk, would you read uh, item 11 into the record, please? Yes, Madam Mayor. Item 11, land development process improvement study consultants initial obs observations and recommendations, proposed municipal code amendments for scope of plan review and building inspection related recommendations from COVID-19 Business Advisory Task Force. And it looks like Mr. Buell is ready to start us off on the presentation. Good evening, Mr. Buell. Thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of the council. This item is being brought to you for uh, three purposes. One, to present uh, initial observations and recommendations relative to a process improvement study that's been undertaken by the uh, Novak Consulting Group. They've looked at our land development team uh, activities. And secondly, to present recommendations uh, from the COVID-19 Business Advisory Task Force relative to land development team activities. Jason Harris, our economic development manager, will be uh, providing that portion of the presentation. And thirdly, to seek council concurrence with the staff recommendation to initiate municipal code amendments that can result in efficiencies in zoning plan review and field inspections. Now, as to the process improvement study, uh, work began last January and was scheduled to conclude in April. However, in adapting to the COVID-19 wor world that we now, we now find ourselves in, uh, we're working uh, we're working on a schedule that calls for this to conclude uh, later this month. Uh, nonetheless, in response to your direction, uh, this presentation is being made both for as an update and so that you can be aware of Novak's recommendations as you review our department's proposed budget for the next fiscal year. And that will occur after this agenda item. Uh, I'd like to recognize James Hamilton. He's uh, new to our staff and he's our uh, department's business manager. He began uh, with the department last January. He was uh, here for just a couple of months before we went into this new uh, working remotely. He's been here almost every single day and he has been dedicated to this particular project as the manager. He's done a tremendous job working with stakeholders, staff and consultants and uh, also available are community development managers and supervisors uh, if you should have any questions questions. Uh, next slide, please, Mr. Four. So the land development process improvement study uh, in the, or the land development team rather is comprised of five different departments, community development, finance, where our uh, environmental services staff work, uh, the fire department, our fire prevention division, parks and recreation is where our Creek staff are and various divisions within public works. Next slide. The purpose of the study is to identify and recommend opportunities for improvement to our organizational structure, our processes, especially looking for opportunities for streamlining and also improve communications and customer relations. Next slide, please. The initial observations that will be shared with you from NOVAC uh, will touch on these six points ranging from initial vision outcomes, looking on down to our technology and our processes that are involved and specifically looking closely at our design review processes. And it'll conclude with staffing and organizational structure recommendations. Next slide, please. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our consultant team comprised of Mr. Jonathan Ingram and Mr. Ben Kittleson, both from Novak Consulting. And I will conclude my remarks and turn them over to our consultants at this point. Mr. Ingram. Well, thank you very much, George. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, uh, members of council. It's uh, my pleasure to be with you this evening. 
Um, very happy to share some of our initial recommendations and observations and uh, give you all a general update to the process. Um, so as Mr. Buell mentioned, uh, uh, next slide, please. So just a quick agenda of what I want to would like to talk to you talk with you about today. Um, again, we just hit high hit the high points on uh, sort of why we were brought in to, to do the to do this work. What's the project purpose? Uh, what's the work that we've completed to date? Um, talk about some of the interview themes. You know, one of the things that we did as part of this process is we spoke to um, not only staff but to members of the public as well as uh, process users, process customers. Um, so I want to share some of the initial themes and interviews and observations from that space uh, and also provide um, our initial recommendations and discuss uh, the process improvement exercise. So um, uh, just to give you all a quick update on what the process improvement exercise is, the, the, the overall process improvement project was designed um, to not only provide uh, for, for not only for the Novak Consulting Group to provide specific recommendations, um, but to also uh, create a facilitated work session uh, uh, whereby um, those staff that are involved in the land development process come together and um, uh, and work to solve specific problems and create a sort of a consistent sense of purpose going forward in terms of what process improvement efforts uh, look like into the future. Obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic had some significant uh, things to say uh, about our plans to execute that, that that process, um, but uh, we've made some adjustments to the schedule. And I'll talk about next steps in that in that space, uh, as well as uh, our timeline for wrapping up the project. Next slide, please. So uh, next slide. So the project purpose. Um, you know, uh, Mr. Buell generally hit on this. Our our goal, as outlined in the request for proposal, proposals that was developed by the city, um, was to complete really a comprehensive review of the de of the land development process from the point of project concept uh, to the point of certificate of occupancy. So, so what happens when a developer, a homeowner, an architect uh, envisions or conceptualizes a, a project? How is that project designed? How is it executed in the building phase? How are those inspections completed? Um, and, and really identify a plan that identifies um, what, what, what valuable parts of the process, what are those important parts of the process that need to be maintained? And what are the opportunities to improve the process for uh, process users, for the public, uh, and for customers and uh, and for staff, um, you know it's 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 a really interesting process. Land development processes, by their nature, involve conflict. There are inherently competing interests, and striking that equilibrium um, uh, is really uh, is really what our focus was. So, what what is the what are the opportunities to to really create um, improvements in each of those areas, um, and then ultimately develop an implementation plan for how to go about impl implementing specific recommendations. So, go ahead, next slide, please. So in terms of the work completed to date, next slide. We have uh, gone through a, a fairly extensive field work process that included over 60 interviews with land development team staff um, in each of the plan review disciplines across community development, um, uh, stormwater, public works, uh, building, each of those areas. Uh, we also completed seven stakeholder uh, interviews or focus groups. So these consisted of uh, between uh, six and 10 people, depending on the individual meeting. Um, those stakeholder focus groups uh, included process customers, architects, developers, uh, as well as community members and representatives from important uh, community groups in the area. Um, and those uh, community groups that may have a have a have an interest in the process. Uh, we also talked to land development process volunteers, so um, folks from the planning commission, uh, the, the architectural board of review, uh, et cetera. Uh, and we also obviously spent some time speaking with uh, both the mayor and city council to gather your all's perspective on um, what you want to learn as part of this process. Uh, we also engage in a fairly extensive process mapping exercise and, and uh, develop process maps for um, five uh, uh, projects that made their way uh, through uh, the land development process. Um, some of them were successful projects, some of them were projects that experienced challenges, and we use those process mapping exercises to start to articulate where some of the process bottlenecks and challenges are um, within the process. Um, and uh, from there, uh, from those interviews, from additional research um, based on interview themes and guidance, um, we ended up developing a series of initial observations and recommendations. Next slide, please. There were two tasks that were that were interrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The first is a stakeholder survey. So in addition to the, to the focus groups that I discussed, we developed an electronic survey 
um, uh, there was a belief, um, uh, uh, I think a, a reasonable belief that um, uh, creating some gap between uh, to allow the COVID-19 pan pandemic to um, for folks to deal with that and focus on that on, on both the city side um, as well as um, uh, in the public. Uh, that process was delayed, but the survey was completed. It closed on May 22nd. We had uh, nearly 100 additional respondents and largely uh, the comments that came in on the survey uh, ended up supporting many of the findings in the state and uh, in the stakeholder focus groups. So, um, so that was that, that process has has concluded. We're in the analytical phase of that of uh, the survey analysis now, um, and then the process improvement exercise. So again, um, the process improvement exercise is really designed. Um, you know, this process was intentionally designed to identify gaps in the process and then bring staff together as a large group to work the problem and apply their expertise with our guidance. Um, uh, to develop very specific, very actionable solutions to address issues that exist within the process. Um, obviously with COVID, we couldn't get uh, 60 staff members together in a three day uh, work session. Um, so uh, we have been developing uh, essentially a revised process will be a web-based exercise that we, we uh, will be as tentatively scheduled to occur in June. We're looking at probably the third week of June to get that wrapped up, um, which will um, basically take some of our initial recommendations and create a, a, a web-based environment whereby uh, staff uh, develop some specific recommendations uh, around a couple key uh, gap analysis themes. Next slide, please. So interview themes and general observations. Um, again, three groups to think about here. Next slide, please. Um, the first group uh, is the go is the customer focus group theme. Um, so one of the, what I'm going to share with you now are, are what are the key things that we learned in each of these groups? And then I wanna specifically talk about those, those consistent themes that were identified in each group. You know, one of the important challenges for us and the important, um, frankly, standards of, uh, standards of uh, success from our perspective um, is to find those areas where there are consistent themes or where there are overlapping issues um, that are verified across multiple um, stakeholder groups, okay? Um, so on the customer focus group side, um, you know, general appreciation for the outcome of the process. And I would say this is a consistent um, theme throughout each of the, each of the interview groups. Um, uh, every, everyone involved in this process uh, has an intense appreciation for the look and feel of the community. Uh, and in large part, that's attributable to uh, the rigor of the process that the city has established. Uh, but there is some frustration with process execution. There are legitimate process issues that deserve attention. Um, there's a clear uh, value of staff professionalism and expertise, um, but there's also an acknowledgement that some senior staff have left the organization uh, in recent years, and that has had some impact on the ability to quickly resolve issues. So um, part of that learning curve um, in terms of being able to quickly resolve things is, is an issue that, uh, that, that, that bubbled up. Um, I'd say some widespread concern about the city's development review process philosophy. So, you know, a perspective uh, on the part of customers that um, the, the the focus is to say no versus on collaborating on a way to find yet to, to say to oh, a way um, to yes. Um, and I will say this is a very consistent and common problem that we uh, we find when we review development review processes across the country. Um, again, this process is inherently, um, uh, you know, it, it includes inherent conflict. Um, ultimately, applicants are interested in, in developing a project as quickly and efficiently as possible. Staff, uh, their responsibility is to um, to help facilitate development, to, but to ensure that all standards, all design standards and building health and safety standards are, are enacted, whereas neighborhood groups may have a different perspective on whether uh, development is even right for the community. So there's some inherent challenges, challenge there, but there really is a need um, from the customer's perspective to, to, to have a, a, a consistent philosophy. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, there's also some concern that the plan review project is inconsistent. Um, so, you know, different uh, applicants will ex have different experience from different plan reviewers. So that lack of consistency is a was a common issue cited. Um, some lack of predictability in the design review process um, and some broad concern that it's very subjective and there's an expansive scope. Um, you know, this is an inherent challenge with design review processes. They can tend to be a bit squishy, um, but that squishiness is very difficult um, from a project management perspective. So um, creating some, uh, some uh, predictability around, around that design review process will be an important outcome uh, going forward. 
Um, some concern that the number of resubmittals required can be ex ex excessive uh, and a perception that new comments are generated on unchanged portions of the plan. So again, this is a very common uh, kind of issue that we run into uh, when we look at development review processes. So I'm, I'm not necessarily surprised to see it. Um, uh, some concern about the frequency with which design review must be re-engaged after design approval. So the process, um, you know, in uh, in Santa Barbara is interesting. Uh, it has evolved to become more and more complex, I believe largely as an effort to be flexible um, and allow, um, uh, allow multiple avenues um, to complete a project. Uh, but there are cases where, um, uh, 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 let's say a project moves through the architectural board of review, it receives approval, moves through planning commission, then it goes back to ABR, moves through um, uh, into the building process, goes back to ABR. So there's some concern about the frequency with which um, uh, those design review boards are re-reviewing projects that they have already, already approved. Next slide, please. On the neighborhood group side, uh, you know, this is a completely different perspective. Um, you know, a general belief that the design review process is driven by volunteers, uh, but in, but uh, but needs to be driven by staff as the experts. Um, there's some perception among neighborhood groups that the process favors developers. So you can see that inherent conflict, even in the interview themes that we experienced uh, in Santa Barbara. Um, a real desire to maintain the feel of Santa Barbara, even if that means limiting development. So, you know, there's some concern um, uh, about uh, how development will impact that look and feel that everyone in the community cherishes so much. Um, and some concern about the customer service approach and philosophy, am philosophy among staff, just in terms of consistency. Um, and again, getting back to that question of um, uh, saying no versus finding a way to get to yes. Next slide, please. So in terms of um, staff interview themes, um, that that question about de de uh, development review philosophy also came out in conversations with staff. Um, you know, there's a belief that there's a lack of continuity, a lack of a consistent um, approach. Um, this is particularly evident uh, between zoning, building, and the creeks and stormwater group, uh, and some perception that, that many applicants resubmit plans without addressing comments, So, uh, and that this is a, a significant driver of resubmittal frequency. And I will say um, this is absolutely true. Um, th this is, uh, you know, again, a common issue within development review process. Um, there are there are periods where um, where maybe staff could um, could uh, uh, turn comments around uh, or, or have, have a less less of an incident of submitting uh, multiple comments, but there are also periods where um, architects, developers are not addressing comments to begin with. So that's a natural rub. You know, our review of actual plan review experience, review of Excel comments um, suggests this is a legitimate issue. Um, so striking some balance in terms of what the source of process delays uh, is, is, is an important, important area. Uh, and Excella implementation. So, you know, the city went, went about a process to implement um, a new development review um, uh, permitting system. Um, there have been some implementation challenges and that has had some impact on process effectiveness and efficiency. Um, so staff have done a really, done a pretty good job, I think, of, of working with that to improve, um, uh, to improve its functionality. Um, but there's some additional work to be done in that space. Next slide, please. So what are the common themes? So, uh, you know, interviews demonstrate that there are inherent competing perceptions among stakeholder groups, but, they, but there are, again, there are common themes. Respect for the outcome, issues with the process. Each group, um, staff, stakeholders, uh, neighborhood groups identified issues with the process that can be addressed with very specific improvements. Um, the inconsistent development review process philosophy and customer service goals uh, was a common theme identified uh, among those groups. Um, a lack of process clarity and predictability. And again, this, you know, the, the, the process in Santa Barbara has, has evolved to become more complex, largely as an effort to create flexibility, um, to create multiple avenues for applicants to be able to, um, to move a project through, but it's also made it much more difficult to communicate um, what, what the process actually is and all of the loops that exist within it. So there's some opportunity to, to clarify, um, uh, clarify process um, predict and, and generate some predictability. There's a need to limit the number of resubmittals um, and uh, a very big issue uh, common among uh, customer groups, especially is that the design review process is very onerous and subjective. And now this is a particularly challenging area because um, that design review process is the heart uh, in many senses uh, in terms of what generates the look and feel of the community. Next slide, please. 
So it's another uh, general comment uh, about uh, kind of what we found. You know, the work of LDT staff and the high standards of review have resulted in a beautiful community and that obviously must be protected. That's, that's one of the sort of a priori principles of this project for us. Um, Land development team staff were highly competent, and highly engaged. We were very, uh, you know, very fortunate to have a very collaborative group, a group that was very eager to provide, uh, to provide data, to provide information in the process, to, sh to share their honest insights in terms of what's working well and what are the challenges. Um, and we've seen staff really proactively working to implement improvements independent of our effort uh, to review the process. So, you know, it's that professionalism and commitment are really going to form the basis with which further process improvements uh, will be built. Um, and, and we believe you all have a great Great team in place in order to carry some of these items forward. And we hope to frankly utilize um, some of their expertise in the process improvement exercise to develop further recommendations for improvement. So that leads us into uh, our initial observations and recommendations. So if you next slide, please. Next slide. As Mr. Buell mentioned, uh, our recommendations really focus on six broad areas. The first is vision, outcome, and customer service. The second is technology. Uh, the third is intake and application screening. Fourth, process clarity and consistency. Uh, I wanna spend some time talking about the design review process uh, and then talk about staffing and organization structure related recommendations as well. Next slide, please. So, you know, Probably the most significant and most important recommendation as part of this process sort of falls in this general bucket, and that is to define a consistent land development process vision, targeted outcomes, and customer service expectations, really across each plan review discipline. The land development review process is challenging because it's it, it involves multiple departments under multiple um, multiple department leaders, right? Um, so creating a consistent vision um, that is supported by that leadership and is supported by the staff in those departments um, uh, is a really important outcome of this process. Um, and again, that you know, the development review process involves conflict. You know, applicants are seeking to complete that project efficiently. The city must protect building development standards. Uh, but there are varying views across the bar department and division about staff's role in helping to advance a project. And there needs to be a consistent vision about what that role is. Um, the other issue that uh, that is really important to, to move um, to address is to limit the scope of plan review um, uh, to the project in hand and to limit the frequency with which um, that scope of review extends beyond the project. Um, and this is really uh, just a, uh, this is likely going to require some some code amendments. And I know um, um, that the city staff have been working to, to clarify some opportunities in this space as well. There's a need to revisit and clarify uh, review timelines for each department. Um, that's a really important part of this process, especially in light of any potential uh, adjustments to workload that may may occur as a result of the pandemic. Um, uh, but really clarifying what are reasonable timeframes and holding each other accountable for those timeframes uh, will be important going forward. Uh, this is this this broad bucket, this broad goal uh, is a primary goal of the process improvement exercise. Um, and we will engage staff to develop a number of specific recommendations and specific outcomes, targeted outcomes, um, uh, with respect to this, this, this broad theme. Next slide, please. So uh, we also see a need to establish and enforce clear PRT and DART meeting attendance guidelines. So um, for those of you who aren't uh, deeply familiar with the process, the, the PRT and DART meeting is essentially an opportunity uh, provides a really a very useful opportunity for applicants to meet with plan review disciplines to identify issues uh, before they actually develop their initial plan. So it's a very useful process that um, if, if, if staff um, and the developer or applicant or architect um, takes time on the front end, uh, can really streamline the process going forward by proactively identifying issues and, and helping those initial plan designs meet um, the criteria of departments. Um, historically, there's been some challenge based on workload and getting uh, departments to consistently attend those meetings, um, and, or sometimes there are situations where they are providing generic guidance. Um, there has been, uh, I think, some clear improvement in this, um, even uh, since we started this project, before we started this project, there were, um, uh, you know, this was a, an issue that was approved, but, or improved, but we, we would like to see, uh, made some recommendations on establishing some clear expectations with respect to PRT and DART meeting attendance and site visits um, uh, going forward. Next slide, please. Uh, we also uh, look very closely at the intake and application screening process. So um, one of the one of the realities is that historically, um, when you have very experienced staff who are handling intake of applications, 
uh, through their experience, they implicitly know who to distribute applications to. Um, with with turnover, um, with uh, the more some some uh, less experienced staff coming on board, um, there's a need to create really collect checklists and clear guidelines to identify which work groups, um, which plan review disciplines receive each type of plan, um, so that when an application is submitted, the project um, uh, there's a consistent workflow, and that this helps sort of avoid the issue of a late hit. What often happens is uh, if an individual uh, plan reviewer needs to be included in the process but is omitted from that review process. They come in later in the process um, after the applicant has developed plans um, um, or started to finalize their plans, and this can be perceived, perceived as, a, as, as a late hit. Um, creating that consistent um, workflow as well that sort of uh, will also create an provide an opportunity for um, staff to, more, uh, to better plan and manage workload and um, better manage the timeline expectations associated with review. Next slide, please. We also see a need uh, to improve uh, the intake process to screen applications for, for completeness. Right now, there is not a clear or consistent process to determine whether an application is complete, although I will say uh, the city has done a pretty good job of establishing a, 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 a more detailed completeness review associated with the DART process. Um, so incomplete applications are really often, ex often accepted and that can absorb significant staff time and it ultimately delays the process for the applicant. Um, so we see a need to create a clear application screening process for each plan review discipline on the design review, planning, um, the zoning side, uh, as well as uh, on the building permit side. Um, this is going to require some revisions to the process, really, um, where, uh, frankly, plan reviewers would establish set periods of the week for certain application types to be accepted. Um, that really uh, makes sure that there's a consistent um, uh, staff presence um, to complete that initial uh, completeness review. Next slide, please. We also see a need to reduce the use of resubmittals to provide additional comments about beyond what was originally provided. So that's, this is that multiple bites at the apple question. Um, so uh, we wanna uh, really uh, focus in the initial review, create some thresholds with which um, uh, those staff reviews can be completed. Um, obviously improving the application screening process will support that effort to some degree, uh, but we could also, uh, also see a need to create a, a more formal mechanism for mediation with a manager um, should resubmittals exceed a specific number. So if you move beyond three, four, five resubmittals uh, as part of a process, um, uh, it, that's an opportunity to, to revisit that process. It's important to note, however, that just because there were multiple resubmittals in a process doesn't mean that something is being done incorrectly. Oftentimes there are significant design review changes changes that can happen um, early in the process that can lead to multiple multiple resubmittals. Um, so you really have to evaluate each case on a, on a, on a case by case basis. Um, uh, but uh, again, creating a more consistent and formal approach to, to, to uh, kind of a trigger that says, okay, we've hit five reviews, four reviews, um, having the manager come in to review that project and try to move things along uh, more quickly will help, will help advance the process. Next slide, please. We also see a need to, to really finalize the, the Excella software implementation and align workflow processes. So, you know, the city moved to Excella in 2019, but implementation has been a challenge. And um, there are, you know, many features um, that are not fully functional. And, uh, you know, though staff has made some significant progress on system improvements, um, additional focus is needed and likely additional investment is needed. Um, the city, uh, you know, uh, largely relied on existing staff, um, planning staff and IT staff to carry out the implementation. They were able to accomplish this um, by essentially assigning those staff full time to that implementation period. Um, but the additional work um, uh, will likely require dedicated resources going forward um, that may not be able to be effectively absorbed uh, within existing staffing levels. Next slide, please. So, you know, Excella will offer a number of advantages. Um, the city has already moved through the electronic plan review feature, which is um, really one of the most significant benefits um, uh, of the system. Um, uh, but there, there's also an opportunity to use Excel to report process milestones um, to the architect, developer, and the homeowner. You know, one of the realities that, that became evident as part of this process is that there is often a lack of clarity as to who, whether the city or the applicant, is the cause of a delay or multiple submittals in a process. And the reality is, in some cases, it's the city, in some cases, it's the architect or the developer. 
Uh, and one of the common issues, and again, this is common in, in, in many jurisdictions, and we found it here in Santa Barbara as well, um, architects um, will uh, sometimes use the process um, as, a, as a mechanism to create breathing room with a homeowner. Uh, so what we see is an opportunity to create transparency and accountability in the process to take the internal review time data that is available um, uh, through Excella uh, and create an external, external milestone reporting um, that pro would provide some clarity to the public uh, and the city um, and also provide clarity to both the architect, the developer and the individual homeowner. Um, uh, in terms of what what what's going on with the process, what are the key milestones, what are the issues that are causing delay, and what are the sources of those issues. Next step, please. Next slide. The other uh, kind of broad issue, and again, this will be a focus area for um, uh, uh, for uh, some of the process improvement exercises to really clearly define the starting point of a plan submittal process and the document documentation required. Uh, right now, the process, uh, again, uh, getting at that theme of flexibility, uh, it allows applicants to choose from multiple starting points in the design review process, the planning commission process, um, sometimes the building plan process. Um, you know, and staff largely view this as a customer service benefit because it provides that flexibility, but it also makes it very difficult to clearly communicate how the process works, especially to folks um, uh, from out of town who might not be as familiar um, with the city's process. The other thing that it does is it allows some applicants, you know, those some savvy app applicants to shop decisions. So, so they'll, they will run concurrent applications uh, to design review boards and the planning commission, hoping for the right answer or the answer that they're looking for. Um, and that's ultimately not how you want your process to function. Uh, so um, though flexibility is really important, uh, you know, what we, what we really need to focus on is flexibility in decision-making among staff, um, the flexibility to be empowered to make decisions to move a project along, um, rather than um, a, a flexibility to such a degree that it, that it confounds the process and makes it difficult to interpret um, uh, from, the, from the applicant's perspective. Next step, please. We also see a need to assign individual building plan checkers throughout the length of a project. You know, right now an applicant can get multiple building plan checkers uh, with each building plan submittal. Um, this really creates a uh, create some inconsistent reviews. It means that a plan checker must has to quickly acquaint themselves with the project or and make a review from notes alone. It means that issues get re-reviewed over and over again, even though they may have been resolved from a, com a conversation prior in the process. Um, so assigning individuals to a project through the length of that project uh, will really improve the efficiency of their review and provide much more consistent customer service going forward. Uh, there are some plan review disciplines that do this already. Um, the process can be, can be and ought to be replicated across each of the plan review disciplines. Next step, next slide, please. So the design review process. So this is the, this is really, uh, I would say the, uh, one of the largest uh, sources of concern. And I think a major driver of some of the appeals that you all uh, as a city council deliberate upon um, concerning the land development process. Design review processes by their nature are inherently um, subjective. Um, the city of Santa Barbara, uh, you know, you all, fundamentally value the design review process. Your design review boards are established within your city charter. Um, they clearly articulate um, the broad goals that those, that those boards are tasked with. Um, but the reality is those design review boards are staff of volunteers. They have, they have very specific expertise in their area of review, but the design review guidelines are very subjective and board members tend to opine upon design elements that are outside the scope of review. Um, this is a major source of concern um, for for um, customer department or for customers. Um, so there's a real need to to create clear objective design guidelines for each design review board. Now, ob objectivity is a sort of a, a word in quotes when you're talking about design, but really the idea is to narrow the focus um, to be as specific as possible, um, while still providing uh, the opportunity to take advantage of the skill set. Um, that is on the design review boards and to utilize um, that skill set um, of those volunteers to help troubleshoot issues that arise uh, as part of the design review process. Next step, please. We also see a need to, to, 
to uh, bulk up the staff report process for design review boards. Uh, you know, right now the, the boards are designed, um, they're not really, staff are not intended to facilitate the decision-making process. That test task is largely left to the board chairs. Uh, the city has attempted to focus the efforts of the design review boards by assigning an attorney, but that's a, uh, to, to each of the design review meetings, uh, but that's an expensive intervention. So, you know, we see a need to develop a more formal role for staff and creating a staff report process uh, where staff are defining the issues and questions based on established guidelines and making recommendations based on the regulatory environment, based on precedent, um, what decisions need to be made and what's the purview of the boards to help move that process along. Um, there's a model in place, um, staff develop staff reports for the planning commission. Uh, the one caveat here is this will require an additional investment of staff time. So th there, is a, there is a cost to this in terms of labor hours. So balancing what this looks like, what level of detail is required um, uh, will, be, will be an implementation uh, task. Next step, please. The other area we see a, a need to really clearly define the, 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 the standard uh, the standards for the point at which previously approved plans are submitted design review boards. Again, this is the, the comment that I mentioned earlier um, during each stage, including plan commission, building, building plan review, building construction, um, projects are often resubmitted to the appropriate design review boards for review and approval. It's a, it's a circular process. It adds length to the process. It's often in response to very minor adjustments, such as changing a window location or a guard railing material. Um, so we want to define a threshold of importance for when this needs to occur and frankly empower staff to approve some of these relatively minor, minor adjustments to advance a project in the field. Um, you know, one of the one of the reality, re realities is um, there is a need to generally provide staff with more flexibility and, and being able to, to make some of these decisions in, in, in the process uh, in order to advance a project forward. Next step, please. Next slide. So, um, you know, staffing and org structure, there's really two areas to focus in here. You know, one of the broad uh, themes that we heard uh, from uh, customers, especially, uh, was concerned about the stormwater regulations within the community. Um, you know, uh, right now the, the, the stormwater um, uh, review team is currently organized under creeks. Uh, most of the regulations um, uh, enforced by creeks tend to be site-based stormwater regulations. So the, the, the review process is largely focused on um, creating site-based retention, site-based site um, uh, stormwater BMPs. Um, and, and ultimately those are the responsibility of developer to manage. Uh, public Works is responsible for manage, managing public stormwater collection and retention infrastructure by and large. Um, so what we really see is a need to integrate that private based stormwater regulation with a broader public stormwater infrastructure planning process. Um, and we see potentially uh, that a reorganization may be appropriate to integrate these two functions, uh, potentially relocating stormwater staff uh, into the public works department. Next slide, please. We also uh, have a comment about inspections. So as we as we reviewed workload among various groups, um, inspection staffing and and and, uh, and and was relatively low, I think, compared to the to the to the workload that they're responsible for executing, and specifically the performance targets. Um, right now, building inspections averages about 50 requests to schedule in a, in a day. Each inspector performs about 12 inspections. Um, the target is to complete inspections within two days of request, and really, this is within one day. So if a request comes in on Monday, the the, um, the inspection is completed on Tuesday. Um, so it's essentially a 24 hour turnaround. Um, uh, uh, there may be a need for additional staffing and inspections or some adjustments in the turnaround time expectations. Um, but this is an area that uh, really needs to be evaluated in terms of the, any, any workload adjustments that may, uh, may, may, uh, may result from the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. So, we, you know, we talked about the process improvement goals uh, exercise. So, you know, we plan to um, uh, to have a essentially a, a two to three day um, web based work session with 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 land development team staff to focus on a couple of goals. Go ahead, Ben. Or, sorry. Next slide, please. So. Here's the real value of the process improvement exercise. It provides an opportunity for staff to collaborate on a shared path forward and build internal relationships and take advantage of that internal ex expertise to improve the land development process. What we really want to do is get staff together and to tackle two big uh, to, to, to tackle developing some very specific action items around two um, two broad. Uh, broad goals. The first is developing a statement of understanding for city staff regarding the city's vision for the land development process 
and establish clear customer service guidelines. Um, we really want staff expert staff expertise in there. We want to have that conversation as a group. We want we want staff to agree upon a path forward and to um, and to all have a clear understanding of what that process vision ought to look like. Uh, and we want to establish clear and consistent entry points for applicants. So we uh, we want to um, clarify some of the ambiguity around the process and create definitive statements on definitive process entry points. Um, so we'll use our process mapping work that we've done uh, and also um, uh, facilitate uh, you know a structured approach um, to developing solutions and developing action items um, for each of, for each of these goal statements. Next slide, please. So those are, you know, at, at a high level, um, the, the broad, broad uh, uh, recommendation themes, recommendation areas. Uh, you see they touch on uh, several key areas um, uh, relevant to the land development process. Um, as Mr. Buell mentioned, uh, next, go ahead, next slide, please. Uh, we anticipate to complete the process improvement exercise. That's really the final uh, stage to complete. That's, that's tentatively targeted here in June. Uh, um, and then we will, uh, once that's complete, we'll finalize the draft report with recommendations um, uh, revised to reflect any new recommendations developed as part of the process improvement exercise, as well as the detailed analysis associated with the recommendations we've offered here today. Okay, next slide. With that, I'll open it up to any questions. I think Mr. Kittleson talks too much. Yeah, he was. He, he's the. He's just uh, sending me text messages, making sure I know what to say. You know, that's all. Okay, we will take questions. Ms. Gutierrez, go ahead, please. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I took off my headphones. Um, I have a couple questions and I need you to be patient with me. Also know that I'm in month five of in my seat, so I'm fairly new. First question, does this memo, because it's not the full report, does it reflect 50% of the final report, 90%? It, re it reflects the substantive recommendations. Um, there'll be additional narrative, essentially, that will flesh out some of the underlying data and underlying support for those recommendations. The process improvement exercise um, will result in additional recommendations. Essentially, the way that we structure that exercise, um, we help staff develop very specific recommendations. Staff then make a presentation um, to uh, the leadership of the department, uh, and we ask the leadership to commit to those recommendations going forward. Um, so we would revise the report to include any outcomes of that process as well. So again, does this ref can you just give me an estimate of like what percentage does this memo reflect of that final report? I'd say, well, content-wise, it reflects the rec largely the recommendations that we will offer. Okay, perfect. Um, let's see. Give me one second. Okay, so I'm going to start from your conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, let's. Um, Let's take the first sentence and, you know, in your conclusion, it says there's implementation, implementation actions, timeline that is in that for me. So on the, the last par paragraph in the conclusion, you talk about, you know, taking these uh, steps of action. So did you guys work with the director of the development department to talk about implementing an action plan? Um, on how to get these bullet points resolved. Yeah, so so the final deliverable, so we'll provide a project report that'll have the detail. That will also include an implementation plan. So we'll take each of those recommendations. There will be key implementation steps. So what is it? what are the key things that need to occur in order to execute these? Uh, what's the priority from our perspective? Um, and, uh, and who are the responsible parties? So we'll provide an implementation framework um, that city staff then can use to carry the implement, carry them forward, uh, and also use the well, to use that framework as a tool because ultimately implementation is a long process. You know, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, the environment changes, new priorities change. So you use the implementation plan that we provide as a management tool and also a reporting tool to to give you all um, a, as the city council progress reports going forward. So will you be able to give these? this action plan to uh, Mr. George Buell 
and um, Mr. Casey, Casey or Madam Mayor, is there a way that the development department can come back before our final budget hearing where they can give us a timeline of when they're going to address all of these action plans for all of these bullet points? Uh, that would be a question for Mr. Casey. Um, I One of my general questions was going to be, how do we integrate or interface this report with the budget hearing? Um, so, okay, we'll, we'll take that question. Um, and, and I'm asking this question because we also are in a timeline to make decisions on the budget. And I wanna make sure that I have all of the information before I make a decision for this department, especially when um, this department is thinking of raising fees or um, bringing up new fees. And again, I just wanna remind everybody that this is a public organization and it's funded by public money. I, um, I also have another question. When were you directed to finish this report? What we, we are targeting to have it completed in June. Uh, like early June, mid June? Late June, by the end of June. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, my other question, I think it's more for uh, Mr. Buell and maybe Mr. Casey. We talk, uh, this report reflects a lot of what this other report, the grand jury uh, report, talks about. Um, my biggest concern is there is a huge, there's a lot of repetition here about staff, um, how really a lot of these projects are under staff hands and how they, like their attitudes when at the counter, the back and forth, um, every time they review something, there's like this lack of communication um, going to the development department for a specific project and then they oversee the larger um, area. I My big question is, how do we hold people account accountable when they are not performing uh, well, like their customer service, they're lacking in customer service, they might not have the proper training. How do we hold leadership accountable? Um, and how do we support staff? So uh, those are my two questions. I'm not okay. gonna go too much in detail, but I just want to make sure that we are consistent in giving staff directions. And we're also consistent with the messaging we're giving the public. Because if developers are having a hard time getting their projects through. Can you imagine a, a person that came to this country for the first time and was able to achieve that American dream of buying their home and then their family grew and they want to, you know, rebuild or extend their home and they're going through all these obstacles and, they, and wasting a lot of money. And some of them, I personally know that they stopped the permitting process, but they already gave the city $50,000. So, I really want accountability and follow-up. So before this budget ends, I want a timeline, an action timeline of how we are going to address these bullet points. Okay, we'll we'll note that, and that could be a George Buell question. So let's keep going with questions. Um, Mr. Buell, did you want to speak now? Uh, yes, if I okay. if I could, and yes, Councilmember Gutierrez. Uh, or give me if I don't address all of your questions. I was uh, trying to connect and I may not have heard all of them. Um, with respect to um, the action items that are going to be provided to us for, by the Novak Group, I have not seen the final report or uh, much of what they're going to be providing to us in terms of the framework to base their uh, recommend their further recommendations. Now, that having been the case, uh, I know that we're going into our budget hearing right after this, and we will be providing uh, 
information from the report that we've received so far is going to be carried over into our budget presentation. So hopefully you, you will see consistency between the major staffing recommendations between this presentation and our budget presentation. Relative to um, accountability, uh, seeing this as one of the themes and recommendations coming from NOVAC, over the course of the past week, I got together with uh, management staff, human resources, the city attorney's office to ensure that there's a clear understanding uh, as to how we do that appropriately. Uh, because it's important that we do that when we're working with a, a large organization that, that's driven by people who really are intending to do well, but obviously there's need to for, for clarity in the process. And so we'll need to be very clear in developing policies and procedures by which we will be able to evaluate staff performance and then hold that uh, accountability. Uh, I believe that addresses the major questions that you asked Councilmember Alejandra Gutierrez. Uh, if not, please feel free to chime back in. Thanks, Mr. Buell. Ms. Snedden, oh wait, she is there. Ms. Gutierrez, did you have another question for Mr. Buell or the consultants? Um, not for now. I just, I really want to, again, just address that I do want that timeline before the end of our budget hearings. So I have it before making a decision. That timeline of, of an action plan, um, because for me, that's going to be very critical. Thank yeah, you. I will, I will, I will see what we can pull together. I will need to talk with uh, the, the consultant team and my staff. Ms. Snedden, questions? Mr. Jordan, after you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I'll keep it to questions for now. I'm sure we'll have much to discuss um, as the presentation goes on. I have some questions about um, how is morale in the department? I mean, that's something that doesn't, I'm, I'm sure in all the people that you talk to, if you might have a sense for how morale is um, for those working in the department and those interfacing with the department. Is that something you can comment on? Well, um, I, you know, I, I would say it wasn't quite a climate assessment study kind of from a strict perspective, but I would say my view, my perspective in talking with over 60 staff, um, pretty engaged group. Um, there are some, you know, there were issues, staff are experiencing issues, some of them which I have, I have identified and kind of summarized with you all but it's an engaged group. It's a group that's committed to their work. It's a group that's committed to, you know, to the, to the overall mission. I think there's a desire to let's just all get on the same page and go forward, you know? Um, so I, you know, I, I walked away, I think with a, with a fairly positive view of staff, um, a fair, a pretty positive view of their attitude, um, uh, you know, by and large. So. When staff, if they have issues, is it clear to them where to go or how to resolve those issues or how to bring their ideas forward? Is that something? I think it absolutely is. But here, here's the, here's, so it's clear who their supervisor is, who their manager is, the person they have to go to to resolve an issue. I think that's clear. What's not clear is that, uh, is whether um, they have, they are, they have the ability to resolve those issues without then being reprimanded from a broader committee or a board or a design review process. So can staff, do they feel empowered to make a decision that will help advance a project forward without fearing um, uh, really a, a sort of a broader political issue? Um, that's, the, that's the challenge, right? And that's the challenge in this process. So creating some clarity, creating some flexibility for staff, for the experts to make those decisions, but still respecting the process that created Santa Barbara, that's the equilibrium that we're really looking for. And that's the equilibrium I think staff's looking for as well. And does that go all the way up through management that there may be ideas that would come forward, but there might be backlash to that? I think, I, I think, I think um, man, when management gets involved in an, in an issue, um, uh, there is, uh, there is a little bit more ability to resolve an issue quickly and move it through. Um, what you want to, what we're targeting is, is uh, percolating that a little bit, a little bit further down the organization. Okay. And then just, I realize this isn't the full report yet. And we're looking forward to that, but do you have a sense of, is the staffing already there that would be needed to implement these changes? Or are we talking about major staffing up or realignment yeah. of staff? 
So we've made a couple of suggestions of it, that will have staffing implications. The creating a staff report process for the design review board will, will have a staffing implication in terms of labor hours. Whether that can be absorbed within existing workload is, is honestly a, a question that we, we would need uh, George and his team to, to answer. What's the impact on COVID in terms of the workload coming in? Obviously, there are, there are a lot of active projects, so it's going to take a year for active projects in some cases to move their way through the process. So I don't know that there's going to be a lot of immediate capacity um, to absorb some of that work. Um, uh, you know, inspections, there were some kind of clear staffing issues there. But one of the things we're really careful about in these process improvement exercises is not to throw staff at a problem. Um, we want to focus primarily on the process. And if process improvements are made, um, and there's there's still a clear workload-based justification for additional personnel, absolutely go for it. So so we, we try to walk that line um, to a degree, um, but if we see a glaring issue like we have, um, we'll, we'll call that out. So then I'll ask, um, since you mentioned inspection, I was gonna ask about this also inspection staffing issues. This is something I've asked over the last two years, like what would it take in staffing to be able to have consistent inspections. So that's one. So is it your impression we're short staffed in that still? That, I, think that to, I think to meet, I think to meet the, to consistently meet the two day turnaround mm -hmm. and provide the quality of inspection. I think so. Yeah. Okay. And then um, did you hear any discussion of um, building inspections being arbitrary? I mean, that's something that I've heard over and over and over again, um, different between business community versus residential is that something that came so, forward? So I would say that falls into the into the broad comment about consistency, moving from one inspector to another uh, within a discipline. So creating consistency of assignment will help address some of those issues. Um, but I, I will say in terms of the customer interviews, that was not, um, you know, inspections were not often highlighted as the major issue. I would say the major issue is largely subjectivity associated with the design review process. Um, process delays, multiple resubmittals, those kinds of things. And then have you had a chance to look at the grand jury? I mean, we've only just received it and weren't aware that it was happening. Uh, um, most of us, I think, were not aware. Have you had a chance to look at it? Uh, I, did it read the, yeah, I read the report this morning, yes, ma'am. Anything in there inconsistent with your findings? Well, I, um, you know, what I what I would say is I can't speak to the to the to the outcomes of the grand. I don't know what their process was. I don't know. I don't know what the goals of that process are. Uh, uh, my my preference would be to focus on our work because I know what our methodology is. Um, you know, uh, I feel pretty pretty comf pretty confident in the recommendations that we've offered. Thank you. And so I suppose I could maybe ask Mr. Buell if um, if there are any surprises here between the findings of um, this report or the grand jury report or your own assessment of your department? Anything here inconsistent with what your impressions are or things that really highlight what you already know needs to happen? You're asking Mr. Buell? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Snedden, with regards to the uh, observations and recommendations coming from NOVAC, uh, these are consistent with what I would have expected. Um, I, I really, we engaged NOVAC, and just, just to be very clear, we engaged Jonathan and Ben, and we just let them do their thing. They knew what their scope was, and so I, I stepped back, and they engaged with our stakeholders. They engaged with staff, and they were reporting back to me. Uh, but I was not I was not directing every step of this project by any stretch. Uh, so, but what we have here are are recommendations that uh, I'm not surprised with that I generally agree with. Relative to the grand jury report, um, I haven't spent a lot of time going over that report, and I'm not prepared to give a detailed uh, uh, explanation or justification or or thoughts on that. We will be doing that uh, in the near future. Okay. Understood. Thank you. Just if anything stood out. Um, okay. And then I'll just, um, if I may, Madam Mayor, ask one more question. And maybe it doesn't need to be answered right now, but something that I'm thinking about looking at these recommendations, it seems to me that there's sort of two groups and categories. One is bigger vision consistency with design review boards. And another is sort of a 
urgency of implementation of these recommendations to to get things moving and consistent. And um, I suppose maybe it's a question for Mr. Casey about what that might look like if we formed, uh, or we can save it for discussion later too, but if, if we formed two different subcommittees um, within council, one to really look at that long-term vision and how that fits in with these processes, and another to really get updates consistently on how these recommendations are being implemented um, when that time comes. And maybe I'll just reserve that for when we have fuller discussion, but um, I'm sort of seeing those two different groupings of addressing those, those needs at this time. I think we've, we've lost Madam Mayor, um, but I'm, I'm finished. I'm, I'm still here, I was listening to you. Thank you. Yeah, Thank let's we're in the discussion period. We'll talk about that. How's that, uh, Mr. Mr. Friedman? Were you in line ahead of Mr. Jordan? No. Okay. So, Mr. Jordan, you go first. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Hi, Mr. Engram. Good to chat with you again. Absolutely. Uh, it's probably late there, huh? A little bit. That's okay. Yep. Um, I to be in North Carolina. So first, I, I'm just going to sneak in a positive comment. I am so happy to view your assessment of painting staff as competent, engaged, and interested in the same things that we're interested in. It's it's just it's so gratifying to hear that. It validates, um, I think, what I believe, what many other people believe. I equate it generally to just we're kind of chugging along in a historical vehicle we were given and the vehicle just needs some upgrades. And mm -hmm. so I'm so happy to hear that uh, good point from you. So the PIE seems to me to be the most important part of this entire process. And I would assume the assessment's pretty easy. You probably could have stopped at any one of those groups. Um, can you tell me how that works in other cities that maybe you have been in that are like us, older historical cities built out, um, lots of community involvement, mm -hmm. um, those kind of constraints and how, how you see that working out effectively. So the process improvement, so uh, we do have experience in working with communities that are very similar to Santa Barbara. Um, one of the most recent ones, the city of Charleston, South Carolina, another coastal community, historical community, um, uh, significant stormwater issues to pay attention to, uh, very concerned about rapid development in their historic district. Um, so a lot of parallels um, in, in Charleston, slightly different climate. It's, uh, I'd say Santa Barbara is actually tolerable in August, but, uh, um, uh, but so, you know, we have some experience working in that space, the process improvement exercise. And I would say um, the outcomes of that exercise specific to process vision, customer service goals, uh, that's really, I, I think, the, the biggest impact series of recommendations. And we really want to, the process improvement exercise is designed to engage staff, okay, to, to get them all in a room, a virtual room in this case, um, to start to wrestle with um, what are some of the challenges, what are the inconsistencies among staff, and have a conversation as a group um, to come to terms around what are we all going to commit to going forward? And that, frankly, I think is going to have a really significant impact on staff's perspective, staff's, staff's, um, uh, staff's vision going forward, and um, the customer's experience in working with that staff from that point, from that point going forward. So I think that's, a, that, that's really important. But with the community itself, um, there are no limitations in Santa Barbara that make that difficult to achieve. The, the more complicated question, I think, uh, relates to how, uh, how to engage with customers going forward um, uh, in terms of performance metrics, in terms of making sure that momentum identified through this project is carried forward and that there's a clear avenue for communication, identification of issues that may, may evolve in the future um, and working to resolve those, the, the, to, to use the lessons and the processes that we've established here um, to carry that forward. And I've seen that successful. We've, we've developed some very similar uh, mechanisms in, in Charleston, honestly, um, um, that, can, that can help support that as well. It's very heartening to hear. And then I'm just wondering what you feel about um, the state of having to do it virtually versus waiting a month, two months, three months, and potentially being able to do it in person. Do you feel the um, the result of having to do it uh, virtually is significantly not as good as potentially looking for a future date? 
Well, you know, if you had asked me that question three months ago, uh, I would have I would have probably given you a very different answer. But but um, with COVID, we have um, we have adjusted pretty significantly to the use of of web based tools. Uh, we've actually successfully facilitated city strategic planning sessions um, in the COVID environment, so uh, it, it can be done and it can be done well. Um, uh, you know, we're nothing if not flexible. We believe that the outcome uh, will will still be positive. Um, uh, and, and we'll still end up in a very good place. Very good. And then one thing I thought was missing um, in the memo was um, any opinion or any reference to uh, what I'd call stuff that we do here in community development and all that encompasses that you don't see done in other cities, um, whether that's environmental, long-term planning, uh, I mean, it, mm -hmm. just stuff because we're Santa Barbara, frankly, right? Yeah. And 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 I and I didn't really see anything in there assessing because maybe there is nothing. So I guess that's what I'm asking. Did you see anything in kind of the scope of what happens at 6:30 Garden Street that kind of made you uh, look at it and go, "Wow, that's kind of unique," and it takes up resources and takes resources away from these other things that you're highlighting? No, I, no, I, I, I don't, I don't think there was a glaring um, sort of question as to why, you know, why do, why do you all do X, Y, Z? I, you know, I think much of the work that you do is driven by ordinance requirements, charter requirements, or statutory requirements at the state level. Um, the level of detail um, that you all have adopted and the level of scrutiny that you all as a city have applied um, to the development review process is a reflection of, of local policy. Um, preferences and, and local culture, right? So that's not something that I would really want to benchmark against other communities and say you're doing it wrong. Ultimately, that's a decision that you all as the governing body um, and as a community will make, right? Fair um, enough. But in terms of the in terms of the functions, uh, I'd say pretty pretty consistent, uh, pretty comparable functions across okay, the board. Fair enough. But that's a that's a great validation to hear from an outside third party. Thank you, Madam Mayor. That's all the questions I have. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. Mr. Friedman? Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. I can tell that it's a late even for us because uh, Mr. Jordan and I have uh, the jackets have come off. So, um, and two, I, I appreciate the presentation, Mr. Ingram and Kittleson. You remind me actually of Penn and Teller right now for obvious reasons. And I'm also excited because this is the first time on council that I get to use my college textbook for uh, process improvement in public administration. And it, it fits right into this, the whole section on program evaluation. So it's a triple whammy for me right now. Um, so I, I do have a few questions. Um, the first, I'll, I'll start with the, the program evaluation itself, just doing it, there's different types, but we're doing a process evaluation, but it gets into some of the comments on, especially with, I'm gonna look around, I have a lot of different notes here. Um, the, the um, the, the PI, the process improvement exercise that's going to be taking place. And specifically in regards to doing a um, an outcome evaluation, which is slightly different than the process. And, and you mentioned it earlier, what are the outcomes we want to achieve? And um, in this case, it is having a community development department that promotes sound community planning, but an efficient process. So um, how is that going to be addressed in the PI or the, that you're going to be doing? Mm -hmm. Well, so part of part of what we do as part of the process improvement exercise is we sort of set guiding principles. So here's the ground rule, rules of the conversation. Here's the ultimate goal of this process. Um, we structure uh, the process over essentially three days. It'll be about three half days at this point um, uh, where uh, we structure an agenda that starts big picture. What are the what are the principles that we can agree upon? And then what are the specific steps uh, down into the minutia, the action steps, the implementation plans um, uh, to carry forward implementing those? So, you know, we start with that a priori principle. We start with a with with with, a, with an agreement um, and a conversation around disagreement, so that we can all come to one place. Um, so, uh, you know, the entire process itself, uh, you know, is designed to streamline the process. So, part of our part of the process mapping that we did, um, we'll have. Uh, basically a central room that shows all those process maps printed on large butcher paper um, that really identifies where the process issues are. So we'll incorporate some of the process mapping activities. Um, so it really applies, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with lean or Six Sigma, it applies uh, to many degrees, some of the lean principles um, to work out steps of the process. 
Great. Well, that's encouraging that you're going to get in that level of detail. Um, mm -hmm. And that's more than we need for this meeting right now, but I just wanted to understand how, how that was going to work. Um, so sure. some of the questions I have, um, one is, um, let me see here, is the, um, it's in terms of, it follows up on Councilmember Alejandro Gutierrez's um, request for metrics, and this is, might be one more for George Bill that we can discuss in the next item. But um, is do we have the right, and maybe you can answer this somewhat, the right um, accountability metrics right now that we're tracking? And specifically for Mr. Buell, when we get to your budget item, page D21, I noticed there's a, a couple of new metrics that are coming up. But um, in terms of just a, a grand overview, Mr. Ingram, um, do we have the proper metrics um, in place to um, that we're tracking to promote a good process or good good outcomes? Or do we need to change the, change some of those? So uh, many many years ago, uh, and I, 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 the date escapes me, but the city went through a process uh, to develop a green book, um, which um, identified ultimately a, a matrix of um, plan review timeline expectations. So you know the ultimate measure um, in the process is how long does it take you to get these reviews done, and what's the overall length of the process. And the city, the department, the community development department, each department does a really good job of tracking that data. The question is whether those particular guidelines are appropriate or the particular targets are appropriate now, I think is an open question that will be tackled as part of the process improvement exercise. So do you need, does it need to change based on revisions to the process from 21 days to a 14 day review, or does it need to change from a 21 to a 30 day review? One of the realities is um, oftentimes what developers, what applicants are looking for isn't necessarily a hyper fast turnaround, but a predictable turnaround. That's really that's really the key outcome that we're, we're trying to target. So if we need to have a conversation about, you know what, we've implemented these process improvement changes, um, our timeline, uh, our time to review plans, um, we can't really do it within, within, the, within the constraints. We need to either adjust the time, uh, adjust the timeline expectations or we need to look at additional staff so part of what we want to do is equip you all to have that conversation um you know following some of the process improvement implementation as well so, so so the metrics that we have and potentially changing those that's still to be determined based on more information you're gathering is that fair to say i think it, that's one of the outcomes of the process improvement exercise are they Thanks. still appropriate yeah okay um and then um so another question I had, it gets to our design review and our, and our design review boards. Um, there's two sides on this in our community. There's some who would say that they're overly burdensome and then they, and they slow the process down. And there's others that say they protect the integrity of our history. And I think there is both, both are, um, can be, can be uh, valid, both are valid and they do provide an important service for us. But one of the, points that you mentioned uh, in particular was to um, it is to give our staff a more formal role role at the design review boards not necessarily a city attorney and the way I took it was is to have staff provide a recommendation based on findings um, and then they would have those findings and the design review board would start from there and even at council we get a project that's on appeal to us and the the recommendation isn't either um, approve or deny it's we could do other and there's findings for both so my question is would it be more of a constructive process both for the public who want to protect the integrity of our community and for the project applicants if the process was that our staff came in with a recommendation on a project as it gets further down the line of course um either to support it or not and have those findings and then the the boards and ultimately council if it came to us would have that as a starting point rather than leaving it up to us to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Does that make, does that make sense? Or and what do other communities do? Do they have it just here's the information for you? Yes or no. Or do other communities say approve or deny based on these findings? Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, nearly every community says approve or deny based on these findings for planning commission. Right. And you all, you all essentially make a staff recommendation for planning commission now. Um, the degree to which you formalize a recommendation, um, it honestly will be a matter of preference. Um, at, at the very least, the need to very closely frame the conversation is sort of tier one. Uh, tier two is to make a very explicit recommendation in the staff report based on experience, based on regulatory environment. This is, this is appropriate, this is not appropriate. Um, and then to utilize the expertise on those design review boards 
to discuss alternatives um, uh, should uh, should should there be an issue. Um, uh, uh, so so that's that, that's ultimately the direction I think um, it's worth pursuing. Okay. Um, and then, sorry, I'm just, I have a lot of different things I uh, wanted to um, talk about, but I think you've addressed most of them. Um, Mr. Kaser, Mr. Buell, this one is for you, just to clarify the technology performance measurement aspect of it and the Excella. Uh, we have allocated, or we are in the process of allocating additional outside resources of expertise on this. Um, we had those discussions. Is that my understanding correct that we're considering that? I just want to make sure the public understands what we're doing. Yes, we will have further conversation on that as we get into our, our budget hearing after this. Okay, and I think those are um, all the questions I have for, for right now. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Friedman. Mr. Gutierrez, go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask, I'm not sure if uh, you already spoke on this, but what kind of, uh, what kind of, um, what, sorry, let me just uh, compose my thought here. What services uh, did you note that are being offered to the Spanish speaking community? Well, each of the, you know, the, the design, I'm not exactly sure the intent of the question, but um, the land development process, uh, there are existing translators. Um, I wouldn't say we specifically reviewed it, reviewed the process within that framework, but um, um, the step, the, the process is available. There are translators available. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that, that came up as a major issue. So that wasn't something people commented on? when you did your uh, surveys and spoke to, did you speak to a lot of Spanish speaking people when you were coming up with your report? There were several Spanish speaking uh, folks in the neighborhood group, uh, focus groups, yes, as well okay. as city staff. And that wasn't an issue from what not, you not a, not a prevailing issue, no. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Gutierrez, go ahead. Just for clarification, um, piggyback on what Mr. Gutierrez just mentioned. So you spoke to Spanish speaking um, members of the community and there was a translator and you, you locked that meeting feeling that both groups were, they were no. understanding of, of your, of the messaging or the conversation. We spoke, we spoke to, there were individuals in the neighborhood focus groups who were bilingual. That's okay. A specific way to put it. I apologize. Okay. Um, and then quick question on, on that um, subject. Do you feel that the, the development department is equipped with staff that, with staff that is trained in, you know, serving the Spanish speaking community to give, you know, there's, there's a whole language in development to be able to, to be clear in, in their findings or the needs, that the, the changes that they need to do in, in their blueprints that they present? Uh, I, I would say um, the question of whether we sort of specifically looked at um, individual staff's ability to provide translating services, we asked whether those services were available those services are available. Um, whether they're uh, whether they're avail available in a sufficient quantity, um, I think is maybe a, a, a question for discussion with staff. But it's not something we really specifically evaluated in detail. Mr. Buell. Yes, Madam Mayor, Councilmember Alejandro Gutierrez. I would like to add that we have numerous staff uh, within community development who are Spanish speakers. They have to pass a test that is administered through the human resources department. And uh, some of these staff are native to Spanish speaking countries. Others are uh, first generation and they're very fluent and capable in communicating detailed information in Spanish. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Jordan. And I assume we have some public comment, but go ahead, Mr. Jordan. Questions? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm sorry. I just thought of one more question. It was mentioned a little bit earlier, but I think it's for uh, Mr. Casey. Um, so the grand jury report 
hit too late this week to be included as an agenda item on here. And frankly, it's been lost in my email pummeling over the last couple of days anyhow. But I was just curious, um, where does that play a role in comparing what we're seeing on this report versus that report? And when would we get a chance to um, discuss that? Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council Member Jordan. So, right, we got the grand jury report over the weekend. Uh, so it's brand new. We've got 90 days to respond to their findings. They make a series of recommendations and findings that we're required to bring back to council uh, before we submit those findings back. So I think they, they dovetail in with the final recommendations that come out of the Novak report. At the same time, we'll be able then to facilitate and look at the, the grand jury questions as well. And, and as Mr. Ingram said, he's looked at it, so that could help maybe inform kind of their final recommendations to the extent. I, I saw a lot of overlap uh, between the two reports, um, so I, I didn't see any glaring inconsistencies or disagreements between the two. They just kind of took a little different approach, and uh, I think our Novak effort is a little, much more focused and going to come up with really some specific ideas and recommendations to implement that I think will meet the goals and objectives for what the grand jury was looking for. So I guess um, what really just concerns me is, um, I'll, I'll confess, I haven't read it yet. I, I didn't have a day where I wasn't getting 500 emails. So, um, but what uh, my concern is something that's in there that should be part of this discussion that hasn't been seen yet. Not necessarily that the two kind of talk about the same thing, but a specific idea in there that uh, is not part of the Novak report or a specific idea that will have budget ramifications. And I'm a lot more lenient on that than maybe what you've heard already from some of my peers. I realize we're gonna be talking budget every month for a year probably. So, but um, I mean, I'll, I'll defer to your judgment. You actually, so you actually, you think that from a, from a most of everything uh, kind of uh, subject matter that we're looking at most of what's in that Novak report and there's and that's in the grand jury report and there's nothing that really jumps up as needs to be pulled out of that grand jury report and talked about with the Novak report. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Jordan, uh, what I would suggest is that we commit to having the Novak folks look at the grand jury report and identify anything of real specific in nature that they feel they wanna incorporate into their final recommendations. Again, I, I, my quick reading on Saturday night of the grand jury report, it was a little bit more general about customer service and attitudes and that sort of stuff. Uh, and I think that the Novak effort is gonna come out with a list of very prescriptive recommendations that we need to go and implement that will then feed back and answer those grand jury questions. Um, and I, just for mayor and council and the public, I mean, we're not done in a week on this and we're not done in the budget process on this. This is, we're gonna have a really specific set of implementation items to stay focused on and to implement uh, at the same time that we're gonna be responding to grand jury over the next three months. So I'm not terribly worried that it didn't come up tonight because I think we're gonna have a lot more bites of this apple as we as we move forward with the implementation. Okay, focus. and safe to say, uh, safe to assume that by the end of this week, some of us go through that and we do see something, we could get that information to you and you could get it to the Novak people, right? Yes, but uh, the Novak people have already read the report uh, and I'll okay. ask them to well, go back and read, read the report again uh, with okay. that. Their frame, their frame of reference versus my frame of reference. Yep. So you yep. never, one never knows, do they? So, <laughs> okay, thank you, Madam Mayor. You're welcome. You know, Mr. Jordan, I'll th um, uh, chime in that I read the report pretty carefully from the grand jury. I think what stood out was a concern about the permitting fee structure that we charge too much and that discourages development. Um, and that there's a bias against growth in our city community development department. That that Those were two that stood out for me in the grand jury report, but you're you're right to ask how we would address all the concerns that are coming up. Gentlemen, I don't see any other city council members 
wanting to ask questions at this point. So I will ask the take a rest and I will ask the city clerk to uh, to go to public comment. Thank you. Mr. Casey. Yeah, Madam Mayor, if I could, uh, I think we wanted uh, Jason Harris to hop on really quick and give the recommendations that came out of the business advisory task force as well. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. And uh, if the slides could be advanced, please. So as the council may know, um, I'm the city's uh, uh, economic development manager, Jason Harris. I've been staffing the COVID-19 business advisory task force. This is a, uh, a mayor uh, commission that was recently ad hoc group uh, comprised of 20 business owners and business organizations uh, to help respond to the closure of businesses and uh, the in, during this pandemic period. Uh, this task force has uh, established a, a uh, several committees uh, evaluating different functions and activities that the city could conduct uh, to support business reopening and recovery. The, the regulations and permitting committee identified 10 specific process improvements to the city's building permit plan check process, uh, many that were highlighted in the NOVAC report. Additionally, the task force also identified the critical need for the workplace culture of the community development department to change and for all levels of city management to play an active role in resolving disagreements or on interpretation or application of codes and regulations. And lastly, the task force recommends that the city establish an ad hoc committee tasked with developing long-term regulatory reforms and ensure the task force recommendations are implemented. Next slide, please. The following four slides, uh, this being the first of list 10 plan check building permit process improvements. The first two recommendations are meant to streamline the review process and seek the city and seek that the city designate a lead plan checker in charge of every application to provide oversight for all departments to complete a review of initial plans within 30 days, as well as limit the review of plans to the scope of work and provide a complete initial reviews. Next slide, please. The task force applauds the department's adoption of digital plan submittals, recommends the department continue the effort of an adoption of Excel software updates as they become available and utilize parallel plan review instead of sequential, sequential plan review process. The group also recommends that third party construction valuation be allowed and prohibit a challenge to the valuation. Next slide, please. The next three recommendations are for the city to not challenge third party CASP that is uh, initialed for the certified access specialist review of report and certification. It's recommended that the city defer to a certified structural engineer stamp plans and allow continued flexibility to commercial fire sprinkler ordinance if suspension is not possible. Next slide. Lastly, the task force recommends the city incorporate resubmittal meetings with plan with the plan reviewer, provide direct access to plan checkers for resolution of comments, that the city reinstitute over-the-counter plan check by appointment for smaller projects and designate the entire central business district as a 100% zone of benefit. This completes the task force's 10 plan check review uh, and development review process recommendations, as well as the overarching recommendations for a cultural change uh, in the department, as well as an ad hoc committee to oversee implementation, as well as other regulatory reforms. Many of these items were referenced in the NOVAC report and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. The floor is open for questions from our city council members on this section. Ms. Uh, Ms. Snedden. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, for Mr. Harris, for the ad hoc committee to oversee, um, maybe this is a little bit similar to what I was asking about earlier. So would that be, who would be on, I mean, we wouldn't set it right now, but, but who are recommended to be on? Is that council members and planning commissioners and different groups? And is that about the urgency of the NOVAC? recommendations or? 
the the uh, task force was was not uh, making any specific recommendations of composition of a body. They were just uh, concerned that there have been past efforts uh, such as uh, such as this, where um, there's been recommendations and process improvements uh, suggested, and 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 little little change or, or implementation was made, or at least uh, uh, in an exterior review. Um, so I, I think that was where, where that recommendation was coming from. As we heard uh, the, the Novak consultants uh, referencing, they were similarly uh, making a recommendation and, and I'd be interested in, in seeing what um, you know, best practices they, they may identify from other communities for consideration. So is this recommendation more for that business businesses or could it be incorporated into um, an overall task force looking at the changes in the community development department as a whole? Would these be mutually exclusive or could they be combined? Um, I, th I think the intent was really just some some form of uh, third party review process of which there would be um, you know, it could be a composition of, of elected officials and community individuals, but just giving some oversight of, of uh, these recommendations and the timeline of adoption and some just some level of oversight. And, and I think we heard the reference of accountability uh, made kind of throughout remarks. So I think touching upon those items. Yeah. And, and I'll attest myself to having made the recommendation. We've all made the recommendation of having a lead plan checker, carrying through, being the one on the project. This is, this is not a, new and we've been forceful about that recommendation so it is frustrating to see it again and i'm glad to hear that there's um part of all of this is a plan for actual implementation i mean we've these are very similar results to the cosmos study who told us the same thing but we all know our stakeholders and our constituents tell us and now to see it again and so i i, I can't be firm enough about applauding the need for the, the implementation um, plan. I have one more question about um, this no challenge to third party. Um, I, even though I have a high confidence in engineers and, and the use of an engineering stamp and all that, that entails and all that's at risk, um, I'm not sure I'm comfortable with no challenge. Um, I, could, I could be comfortable with deferring to a certified stamped plan, but the no challenge, could you explain a little bit more about that? What, what is, maybe I'm not understanding that. Right. Well, I, again, these these were um, not modified uh, by by staff, so so these were really being provided directly from uh, the business advisory task force members, uh, unadulterated. Um, I I think similar to maybe some of the comments and suggestions of of the grand jury report that maybe uh, there could be an opportunity for the Novak to incorporate this into their final review and recommendations. I was checking off uh, as they presented and, and gave description of, of their study elements. There was about at least half of these items were referenced in some degree. Um, they weren't as explicit in, in some specifics uh, that, that were made here by the task force recommendations. So I, I might defer to them as, as really being specialist in, in the field. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Mr. Jordan and then Ms. Harmon. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mr. Harris, so I just have a couple of questions. Um, well, maybe more than a couple. Um, so in the staff report, it's framed as this list of 10. And then in the staff report, you refer to the, the recommendation for an ad hoc committee to address longer term regulatory improvements to blah, blah, blah. So is that accurate that this is a list to send along potentially, but the ad hoc committee would work on other items that are not on this list? So uh, thank you for the opportunity, uh, Madam Mayor and Council Member to respond. The uh, I think the task force was was one re responding to, to their function. Uh, they've been mobilized to, to really address this this immediate crisis that, that the community's facing with business closures, uh, the, the unknown uh, opening date, uh, reopening date of many businesses, and then obviously the recovery period. Um, they're, they're sunsetted, they're, they will disband uh, here in, in, in short order as, as, as they're completely their kind of immediate task, but they ultimately were were pairing their kind of technical recommendations uh, and really 
the 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 initial list was much longer. Right? There were 20 plus items that they were recommending that were beyond just kind of the the development plan review uh, plan check process. Um, that, that so one I think the recommendation of having some some form of oversight body uh, created to just help ensure uh, implementation was was to that element. And then the the secondary piece was in context uh maybe this this ad uh kind of ad hoc committee of some some nature could also evaluate and I, I think i was hearing some references in in the novak report of additionally evaluating the the design review process so you know these these um comments were really on the building permit uh process principally um but there was similar commentary and question and, and concerns raised about the design review process, ARB, the Historic Landmarks Commission, et cetera, that this effort, because the ad hoc uh, uh, business advisory task force is really focused on reopening and recovery, those longer term uh, land use entitlement processes important, but you know, I think the real focus was trying to re-tenant properties that have become vacant during this pandemic uh, and, and probably less in the you know bigger design review um, process. So that was part of just their directive by staff of keeping focused and narrow in, in their evaluation of, of the permitting regulatory role. Okay, so that confuses me even more because when I look at this list of 10, almost half of them I would call long-term efforts that couldn't be solved overnight. Like, you know, you did something yesterday, you're not gonna do tomorrow. Um, so were, were they all, have they been previously vetted with uh, um, community development on whether they would qualify as immediate relief type of suggestions that could be implemented quickly to address redevelopment or development coming out of an economic disaster? Um, Madam Mayor and Council Member, to know this list wasn't um, pre-vetted with community development staff. Uh, it was taken by um, the task force members directly. Um, all, there was just re re revisiting the list of, of members on, on that uh, committee, uh, two developers, uh, a, a local architect, and, and several business owners that have uh, developed multiple properties in the city. And so they were they were speaking from their, their recent and historical property um experience and and challenges and in, in relation to again this focus of as we imagine the city losing x number of businesses during this closure pandemic period uh as we look to re-tenant properties just the tenant improvement process of of you know business uh businesses coming in and having to get permitted what would be the kind of top 10 list of issues that they would encounter and or other related uh regulatory requirements or processes that uh you know could be streamlined or added and benefit and so one of those i think to to your your kind of questioning and approach of you know extending the central business district um for instance uh to 100 percent zone of benefit you know that that's that's a big item and, and it could be a big item of process to to implement that change but the potential Im, impact and benefit to businesses trying to retain a property and seek tenant improvements and meet the conditions thereof w would be very immediate if if those changes could be made and I know there have been other items talked about that aren't on this list. So are, are, is the role here tonight to also suggest other items that uh, aren't on that list and see if we can get them added on that list? Is that part of this process? Well, um, Madam Mayor and Council Member, I, I think this, this list was really a snapshot in time of the task force looking at uh, kind of the short term immediate improvements. Uh, again, back to your question of, well, what, what amount of the process would be required to implement and, and what, you know, consistency of, of other process. But again, keeping the, the, their focus narrow of not extending beyond kind of a overarching, uh, you know, review of the overall development review process. They, they were inclined to go there. I think they'd be willing to offer you know, recommendations if, if we asked them to, to delve into a greater design review kind of uh, assessment as well, but they were keeping their focus okay. narrow. I'll save some comments for that later. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, well, Mr. Jordan, let me turn the question on you. Wh whatever you're thinking that's not on there, is it in the NOVAC report already? No, yes, and okay. the NOVAC report is not, in my mind, is not related to this piece of paper that's oh. in front of me. What's in front of me okay. is supposed to be 
immediate improvements we can offer for relief, as the way I understand it, immediate improvements we can offer to relief uh, that directly uh, address an economic disaster coming out of the pandemic that was also preceded by the fallout in retail on State Street, right? Got it. The, everything that's in the Novak report, some of that would are similar on here, like uh, making the CBD 100% zone of benefit, which is a a zoning change or a or a ordinance change. Um, everything there is a process that's going to take months and months. Um, there are other items that I know uh, most people in the room are aware of that were part of a list of a working group I was working on that some of these were used that I feel are immediate items also. And I don't know the status of if they were talked about, vetted, discussed, discarded, or what that may be. So I guess I'm looking for an appropriate time to talk about those. Thank you. In that yeah, context, the immediate, not, not long-term. The immediate, got it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Ms. Harmon. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, gosh, I'm more confused now after Council Member Jordan's question. I, um, though some of these action items may take some time to implement, we could move forward to implement them immediately, correct? If the council so choose, they could make a recommendation. Uh, this is listed for action. Okay. And if we decide to move forward with certain of these items today or in six months, I mean, it would just be delayed by six months if we waited six months to do it. Is that correct? Like there's no, I guess I'm trying to understand what the focus is on something that can be effectuated tomorrow versus starting the process of effectuating something that's longer term tomorrow. Is there some inherent value in one over the other? Um, and is this something that the advisory task force discussed or did their perspective seem to be um, whether or not something could be immediately implemented, even if it takes a little bit longer, there is value in immediately beginning the process. Certainly, uh, Madam Mayor and Council Member, the, the task force, uh, that was the initial question to them. What immediate changes could be made? What immediate um, functions could be altered that would facilitate business, new biz business investment? And and none were initially identified. And so then the next set of questions was with recognizing there can't be any kind of quick fixes. What are the more substantive of issues holding back uh, development again, kind of centered on this function of not necessarily thinking of ground up, you know, new development of just taking existing properties and, and you know, the standard issue of, of, you know, building out a new restaurant or building out a new re retail space. What are the kind of historical common issues that have con continued coming up or that are uh, holding back development or, or investment as it were? Um, and, and this was, was the list that they came forward where I'd, I'd also just acknowledge that, again, this, um, the list has not been um, vetted and processed with community development staff. And so, you know, I would ultimately, you know, look to them as being the experts in process to evaluate, you know, what is feasible, what to the reaction of uh, council member Snedden of, of, you know, reacting to some of these recommendations of to take them in, in whole part, allow staff to, to give, you know, a, a peer review or technical review response. Um, um, because again, this is coming straight from, you know, the business community and, and albeit they've got great experience, but they're also thinking of, of their interest uh, as much as it was the community. And so seeking an opportunity for community development staff to, to review uh, and reflect and, and, and add any, you know, recommendations or advisement as to, you know, the pros and cons trade-offs that, that these processes, uh, if implemented, may, may have. Understood. As with the other actions that we have taken in connection with the Business Advisory Task Force, we um, have been working um, in giving broad direction and then allowing staff to run with that broad direction. I think um, it makes sense to continue to operate um, under the same under the same sort of orientation that we have been in connection with with these items that come out of the task force. I just have two more quick questions. Um, Mr. Harris, this is related to one of the issues that Councilwoman Snedden brought up a long time ago. I just want to make sure that I that I understand. Um, on slide 44, the first bullet point where it says no challenge to third-party CAS, 
my understanding of this recommendation is that we could delete no challenge and say defer to third party cast, much like we are deferring to certified structural engineers stamped plans that certified structural engineer is sort of the same can be analogized to a third party cast. So we are saying here, uh, I don't know if no challenge really is the right word, defer to third party cast. Is that understanding correct? Uh, yeah, I think that that might be some some nomenclature. Uh, defer okay, no I challenge. I think that nomenclature is important. Okay, so I'm going to make that change in my notes. And my last question is related to Ms. Harmon. Mr. Stuffler has popped on. Did you have a response to this discussion that we're having right now, sir? We can't hear you. We still can't hear you. <laughs> ah, now can okay. you hear me? Yes. I think I was muted for a while there, um, beyond my control. Madam Mayor, Council Member Harmon. So the, um, the in these first two items on this slide, um, the city is obligated to provide a review. We, we cannot defer our plan review. Um, however, City Council can give staff direction on the level of risk that we're willing to accept. The less review we do, the more risk that we accept or that we allow the property owner and the designer or engineer to accept. So we can we can say we're going to we're going to look at an engineer's stamp, make sure their license is accurate and they use the appropriate standards, but we're not going to look at their calculations and we're not going to look at their details in their structural design. We're going to trust that they did it right but we're just going to confirm these fundamental pieces, right? So that would be the lowest level of review with the highest amount of risk. On the other end of the spectrum, we could go through their calculations, recalculate them, tell them they are off by two decimal, you know, by a hundredth of a something and make them redo their calculations. Um, that would be the far end of the spectrum, right? So um, this, I think what we're hearing the request here is not to walk away from our review responsibility, but it is to give clear parameters on what that review entails. And then in the, in the COVID-19 um, business recovery uh, scenario or situation, we want to expedite that review. So we're probably going to assume maybe a little more risk. And the same would apply for a CASP report. If a CASP uh, certified access specialist stamps a plan says, hey, this plan is, to the best of my knowledge, meets all the accessibility requirements. We're not going to walk away from our review because we can't do that, but we could confirm that they are a license, they are a certified cast. We can do some quick checks in a couple places just to make sure they didn't miss anything big and move on. Thank you. That's very, very helpful. Um, Mr. Stuffler, would you mind if I asked you just a, a, a few quick follow-ups? Um, what's the level of, of review that we currently do wrote on certified structural engineer or CASP. I mean, do we get into the nitty gritty checking, you know, the 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 numbers as you describe them? Madam Mayor, Council Member Harmon, this gets to one of the points that the NOVAC group identified. It depends on your plan reviewer. We have a spectrum. We have a couple of plan reviewers who are extremely detailed oriented. And are those people who are checking those numbers themselves certified engineers? In some instances, they are not. Actually, okay. in all instances, they are not. Okay, well, that is a, um, a great point because I imagine our risk is increased even with the checking if it's not similarly being done by a licensed professional. It is um, not a peer review. Yes, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, my last question, hopefully just a quick one, I think is maybe for Mr. Kalan, if he's... I'm guessing he's still on. Um, on the slide 47 on limiting the scope of permitting plans and inspection, I'm, I'm also connecting this to page two of the, of the agenda report. Um, I haven't heard before that the municipal code require us, us to review an entire site for code compliance, even if it goes beyond the scope of um, of the enforcement complaint. I'm, and so I'm just wondering if you could give me a little bit of color on that. That's the first time that I'm hearing that it was a it's a specific requirement in our code. Can you just tell me a little bit about that? Certainly, uh, Mr. Buell asked for our opinion last fall 
there are sections both in the uh, coastal zoning in Title 28 and in the inland uh, zoning in uh, Title 30. Those sections uh, aren't related to enforcement. They impose a duty in Title 28 on the chief building official and in Title 23, excuse me, in Title 30 has been revised to impose the duty on the community development director, uh, not, uh, well, let me read it to you. Uh, the community development director with respect to new development has to enforce the title by withholding, suspending or revoking permits, approvals, final inspections or certificates of occupancy where plan checks or field inspections reveal that completion of the project will result in a violation of the title. So the code compels the chief building official and community development director to look at the entirety of plans to determine whether there's another violation on the site. Is there case law on that or is that that's just that it's a municipal code requirement. There's no case law that I'm aware of. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Well, it seems like Mr. Buell, did you have something to add to that question discussion, sir? Ms. Gorman, you need to unmute Mr. Buell. Or Mr. Buell, you need to unmute yourself. Can't hear you. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Mr. Buell, Thanks, you're not. Yep, of that course. Was there we go. Problem. You're good. I I hit a mute button that I didn't realize. Madam Mayor, this segues into the last portion of our of our presentation here, and that uh, relates to the initiation of the Municipal Code Amendment that Councilmember Harmon was inquiring about and, and City Attorney Kalan was addressing. And uh, seen on the screen here, and as previously described, this is something that is happening, and it is a source that is leading to frustration and anger among our customers when they're either in the plan check process or in an inspection process and they don't realize that we we will uh, sometimes if appropriate expand the scope of our review to address these issues so that we're compliant with the with the code provision that Mr. Kalan just read next slide please there we go so this leads to our recommendations and uh, it has to review and adopt the recommendations of the uh, COVID-19 Business Advisory Task Force, establish the ad hoc committee, and staff also recommends that the, that your council initiate municipal code amendment to limit the scope of building plan review and inspections. And that will include uh, public engagement for this code amendment, and it will need to go through our planning commission and then back to the city council for final approval. This is an ordinance amendment and we would need to follow that uh, procedure that's prescribed in our code. That concludes our presentation. And then let me start. Um, so changing this, making this municipal code amendment will relieve customer frustration and anger. Is that right? Yes, Madam Mayor. Okay. So let me ask you this question to you and Mr. Casey, you're, we're, the suggestion is to establish an ad hoc committee, but what if the whole council took this up, the seven of us, instead of a three person committee where we would have to notice it and we, cause we want public participation. So if all seven of us get these back, because what I'm understanding is these recommendations are the ones that we want quicker than not. And Mr. Harris said, these haven't been vetted by your staff yet. You or your staff, because we heard Mr. Stuffler right now clarifying something. So how quickly could these come back? This, the, no, the, um, the business advisory task force recommendations, because we want them to be quick. How quickly can they come back to us with your staff, Mr. Buell, having vetted them so we could just have a really good discussion and push it out the door Mr. Casey, Mr. Buell, what's your response to that? Uh, Madam Mayor, maybe I'll, Madam Mayor, uh, maybe I'll take the first stab at it. Um, you got a number of different moving parts in front of you. And so after public comment, we'll have to talk to you and, and get your guidance and uh, direction. 
because on the one hand, you have the, the Novak report that's going to come out with a very detailed implementation plan. And I think there's probably a desire from the community to make sure that, that gets implemented and that that maybe has some sort of level of oversight, either from the full council or a council subcommittee or something. Uh, you then have uh, these business advisory task force recommendations that haven't really been vetted by staff or the public yet. And so that's what you're saying. Maybe that should come back to the full council and that's an option as well. Uh, and then you have on top of that, you have this uh, this need or, or recommendation to look at your design review process and make sure that's working for your needs as well. So those are all kind of different components. Uh, and I think we need to be somewhat strategic because we can kind of overload and tilt the system and not be effective at anything if we take it all on at once. Um, and so I think after public comment, let's hear the public comment mm -hmm. and then uh, talk as a council, uh, you know, with us engaging and, and see how we want to try to structure and manage this to make sure we're effective at implementing the changes that are being recommended. Okay. Any other questions at this point before we go to public comment? Ms. Gorman, um, Mr. Jordan, go ahead. I'll bite um, for Mr. Buell, I think. Um, so is um, extending the CBD and the 100% zone of benefit, uh, that is also a muni code change, right? Oh, sorry. Extending the CBD to 100% zone of benefit, that is a muni code change also, right? I think that was a yes, you muted me. Yes, yes. Okay, and so it would follow, so it would be, as an example, that would be a, that would have to follow the same path as the uh, scope creep that you just uh, pointed out there on that other slide, right? Yes. And then, um, is there something present? Is there something involving the California Coastal Commission that would prevent us from moving the CBD into the funk zone? Are we stuck there between Title 28 and, 20, and Title 30, and what we're doing with the uh, new zoning ordinance that um, a muni code change locally couldn't also move the CBD into the funk zone? I would. Madam Mayor, Councilmember Jordan, if I could ask uh, City Planner Renee Brooke to join us here. Thank you. Hi, Hi Madam Mayor and Councilmember Jordan. Um, so yes, you're correct. The funk zone is in the coastal zone. Um, if we were to extend the zone of benefit down to the, the funk zone, um, it would just take longer to be effective down there. So we could do that um, inland, uh, you know, relatively quickly, uh, um, um, but to then have that effective in the coastal zone, it's not to say it would be impossible because we laid out our local coastal program policies when we updated our LCP to, we saw this coming. So we set the policies in place to do it, but it is that added step of uh, then submitting those code amendments to the coastal commission and getting their certification. Thanks. You might stay there. I might these other these other couple questions I have might also be for you. If um, somebody was interested in pushing for um, a suspension for a period of time for stormwater management triggers in the CBD, is that a simple um, revision of text or is that also a muni code change? Um, Madam Mayor and Council Member Jordan, I'm not an expert on what that would require. Um, that is a program managed by the Creeks Division, but I do know that the authority to enact the stormwater guidelines is in the municipal code. Um, so I think it's in Title 22, so we need to look at that and see if there's actually a code amendment or if it's a, a guidelines. So presumably what I'm trying to do obviously is to group some other things that I have ideas on that would track with the muni code change that's uh, been suggested so that they all could all happen at the same time, right? right. And, um, and I think that's the only two that I had. So thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. We do need to take a break for our translators and um, 
and for technical staff. So let me ask when Ms. or how many, Ms. Gorman, how many people are waiting to speak? They've also been waiting a long time. Ms. Gorman? Madam Mayor and Council, uh, eight people have raised their hand to speak on this item. Okay, so as a courtesy to the public, let's go ahead and, and do public comment and then we'll take a break after that. So, thank you. Yeah. Very have good. Three minutes, if you could be quicker, we would be grateful. Thank you. I know it's a big topic, take your time. Uh, okay, I will list out the names of the speakers and then we'll start. Anna Marie Gott, Emma Wilkins, although I I'm not sure about Ms. Wilkins, I'll confirm with her. James Marston, Jared Gordon, Jason Yeager, Jim Cannell, John Campanella, Nick Koontz, and Rochelle Monet. And I believe our timer is up. Okay, Anna Marie Gott, you have three minutes. Please go ahead. Sure. Stormwater management is part of EPA regulations and the Clean Water Act. So I have a really hard time believing that we're going to go ahead and say this is not required. Regarding the CBD and the zone of benefit, no one has even thought about the Coastal Commission. Do you actually think the Coastal Commission is going to allow you to develop without parking in the coastal zone, right where they want to have public access for the coast? Um, this, uh, Mr. Harris said at one point that this list was unvetted and it really was. He also said that it was in the interest and that is usually the financial interest of everyone sitting on a, a committee that was not voted on, that public can't even um, participate in meetings and which is really just supposed to be an interim board only to reopen uh, State Street. And why are we talking about brand new development when we have all of these empty storefronts? So that's really not making a whole lot of sense to me. Regarding though, um, the, the NOVAC uh, report, um, it was really interesting. I had a council member actually recommend that I, you know, interview with the NOVAC report, um, the NOVAC people, and no one ever called me. And in fact, when I actually did reach out, they basically said they weren't interested. I know more about you know design review than most of your um, most of the public, so it's really kind of interesting that of all the people that they didn't talk to, they didn't talk to me. Regarding competency, there's no competency, competency testing of staff, so that means there's not going to be any consistency, and that also means there's going to be no accountability. So that's a big problem. Another problem is that when you go into these meetings. Um, your city attorney will not, even if they know what the regulation is, will not state what it is because they actually say they're not supposed to train the other staff members who are manning the, the ABR board. Regarding public documents and, you know, transparency, staff creates multiple documents, their PRTs, DART reports, base flood elevation, modification letters, waivers, deem complete um, documents. All of these documents should be readily available and posted when an item comes to um, to an to an agenda. Right now, those documents say how a project does or does not meet ordinances, and we have seen projects that go to the ABR that are missing sidewalks. The setbacks don't meet the ordinances. There are parking problems and there's ADA problems. Your board members are supposed to actually attest that these projects meet all ordinances before they grant approval. And that's the problem. All of these okay. documents can easily be provided. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Our next speaker is Emma Wilkins. I'm not sure if Ms. Wilkins wishes to speak on this item, but her hand is raised. Ms. Emma Wilkins, did you wish to speak on this Novak report item? Okay, we can come back with her. Next speaker is James Marston. James Marston, you have three minutes. Please go ahead. Mr. Marston, please go ahead. We'll come back to Mr. Marston. Jarrett Gorin, and then we'll have 
Jason Yeager, Jim Cannell, John Campanella. Hello. Jared Gorin, you please go ahead. Great, hi everybody. Um, Jared Gorin from Vanguard Planning. And I was glad to be a participant in one of the focus groups. And I think this memo captures some of what we discussed in the groups and, and there's some excellent comments that are presented in it. Um, after participating in the study, there's a couple things that concern me. The first is I think this memo soft pedals what I know came out of the focus groups. And what I mean by that is things like inspectors are arbitrary gets turned into there can be inconsistency. Um, those are two different things in my mind. And I think your council should request that they provide you with the notes from the focus groups, just so you compare what people said to what is ending up in this memo and ultimately in the report. Um, I also perceive that there's a sort of undertone that the problems in the community development department are being generated by applicants. So like this idea of shopping an application is, is unusual. You know, I'm, I'm a pretty clever applicant and I'm not sure how you could do that. Everyone who works in community development knows you can't go to ABR and planning commission to shop for different decisions. You have to go to ABR before you can even get to planning commission. And then the planning commission considers the ABR's comments when it reviews your project. So where'd that come from? I was also really surprised by this recommendation to create a formal checklist and screening process for applications. You could put a sign on 630 Garden Street that says checklists are us and no one who regularly does business there would think that was strange. If you look at all the various handout sections on your website, it's a checklist festival. Uh, the design review submittal checklist identifies more than 80 different pieces of information and statistics that have to be included in any ABR, HLC, or SFDB application. And staff's been using that for years. Um, we do tons of accessory dwelling unit projects. There's 65 types of information on that checklist. Um, we've gotten 20 or 30 approved, more than I can count. We know what we're doing and we provide what's on the checklist, but you know how many of our applications have been deemed complete? Zero, because if staff deems them incomplete, they get to stop the clock on the state mandated, mandated review period. So that's why checklists aren't gonna solve anything. And then uh, this intake hours thing is a real red flag. Uh, that's just a way to create more delays because you can't now submit until there's an appointment. And uh, we can certainly have somebody take applications from start to finish, but there's no need to hitch that to intake appointments. One thing I didn't see any discussion of at all is the idea of a workplace culture change. I know we talked about that in our focus group. I know others talked about it. It was on the very first slide that Mr. Harris presented to you, but it's not in the Novak memo. Are we gonna see any meaningful improvements? Not unless you demand it not unless you hold your staff accountable. And I've never seen that happen before. And I really hope this time it will be different. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next person. Our next speaker is Jason Yeager. You may unmute yourself. Jason, please go ahead. Jason Yeager, we will come back to you. Steve Connor, I see you also wish to speak on this item. We'll come to you. Jim Cannell, you're next. Jim Cannell, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, wow, it's been a long six hours waiting. Um, listen, I, I've listened to all the conversations regarding the reports, the the back group and so forth and so on. But the, the real issue I have is can be summed up by the conclusions of the grand jury, which states that there is a strong lack of leadership. And they repeat that several times. They repeat not only that, but that there's a bias in the planning department. They also say there's low morale. They also say that the planning department and the building department work independently of each other, not together. So I guess what I'm saying is, is that we're going around and around and trying to do a lot of different things when the culture of your building and planning department is broken. It doesn't work. You can plan all these different things that you're trying to do, but unless you have the horse to run with the cargo, it's not gonna get you there. 
you don't have the people and you're not making, you're not holding them accountable to doing the things that they have to do. When you've got to go to a grand jury and they got to come back and tell you that the planning and building department lacks strong leadership, what does that tell you? It's got to tell you that something isn't working and you can throw an ad hoc committee on, you can have different, different levels of, of whatever, but it's not going to work if the people in charge aren't going to work. And what this report states and what the other report states is that there is confusion, there is unrest, there is a lack of leadership and things aren't getting done at your own building department. So who do we hold accountable? Who do they work for? Why is it like this? None of these are being addressed. We're just talking about Band-Aid upon Band-Aid upon Band-Aid. My God, if I was a business owner and somebody told me that my staff lacks leadership, what does that tell you? It look, makes me forced to look at myself and say, I lack the leadership to put in the necessary things that need to make this thing work. That's the questions you need to ask. What's it going to take to make the planning and building department function like it should be? Because right now it doesn't. And until you make it function the way you want, it never will. Read the jury report. They lack strong leadership. Very Thank good. You. We'll move on to the next speaker, please. Uh, Jason Yeager, we'll go back to Jason Yeager. You should be unmuted on our end. Mr. Yeager, can you go ahead? All right, we will come back and he will call back in. Uh, okay, John, John Campanella, John Campanella, and then Nick Kuntz, Rochelle Monet, and Fred Sweeney. John Campanella, please go ahead. Unmute yourself and go ahead. Hi, uh, good evening. John Campanella, uh, Mayor Mario and council members. Uh, the Novak Consulting Report's preliminary findings to me are a fine start for land development process improvements. I also appreciate the city encouraging downtown housing applications through the upcoming amendments for downtown housing. A fact to note, however, in the last two and a half years, the net change to the AUD residences in the high priority, high and priority overlay has been four net units in two and a half years. We need to encourage applications. In that regard, then, I would ask you to ask Novak, what immediate items can we do to improve the situation beyond amendments? And I came up with three specific items that could be clear to staff and applicants, and I'm asking know that whether they found this out in their process. One, intake and application screening. Housing development project preliminary applications for multi-unit and mixed-use projects are subject to those ordinances, policies, and standards in effect when a preliminary application is submitted. This is according to state law effective at the beginning of the year. Is this made clear to applicants? We, historically, we require applications to be deemed complete by our definition in order to retain rights. Secondly, affordable housing policies and procedures should be current and understood in detail for both for sale and rental projects. The applicants are required to select either city inclusionary or state bonus, bonus density options at the submission of this preliminary application. This would affect also the project concept and economics. So it's important to evaluate these choices up front and put this in front of the applicant. Lastly, design review process. Another immediate thing that can be done. We have objective design standards and process uh, for public comment. They're going to be Spanish colonial revival. But until we come up with other standards for other architects designs, uh, the projects are going to be subject, subject to subjective design review. At a minimum, we should change infill design guidelines which consider density or reductions in floor area ratio a way to process the projects. 
This is against state law. You should put yellow tape around it, and that will have a big help in bringing out uncertainty in the process. So thank you uh, for asking the Novak Consulting Group to see if any of this makes sense to them or if they brought it up. Once again, preliminary applications, uh, uh, giving rights to the applicant, affordable housing policies that are understandable and clear and options could be made. And thirdly, a portion of in-seal design guidelines is changed immediately where it reduces density against state law. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Nick Koontz, then Fred Sweeney, then Rochelle Monet, then James Marston. Nick Koontz, you have three minutes. You can unmute yourself, please go ahead. Mayor Murillo, members of the city council, I sure miss being able to address you all face to face. Perhaps you would indulge me by turning on your cameras if you can, so that I might have better sense of connection. I would like to ask you all to reflect on your thoughts and sentiments regarding racial discrimination expressed earlier today. And now think about how you will reconcile that when reflecting on how you handle the issue of accessibility discrimination before you now. The fact that the Novak report purports to have consulted stakeholders, but the disabled citizens of this community were excluded from that discussion speaks volumes. As shameful as that is, it is overshadowed by the fact that some faction of those stakeholders were not content with the Novak report effort and have made an end run around it with this list of 10 demands from the COVID-19 Business Advisory Task Force. <clears throat> Half of which specifically items two, four, five, six, and 10 are particularly egregious as they have far reaching implications for accessibility rights. Such demands from a group seeking to undermine race-based civil rights would never make it to an agenda today. That leads me to believe that you must not fully understand how detrimental these changes would be to accessibility. From my perspective, this is a blatant and shameful attempt to leverage the COVID-19 pandemic to undermine the civil rights of this community's disabled residents and its visitors. I find it morally reprehensible that we are even considering changes clearly intended to circumvent the city's legal responsibility to ensure that state accessibility requirements are met. Without these checks in place, even well-intending property owners and commercial tenants will assuredly fail to meet accessibility requirements. It is well known by city staff that applicants routinely attempt to circumvent these important safeguards. Those same applicants are now demanding that you aid and abet them in their attack on civil rights today. If the city council feels that they must make some concessions today, I respectfully request that you carve out items two, four, five, six, and 10. Supporting any of these suggestions would be an endorsement of a systematic, systemic effort to subjugate civil rights to business profits. If you choose to move ahead with any of those items affecting accessibility, I ask that you first share your risk assessments with your constituents. We have a right to know what potential liabilities our tax dollars may be lost to. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, more comment, Ms. Garman? Uh, yes, next is Fred Sweeney. Mr. F Mr. Fred Sweeney, please go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Norman. Um, Madam Mayor, Council, Fred Sweeney. Um, I'm uh, calling or talking tonight as the et cetera in, Mr. No in the Novak report, Mr. Ingram. I would hope at some point you talk to the single family design board members. I checked with Brian Miller, our current chairman this morning, and he said at this point, there has been uh, no ability to have a conversation with your team. Um, and I don't think anybody else on our board has had that opportunity yet either. Um, so I think that's important. I have several items to talk about, but I'm not gonna be able to do that in the three minutes, but I'm gonna outline what those items should be. The silosization of the city, it's like any other large organization, it has silo issues. That has a direct reflection on how our, we're able to do our, board, our work efficiently as board members. Uh, the public hearing process that the single family design board 
it has to adhere to and uniqueness to our board versus the other two review boards. The staff support that we get, uh, I'd like to go in a little bit into that. We're, I, I've been on this board nine years now. I've served as six years chairman. And uh, we're now on our sixth or seventh staff person in the nine years I've been on the board. Um, I also want to talk about the economic inequity that comes about from individuals at the residential level in this community in order to obtain permits for the work that they want to do on their own residential homes. There's issues with how the checklist and the intake process occurs. Uh, I also want to talk about the appeals process that the board has experienced over the last few years as projects move to uh, the council. So there are some other things, but those are the high, high points. The silentization has direct reflection on our ability to do our work. We have requested on several occasions that the building department come to us to explain why our work as design approval board, why our designs are not being enforced. I've made, we've made that request several times. We've never had a response. And I think it has to do with two things. One, it's probably budget, because as you know, we have three review boards in town. By the time the budget gets down to us, a single family design board, basically my sense is we're out of money. So we're at the tail end of any, any kind of support. Uh, and so we find, and I have dozens of, of properties that I've identified where our design issues, it's not building department issues, design issues are not enforced. Uh, with regards to public hearing, and I've shared this with the city attorney, I've shared this with several members of the council. Yeah, finish your thought, please. Okay, uh, there's just too much. I would hope that Mr. Ingram, uh, please come and talk to us so that we have an opportunity to share a lot of information on how to make our work a lot easier and more efficient for those people that need to get building permits. Thank you. Very good. A any more speakers? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor and Council, three more speakers, James Marston, Rochelle Monet, and Steve Merrick Connor. Uh, James Marston, please go ahead. Am I on now? You can yes, hear me? We can, okay. we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Good evening, <laughs> Mayor Car uh, Mario and council people. I sent a long email yesterday, which pretty much uh, laid out my thoughts on some of these 10 points. I want to first say those are supposed to be by a COVID-19 group of uh, developers. And I'll uh, say whatever was said earlier. I've been on the boards here for 20 years trying to help uh, disabled people, not once, not once has anyone come to us or the Access Advisory Committee for any kind of stakeholder. I hate the word when I hear stakeholder, 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 and no one comes to our board and no one's talked to anyone in the Access community. Uh, I brought up my points and I think Andrew Suffer did say the whole thing about the uh, task report would be changed and the structural, structural engineer, but the one I want to really point out to you is, I, as I mentioned in my article, the accessibility requirements are based on the construction cost. We all know that those costs is always lowered because as the Novak group said, everybody's out for to save money. Now you're saying that somehow a third party person can give you an estimate and we're gonna have to base our accessibility spending on some estimate that right now says you can't challenge it. That's one of our biggest problems here. The law says you must do this. So when I hear this story about let's have a balance between the uh, developers and the community, there's no balance when it comes to, you cannot break the code unless you wanna change the code, okay? So those are some of the things that just really bothered me, but no one's ever come to anyone at the Access Advisory Committee for any kind of input. And that to me is a showing how marginalized we are as a group. And I don't think you really want two and a half hours of disabled people calling up and calling you guys names just to get some action. I've always tried to work directly with staff from Paul Casey's group down to Andrew's group and the city attorney. 
I, in a non-threatening way, I try to do that. And now I see that maybe that was the wrong way to do it. I hope you can just table this last COVID-19 list of the 10 or get rid of a bunch of them. Wait until the final report comes in. Wait until you've answered the uh, grand jury and then have some people from the disabled community pointing out that this is gonna ruin or hurt their lives. They have a right to evil access here. And no matter how much you don't wanna think about it, and yes, it costs some money, but that's what the law says. So thank you all for your good work. I'm so amazed that you're still awake, but it's been a long day. Thank you all, okay. Thank you. Next speaker. Next speaker is Rochelle Monet. Rochelle Monet, please go ahead. Uh, can you guys hear me? Perfect. So uh, I'm gonna list three very uh, specific, as uh, Paul Casey would say, incidence, incidences in which you have failed to lead. Our city administrator, Paul Casey, has known about the problems at the Community Development Department for years. Our poor business community has been severely suffering from the December 2017 fires and January 2018 mudslides. Now businesses have received the nail in the coffin under this global pandemic. The NOVAC report comes too late. We have had the grand jury report out and it validates what the community has been saying for years. Shame on you, Mr. Casey, for failing to lead. On January 15th, 2019, City Council knew the applicant at 2444 Santa Barbara Street had been red tagged multiple times for doing work without a permit. It was documented that the red tag was removed, which is a misdemeanor, yet no charges were pressed. This same applicant was a repeat offender at multiple other locations in Santa Barbara. Our city attorney gave assurance that action would be taken against them if there were any future violations. Within two months of the city attorney's statement, the same people got red tagged on a new location, which is the future home of a cannabis dispensary. This location is where our city then grants a cannabis dispensary license. Why is it that white people get a license and are able to cheat their way into getting a license? Why isn't that they get a building permit so fast after cheating nonetheless? There are various local groups looking into all of this and they are determined to put an end to such corruption, favoritism and racial discrimination. Mr. Casey, we want answers for your decisions. Kathy, how are we improving the development process to ensure that there's equality? Through this, pres through this presentation, I keep hearing customer centric, but why are you not customer centric towards the black and brown communities? For the past 30 years, Santa Barbara has enabled a business to use a racial slur, Sambos, for a name. In 1981, the Human Rights Commission in Rhode Island stated, and I quote, the use of the name Sambos has had the effect of notifying black persons that they were unwelcome at Sambos restaurants because of their race. The name Sambos was then um, rejected in Rhode Island and they were forced to change their name. Why hasn't this happened in Santa Barbara? In 1977, the Los Angeles Times stated, no black who was referred to as Sambo ever thought he was being complimented for his cleverness. The city of Santa Barbara has made it very clear to us, you do not support the black and brown communities and your failure to kneel on Sunday's protest, uh, protest exemplifies that. City council members, this is an easy, rip for you, uh, easy win for you. Get rid of the name Sandos on our waterfront. Thanks. It's for all of you to start to show confidence or and leadership, or it's time for you to step down. Thank you. Uh, next speaker. Next speaker is Steve Americana, then Accessible Santa Barbara, then Trey Penner. Steve okay, Americana. And, and we're gonna um, stop taking uh, slips after Trey Penner. Go ahead. Stephen Mayor Connor, you may unmute yourself and go ahead. There we go. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. All right. Madam Mayor, members of the council, my name is Stephen Mayor Connor. I've been a land use lawyer for 38 years in Santa Barbara. In my career, I've represented both private permit applicants and public agencies that issue permits. And so I have some appreciation for the challenges faced by different stakeholders in this process. There are four points I wish to make. 
Point one, Santa Barbara's future rests on a healthy economy, which includes profitable businesses, a strong employment base, and enough local housing with a wide variety of housing types so that people who work here don't have to commute 30 to 50 miles. All of these elements require supported local government that makes it fast and easy to get the, needs, the, need, the needed permits. You have three independent reports before you today that tell us in no uncertain terms that our current permitting system cannot be described as fast and easy. Point two, there should be two overriding targets for our permitting system. It should be predictable and it should be quick. We need people willing to invest in our community's future. We need to attract people willing to buy property or sign a five-year lease in order to open a restaurant or a clothing store or build new rental housing. If they can't predict whether and when they can open for business, they won't put their money at risk here. Our current permitting system is not predictable. Recall the report of an ABR member who criticized a proposed apartment building because its design failed to include enough, quote, poetry, unquote. The comment is alarming for what it reveals about our design review process. Point three, it's time for a bold new approach. The reports before you today suggest some good and needed reforms. Frankly, I believe that a much more fundamental set of changes is needed, including a recognition that we need to embrace a long-standing principle of life. Don't sweat the small stuff. Our city staff spends far too much time on details. We should focus our scarce and stressed public resources on the big issues. Finally, as I think you all appreciate, we can't afford to wait and the city council can't afford to leave it to others to address the problem. U7 should take a very active role in formulating and implementing these changes. Given our current community turmoil and the clear and present danger to our local economy, the city council has a sharp appreciation that action is needed now. And that sense of urgency should not be allowed to cool off. Thank you. Very good. Next speaker. Madam Mayor and Council, the next speaker is Accessible Santa Barbara, Will Railing. Mr. Railing, please go ahead. Hi, this is Will Railing. Um, and although I still live in San Francisco, I do coordinate Accessible Santa Barbara as well. Um, it's pretty rare that I think something is important enough to, to speak to you all. And this is one of those times. Um, uh, I hope in whatever motion you make, you're careful to separate out the uh, COVID-19 recommendations in the sense of, uh, you know, it's agendized for review and adopt recommendations. And these are clearly not ready for prime time as something you can adopt. I, I want to say a, a few words on the accessibility impacts that this could have. And I, I think this list reflects its well-intentioned, but it reflects a fundamental misunderstanding of how accessibility law works. Um, in California, California accessibility law requires the scope of work that you intend to be expanded, to look beyond your intended scope, look at the parking, look at the approach, look at the entrance, look at the bathrooms. And the city has a statutory duty under some government code sections and health and safety code sections to enforce the the statewide code. Uh, it's not um, something that's optional or that the city has the discretion to just say, we're not going to enforce this or we're not going to enforce that. So, you know, number two is I obviously just addressed um, and recommendations four, five, and six are in the same vein, um, basically directing city staff not to enforce statewide code on the building codes. And I just respectfully believe that would not be legal. Um, and, and, and remember too, that the building code has been adopted as a Santa Barbara municipal code section um, 22.04. And uh, so uh, um, item number five on the CAST reports in particular, I want to please direct the city attorney's attention 
to Municipal Code 22.04.020F, which creates a CASP review provision in the, the local building code, um, a new building code section 107.2.9. And it, is, it states that what you need to do in order to get um, an expedited review by supplying a cash report. So, so it would be totally improper for you to instruct staff to just do something different in how they handle a situation when, when the applicant, um, I mean, if you wanna change that municipal code section, you can start that, but I just wanna call attention to it. So um, I hope that this will be put out for some further study and come back in a more rational way and, and sort of you know, clear grammatical policies um, for further discussion. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. N next speaker. <clears throat> Our final speaker on this item is Trey Pinner. Trey Pinner, please go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor, members of the council for your long work today. We very much appreciate it. Um, and I have just a few brief comments on this item. Uh, overall, generally, I want to uh, comment that uh, uh, Steve Amir Connor's comments, I agree with fully on his point. So many of those things were covered in mind. I should point out that I uh, am a member of the task force for the COVID uh, recovery, and I did sit on the subcommittee regarding these recommendations. And I think the important thing to mention on this uh, is the general concept of, of why these are coming before you from the task force. Some people have asked why the task force was looking at this. And I think it's an issue of economics that the city is trying to deal with. Um, we know that the city has been approached many times about the concerns, about the difficulties of planning, the planning process, as Mr. Mayor Connor spoke, the uncertainty of the planning process. I think the task force was charged with looking at the future over the next couple of years that we may be dealing with in Santa Barbara and how do we help uh, kickstart things that we're gonna have to do in this community to uh, help businesses recover and new businesses get started. Um, State Street itself was struggling a great deal, even under the best of economies. And we have to start thinking about how we're going to deal with it under some difficult economies with uh, potentially reaching um, vacancies as high as 20, 25%. So I think the goal here um, was to help the planning process for businesses uh, and for housing processes to be more certain to move forward and spend the dollars that are going to be hard to find these days. So I, I appreciate uh, some of the concerns that maybe um, it wasn't, hasn't been fully vetted. And that's why we're here or hoping it's for you in front of you to uh, work on vetting these ideas, finding ways to make the planning process not become so overburdensome uh, with meeting the guidelines of the regulations that we have to follow. We understand that those are out there and we need to follow those, but let's get creative and I do think accountability is something we need to find more of in the planning department. And I appreciate your, your time tonight. Thank you, Mr. Penner. Ms. Gorman, that closes public comment, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. We will take a 10 minute break and come back. We have this item, we have one more uh, and we're gonna power through it. So thank you, we are in recess.
Can't hear me. Okay. <laughs> we'll reconvene our meeting shortly for whoever's listening. Uh, Ms. Gorman, are you there? Uh, Mr. Jordan. Okay. We. Thank you. Okay. So we're bringing this item back to the um, City Council for deliberation. And I'm going to make an announcement that we, uh, it's so late and, and it's been such a long day. I, we're, we'll, we'll try to focus and, and make these decisions on this item, but I'd like to propose that we uh, reschedule the next two items. One is the Community Development Department budget and then the city attorney budget. And um, we're, we're looking at um, possibly uh, the morning of, of this Tuesday. So a week, so a week from today. Um, we can't, we have to make good decisions. And I, th I think some of us are, are, are uh, tired. So with that said, um, let's get through this item. This is a very thick item. There's a lot to think about here. Ms. Snedden, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and um, thank you for acknowledging that uh, this really deserves much more scrutiny and um, public input. And at this time of night, I'm, I'm not thinking that a lot of the public is able to um, join and, and comment. So I think it is um, in fairness to the public and also in fairness to this particular topic. Um, I want to say a few things here um, in deliberation as we get started, but um, the commissioning of this study, it came from years of extreme frustration. This didn't come about overnight. And, um, you know, some say that it doesn't move fast enough in the business arena, but some say, um, we heard from Fred Sweeney again tonight, that, that enforcement isn't um, even and, and uh, that there are equity issues with that in enforcement. Um, I have to say I'm very disturbed uh, that the Accessibility Committee and um, me too. that is um, inexcusable and um, not even interviewed. And so Mr. Kuntz's points that item two, four, five, six, and 10, um, I don't want to contemplate going further with any of those until we have um, really vetted with our accessibility community and uh, network that we value their voices on. 
I'm also not understanding how um, SFDB, the Single Family Design Board, was not interviewed. Um, that is uh, such an integral part of, of what it is we're trying to um, take into account and, and have be more efficient. Um, so uh, to me, this Novak memo um, is incomplete. And I want to say that with exclamation points. Um, I also feel that it's not strong enough that to match um, the intensity of what we have heard for years. Um, I think it's very well stated, um, but I don't think it is truly reflective of the pent up frustration of the community in addressing these issues, um, particularly with the workforce and the workplace culture as well. Um, I know that I have spoken on these items uh, for a couple of years now. Um, what needs to happen is implementation. There's no question that we can have as we can we can commission study after study and and frankly they keep coming up with the same recommendation well maybe not recommendations but seeing the same weaknesses we need to implement we need to move on this but not move so quickly that we're sloppy or not taking into account um, all of our stakeholders and and really now I think we have a new sensitivity to how much we need to be looking at equity uh, issues in this as well. Um, this deserves action and equity considerations. Um, our current permitting system, it needs to be predictable and efficient. It's neither of those things, which is problematic for all parties involved, those who want to move quickly and those who want to be structured. It's, it's not satisfying anyone. Um, and action's needed now. And the big, big part of that is accountability. I'm still not clear on where the accountability for this is, I feel it rests with us. And if we're the ultimate ones who are accountable, I'm deeply dissatisfied that we have come up with a structure to address these issues. So if the accountability rests with us and then on down through management, um, I, I suppose I'll save this until we do our performance measures for the community development department. Um, but I do have a, a question for Mr. Buell, and I guess this can come the answers to it later um, when we have that item next Tuesday. Um, but be thinking about the, the question I asked about, is there anything in here that is surprising or different than what is expected? And um, Mr. Buell, to your credit, you answered that there wasn't anything new. So you have an awareness of these issues, and yet they're not changing. Um, I know I've asked over the years, what kind of funding would it take? What kind of staffing would it take? Um, the answer I was given two years ago is it would take two and a half STEs to make it right. I, I just um, don't feel that this particular study, as fantastic actually as I think it is, um, doesn't go far enough and doesn't uh, reflect, um, as Mr. Gorin said, the, the heatedness of of the moment. Um, so I, I do want to find out from my colleagues if there's interest in setting up accountability subcommittees. Um, I think we have to have that overarching vision. Uh, it's like Keystone Cops with all these different design review boards addressing different issues in different ways. And we, we need that overarching vision for our city. And then the short term goals, those NOVAC study um, recommendations, but then each of those has to be vetted. I, I, I understand the urgency of the uh, recommendations from the, the business advisory uh, task force, but, but we can't be skipping over important compliance. And, and uh, Mr. Harris said himself that it, it hadn't been vetted by staff, and we can't have that either, as much as there is urgency to support the business community as well. Um, so I guess I would, I would like to leave with um, that I'm looking for more in this study. It is incomplete. There hasn't been the full um, pie portion of it. And um, so I, I'm looking forward to that. I think there's more here. Uh, I do think it's not complete until we talk to our accessibility advisory committee. Um, 
and possibly looking at um, issues of equity. And um, I, I think I'll leave it at that for discussion, but I would like to, to get feedback from our colleagues on, on the, um, whether the two different subcommittees might be a way to address some of these issues and um, what that might look like. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. Madam Mayor, if I could just uh, real sure. quick, because um, I, I want to hear from Council. Just uh, in fairness to the Novak folks, their scope of work did not include looking at the design review process. I think they heard that from a number of the people they interviewed, both on the development side, but also from staff. And so they were just suggesting that there needs to be a focus on the design review process as well. Uh, but that was not part of their charge as part of this process. So I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, and before we, we go to Mr. Buell, uh, Ms. Snedden, I want to say that the, the accessibility uh, speakers have me thinking that the Business Advisory Task Force recommendations really need to go to Mr. Buell's uh, staff to take a look at. The, Mr. Harris said they haven't been vetted, and then we heard from the public that there is these issues. I, I, I don't think we need a subcommittee on an ad hoc committee right now. Um, Mr. Buell, Mr. Casey, if we sent these uh, task force recommendations to planning or um, building, it, would it, how long would it take to come back and, and vet it and give us, tell us what really is possible? Mr. Buell? Madam Mayor, uh, in terms of the amount of time that it would take to do that work, I imagine we could turn that around in three to four weeks at the very most. Um, we can even try to have some preliminary comment by the time we go to our budget hearing next Tuesday. Okay, well, let's think about that. That's what I throw out there to the, to the council that uh, there was just too much concern and not enough vetting. And I get it. The business task force is about uh, a focus on reopening and really it, it hadn't gone through any other kind of filter. But let me, um, Ms. Snedden, you were saying you want the Novak report to interview uh, single family design review board members I, 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 and accessory advisory Accessibility, yes. Um, if, if the design review boards were not in the purview of the NOVAC um, interviews, then, so then we'll address that separately. Um, but, I, but I do have some questions about whether then who was interviewed or were business owners um, interviewed and how were those findings reflected? Um, it does give me pause when Mr. Uh, Gorin says that uh, he'd like us to see the notes. Um, I know that I know that I was very strong in a lot of the comments that I made. I'll just say that I was very strong when I was interviewed, and I'm not seeing that reflected um, in the report. How strong um, maybe some of our comments have been, and if if I was the only one who was strong, and then that's how that is, and they balance that out, I can understand that. But um, my guess is that I'm not the only one. Um, so I would encourage them to, to not hold back. I mean, I think that was the, that was my intention of this study. And I think you said it at the time to just dig deep. And I know they dug deep, um, but to not hold back in the recommendations, which I, I feel they may have. Okay, Mr. Buell. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Member Snedden, I would have to ask for Mr. Ingram or Mr. Hamilton to join us. I don't have the list of the uh, people who attended those stakeholder groups. And uh, so I would have to rely on, on them to join us here. Thank you. Mr. Ingram. Good evening. Uh, so certainly appreciate your comments. I'll, I'll, I'll speak um, uh, maybe, maybe just quickly about the, the, the attendance issue. So um, we, we had a, the, 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 the original proposal, so our scope of work is sort of outlined in the contract, actually outlined um, two focus groups and then the, and then the web-based survey. Um, so we extended the focus groups and completed uh, basically nine uh, different focus groups. Um, those included uh, customers. We worked with staff to identify uh, sort of frequent flyers uh, in the process. 
um, in the land development process and, and uh, assembled a few groups of customers. So there was more than one group. Um, we then, uh, we also talked to uh, some individuals from uh, extended invitations to folks on the design review board. So we spoke with um, a representative from uh, historic landmarks. There was a representative, the chair of the sign committee. Um, as I review my notes, it's clear that there, there was not a representative from the single family side. Um, and we can certainly have that, just have that conversation very easily uh, over the phone, just to, just to close that loop. That's, that's no problem at all. Um, in terms of community groups, it was a question of identifying, um, um, you know, unfortunately we'd like to be able to talk to everyone. Um, and um, uh, I think we tried to work with staff to identify a, a good segment of folks from different represent, representing different areas of the community so that we could gather as much feedback um, from those groups as possible. That's a quick, thank you. Thank you for that response. And then um, Mr. Ingram, I, I, to the comment of, I know when we spoke, um, I know I had strong things to say yeah. and, and I'm guessing that there were others. And could you comment on that, on whether this is- I will, absolutely. So, or whether I have a, a, a different view of that. Yeah, so, you know, I would say uh, in each group, each sort of, st each stakeholder group, there are strong comments, there are, um, there were middle of the road comments, there are tepid comments, there are all sorts of different kinds of comments that come into the process. Our task as sort of a third, as a third party observer in this process is to get below the, uh, the emotion of it and the possession of it and identify, okay, what are the practical things that we can carry forward? What are the things that we can focus on that we believe address the root of the problem? So what is the root of the problem from each of these individuals' perspectives? And they are, there are legitimate um, concerns and legitimate frustrations. So I don't, I, I don't intend to temper that. And, I, and if that's the way it's coming off, I, I certainly don't mean to do that. Um, but there are also multiple angles to the story, and it's important for us to be able to provide a roadmap that takes all of those into account, that takes each of those perspectives into account. So what are our recommendations and how do they address what we believe are the root causes of those frustrations, um, uh, the, 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 the beginning point of that? Um, and that's that's the tact that we that we take. Um, you know, ultimately what we what we're really not uh, we're not going for as um, we're not trying to lay blame. We're trying to identify a constructive path forward. I appreciate that. And I know for myself, I have a lot of hope in a, a silver bullet that's going to just fix the problem for us. And, and I think this is just the first step. And um, I know that I'm maybe uh, funneling things toward you that um, that will pick up more um, next week when, when we get uh, deeper into it. But I, I appreciate the work that you've done. And I know I did feel very heard in my interview and I was wondering how that fit. In, into the rest of the picture. So thank you for your work. You bet. Mr. Jordan, thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm a, a little taken back. I thought I was going to uh, follow Council Member Sneddon and uh, have to give a different point of view, but uh, I'm, uh, I'm very supportive and appreciative of everything she just said. Um, there's little there that I disagree with. Um, I'm maybe a little more willing to ride this uh, PIE process to its end and see what that looks like with uh, an outcome. Um, I, I, I think I, I said this earlier, I think that's where the bulk of the uh, rubber meeting the road is going to occur. Uh, the assessment was just an assessment and how we implement and help staff and get staff's buy-in, I think is the key part of the process. Um, I guess one of the things I'm just concerned about generally is um, the, 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 the app, the, how, how this applies, how the NOVAC in particular process applies to the situation we find ourselves in that is different from any other when they would come and assess five years ago or five years from now. Um, the tanking of um, retail on State Street and the economic recovery from COVID-19. And if there's a, um, a level of urgency and need in the process as it continues that truly reflects this once in, once in two lifetime um, uh, challenge we have. Um, 
I'm I'm um I'm I'm interested in um, Ms. Snedden's um, sort of set up a couple groups to work on this. I'm I'm uh, suspicious of how long that will take and last. Where I'm anxious to get to the end result with the Novak thing, get it get it with staff, get implemented, get moving on the changes. So I'm kind of mixed there. Um, in terms of the business task force uh, sheet, I, I think I. I sort of uh, was clear before. I find that an odd mix of um, both long-term and short-term um, suggestions. And I am clearly looking for short-term easy fixes that recognize both um, businesses that need to get back in business and vacancies that exist and investment partners willing to find that predictability and that reasonable path to making a decision to invest in the resurgence of downtown. Um, I am also concerned about what we heard from the accessibility um, uh, stakeholders. So much for so much so much so that I would literally just cross off number four. I did not get, frankly, the um, the connection on construction valuations and the requirement to include uh, accessibility improvements in your redevelopment. And I, I just, I'm, I'm not willing to really have that be part of the consideration. But with everything on that list and a few suggestions I would add to it, um, I agree it hasn't been vetted and I don't really know what it means. I don't know what's easy. I don't know what's hard. I don't know what can be accomplished quick. I'm really wary of the ones that require muni code um, uh, changes because we know that's a year, and um, and I'm really interested in looking for um, topics and answers that will uh, address the urgency of where we are now. Not the not necess the long term is great to work on, but we are at a urgent point in history right now with the economic stability of this city and our ability. To, uh, to have a, a quality of life and a community that can live here. Um, so um, I guess I'll just, I'll just end with that. And I'm still interested in adding a discussion uh, to that list of uh, stormwater management triggers. And I don't need a lecture on the Clean Water Act from a public commenter. I can, I can talk that one pretty good. Uh, I do know there is the disparity between what the city elects to apply as our triggers versus what the county does. The county has much more lenient triggers and the county meets the state requirements. I know we do things in Santa Barbara the way we wanna do them in Santa Barbara. Um, it is a coming out of the situation we are in now, stormwater management triggers in the downtown area and particularly in the revisions that are being worked on right now are a tremendous burden to an investment partner to redevelop the interior of a building. Um, and then the only other mm -hmm. suggestion I have, okay. a simple thing is, um, I really believe we should support uh, a short-term uh, deference to the sign ordinance. We have blocks where one side of the street is almost totally vacant. And when a business is ready to go back in there, I could look the other way for a banner or sandwich board out there to allow that business to draw attention to itself. And um, I would hope that that would become part of the list too. So, um, well, Mr. Jordan, let me let me focus you. So, you, look look what's on the screen. So, we're looking at the the business advisory task force recommendations. Mr. So, Buell said that that he they could vet it and come back even preliminary with preliminary thoughts Tuesday, but within the next three weeks. Or four weeks. So I'm all for I'm all for that. It has to go somewhere else and come back from people who know what they're talking about, rather than aimlessly get directed by us at 10 o'clock at night. And right. the second part on the municipal code amendments, yeah. I believe there's other code amendments that would join that one that should all be some part of the same work project, probably, potentially. But, but if we were to just bite the bullet tonight, would you vote for that? To the initiate. second one? Yeah. It's a good start. Sure, sure. It's a start. 
Okay. Okay. And then yep. regarding stormwater, if I'm correct, Mr. Casey, that it went to planning commission, right? And it, no, I got that wrong. Not yet. It was uh, it was put off because of public interest because and because of virtual meeting. So it has not yet gone. It was supposed to go to planning commission in April and then come to us. It has been put off uh, indeterminate amount of time. But but it has a pathway. So let's just let's just leave it there. Okay. Well, okay. but I guess my opinion is the pathway that it's going to is is ex in my opinion is excessively burdensome on redevelopment at this particular point in time. Very good, thank you. Yep, thanks. M Mr. Friedman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Oh, um, I, I was before Eric, but I- Oh, you did, you know, you, uh, the just go Ms. ahead. You actually didn't have your light on, you turned off. So I'll-, I'll Ms. Gutierrez. Ms. Gutierrez then, thanks. Um, I just want to piggyback on what Ms. Snedden had mentioned, I want to support her idea to have that subcommittee. Um, I also feel that I have the same concern she does. Being a new council member, I'm struggling to understand how to solve this due to the fact that the Novak report was, the Novak group, I think they did their job, but they were hired by that same leadership that community members are complaining about. And I'm sorry, I'm tired and I'm not gonna sugarcoat anything. The same leadership that the grand jury is complaining about. And then we're expecting the same leadership to create solutions to this problem. The Novak report throughout the memo, they explain staff and staff this, staff that. When you oversee a group of staff, you have the responsibility to train them, to give them the support they need and to hold them accountable to our mission statement. So I'm asking the leadership um, to not sugarcoat, them, cut, sugarcoat things and to really reflect if they're actually doing their job. Because in, now that we're in, you know, for us that we're sitting on city council, like Ms. Nedden said, we're responsible. Now we're responsible to make the right decision. And if we're gonna have to make decisions of firing people, or asking people to get have pay cuts, then that's what we're gonna have to do. Um, I also want the, a commitment by Mr. Casey and Mr. Buell to have that time that timeline, that action timeline, where they're going to be very clear on how they're gonna address these bullet points that the Novak Group um, and the grand jury is um, highlighting. Thank you. Mr. Friedman. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, my colleagues have said a, a lot and I, I, I agree with a, a lot of what's been said. Uh, the quick points that I have, um, one is I, I, concerns about the ADA issues. And I just wanna clarify that on the recommendation number two, is that the same as the number two on the, the business advisory task force attachment to, which states limit review to scope of work and provide complete initial reviews. Are those one and the same, the BAT and this recommendation? It's, a, it's at the end of the um, NOVAC memo. It's in the back of it, attachment two. And that's where the business task force. Right, item, I, I, I just are, wanted to if the recommendation on the screen right now that we're being asked to support or not, the number two that's on our screen is not the same, same number two as is if it's the number two from the attachment of the bat. It's not. Madam Mayor, Mayor. 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 limit scope of review to permit plan review and inspections. And this says limit review to scope of work and provide a complete initial reviews. Are those the same or not? Madam Mayor, Council Member Friedman, I am going to that document right now. If you can just give me one moment, perhaps while you address another issue, I'll right. come back yeah. to that. The reason I need to understand is because there's just ADA issues that I want to understand on this second bullet point, if they're one and the same, or if I'm just not understanding. Okay, so just my other comments um, is I, I support having the whole um, business advisory task force be vetted and come back to us. 
uh, in a very timely manner, a week or whatever it is, or three, whatever um, the, the timeline is, because I think we do need to have that vetting. Um, and then the other issue that I, I think it, is that the first two kind of issues that are identified in the Novak report are key to me. Um, the first being the what is the vision? Because our staff, I, they are, if they're trained and they give the, they're given the proper direction, they will respond. I think there is confusion from the direction and the vision of the department that um, provides confusion for them. So if we take do our job and the leadership of the department does its job and we come up with a clear vision of what it's supposed to be, that will trickle down and they will and also buy in. So that gets to the, um, the process improvement exercise that's going forward. So I want to allow that process to play itself out. Um, but then I really think we need to understand what the vision is for the department. Is it get to a yes or is it uh, protect uh, or guardians of our uh, guardians of our community? So along those lines, I think we need to understand the customer service aspect of it and and have our staff be getting from the same the same set of values. It's, it's not one or the other. So how do we do both? And then the second part of that is the second major category is the intake and application screening process. We talk about consistency and um, just predictability. I think we really need to understand the intake uh, and application screening process to make it consistent from staff member to staff member. So um, if you get a, a certain staff member, you get the same process. And um, so that's really my comments at this point. Um, and Mr. Buell, do you have an answer? Looks like you probably do. Um, so your mic's not on. Yeah, Madam Mayor, Council Member Friedman. Yes, the item number two that you see on the screen here in slide 48 is the same is the same recommendation that you see coming from the Business Advisory Task Force. Thank you for that. That's a very important clarification. Um, with that being the case, I cannot support item two on the screen in front of us right now because it relates to vetting the task force and it's a serious ADA issue that was that was raised by um, our advisory task force. So um, I, I see the value in that and I see and I understand the, the desire to have that because of mission creep and where you're looking at certain aspects and it, it delays the process. but um, being the ADA issues and that we're going to have all these looked at again, I'd rather wait until we have that analysis by our staff, which from what I'm told, we can have relatively quick turnaround time. And I think um, lastly, uh, Council Member Jordan's comments, uh, he and I are, are, are uh, in the same agreement on this, that I'm looking at the advisory task force as kickstarting ideas that can kickstart our economy that was the, the design and purpose over it versus these long-term ideas, which we can incorporate as part of the Novak grand jury response. So to the extent that we can look at these very, like, like the sign issue that he brought up um, coming out of the task force, I would be able to support those types of things, but getting into municipal code reviews and those I think are part of the larger discussion. So that's what I, where I'm at uh, for tonight. Thank you, Ms. Harmon. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm going to be extremely brief. I um, am in agreement with the comments made earlier by Councilwoman Snedden. I share her frustration and concern, really appreciate the way she articulated um, some very real, very real concerns. So um, as to these recommendations or where we are, I'm just going to state my position. I also fully support these recommendations, the task force recommendations going to community development or to whomever um, for vetting and returning back to us in three weeks or in some timely manner. I, I think that will be very useful and, and help us to contextualize our conversation. I also support the creation of, I don't remember what we called it, an ad hoc committee, a subcommittee um, that seems like a, a reasonable, meaningful step to allow us to um, to work on accountability. And I think that's obviously something that's missing, something that is clearly really important to all of us. I think those are the issues we were talking about. So unless I've missed anything, those are my comments for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, 
So Mr. Casey, if you would help me summarize, I'm looking at the recommendations. Uh, well, I'm looking at the staff report. So we've received the report from the NOVAC group. Uh, recommendation B was to review the business advisory task force recommendations. I'm getting a sense, uh, and someone please jump on if you're not agreeing with me, that those need to go to planning staff for vetting, and then they'll come back. Um, the question is still out there whether to form a committee or not. Uh, and then uh, item C, which is, which is number two on the screen here, is to initiate a municipal code amendment. Uh, and I'm hearing that because that is part of something that was uh, of concern to um, advocates for access and accessibility that we should um, wait for that to come back as part of the recommendations because it was included in the um, business advisory task force list. So if we formed a committee right now, what what would that committee work on? Why, do, why don't we wait? Mr. Casey, should we wait until those recommendations come back? Go ahead. Yes, Madam Mayor, I don't think it's appropriate from a Brown X standpoint to create a council subcommittee uh, tonight, uh, but I think your motion could uh, include a recommendation that you will fo form a council subcommittee and we'll bring that back as a process to a point and then it's, it's that accountability type subcommittee that's uh, focusing on the implementation of the of the NOVAC re, uh, recommendations, and then we'll see what comes out of your direction when we bring the business advisory task force and that item two uh, back to you for consideration. Okay, Ms. Snedden, um, closing thoughts. Thank you, Madam Mayor. On the committees, and we we've talked about a couple of different iterations, so I just um, wanted to to say what I think would be helpful is is one committee focused on implementing the NOVAC recommendations and those would then be prioritized in that subcommittee, which ones to move quickly, which ones um, in order, what kind of budgetary constraints and that could be really focused in on. I think the full council also needs to be involved in that. But as that gets going, um, some of those things need to happen really quickly and um, a subcommittee could help focus on that. And then I do think that with all of these, we need a long-term vision for what we want State Street to look like, to feel like, the livability, the mixed use, the um, repurposing of buildings, um, the reusing of buildings in different ways, and, and all those types of considerations we're in a new world now and uh, nothing is going to be as it was. And how we vision that I really think deserves deep thought and conversation and, and um, stakeholder input. Um, so those are really, it's really twofold, two, two committees that I'm recommending and that we as council members set ourselves up um, so that our voices are, are fully focused on those two, but then the whole council looks at those all together. And that's what I'm proposing um, for the committee. Can, can I ask that, with, since we're coming back to look at the first committee, that we flesh out the idea of your, your idea of the second committee at that time. Yes. I, I wanna know more. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm concerned if it's that downtown Santa Barbara should be engaged, who would be, the, the partners. And so if we could, cause it's so late, just Absolutely. save Absolutely. that. I don't, on, on we're not this. gonna solve it tonight. We're not solving it tonight or even who would be on it or what it would look like. But conceptually, I just see this two prongs that we have some very immediate issues that they shouldn't just be free floating outside of a context of a bigger picture. So those are just conceptually short-term accountability and long-term visioning. I, I hope you understand. I'm not saying no, but I'm not saying yes. Yeah. I need to know what the two different, I, I think I understand what the first committee would do. I just need to know what the second one would do. So a motion, and since you're there, Ms. Nedden, would sound something like 
we are accepting the uh, uh, Novak report where, I mean, it's, it's fluid, it's gonna change. <clears throat> Um, it, well, we're yeah. sending the business action, the business advisory task force recommendations to planning to community development staff for review. And we will consider forming committees the next time we convene on this subject. I think that covers a good motion. I, I think that's it. I would just change accepting to receiving, um, receiving the okay. report receiving. as it is at this moment, it is incomplete. Of course, Mr. Casey then. Madam Mayor, council members, I, I'm hearing a little more consensus though about uh, the first accountability subcommittee. And so I would modify the motion to say, come back with the appointment and scope of an accountability subcommittee. Let's, let's get moving on that. Um, that would just be what I've been hearing from you all is that there's general consensus for that. So I don't think we need to postpone that creation of that. I, I would just like to add to that though, that part of my idea of this is that council members are evenly distributed in the two areas. And if we form one committee first without um, acknowledgement that there will be the second committee, um, then I know for myself, it would influence which committee I um, prioritize. So uh, I think we're not gonna, I, I don't think we're gonna tie up all the loose ends tonight, Ms. Smedden. I, I think it's it's reasonable to think that if three people get appointed to one committee, the other three would, would go to the other, right? If there is another committee, correct? Because you're not right. saying that you're willing to have the second committee. You're not saying yes or no, so. Not tonight at this, at this yeah. hour? I just yeah. at the time when we appoint to that committee, I would want to know if the other committee is something that uh, the other council members would accept. And, and possibly we have support to be looking at that now, if there's enough support to look at it. Um, I mean, if not, then I'll, I'll go a different route. I think we need long-term visioning, but. Um, right, and that's a very big task. And I'm just saying at 1030 at night, I, I, I need more answers about what long-term visioning would look like. Understood. So we were working with the motion to receive the Novak report as is to forward the business advisory task force recommendations to community development for vetting. And when they return, we would, uh, how did you say that Mr. Casey? Um, appoint an accountability subcommittee and consider a second committee of long-term visioning. So moved. Thank you. Is I'll that second. A, a second from Mr. Friedman? And then Friedman, you had comments. Did you finish your, okay. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna comment on the second committee. I, I understand where council said was going. It, it's now incorporated in part of the motion that we can have that discussion concurrently um, at the next meeting. So I think that addresses it that we can have that Full discussion of the one or two committees before we make the actual appointments of who's on there. I think that's what she was trying to, and that I wanted to see. So I think we addressed it in the motion. Thank you. Thanks. If everyone understands the motion, we will ask the clerk to do a roll call vote. Thank you. Madam Mayor and Council. Wait, 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 sorry. Oh. Can you please, can you clarify it again, please? One more time. Please. I apologize. Okay. Do you want me to do it, Ms. Gorman, or you? Uh, Madam Mayor, if I can give it, give it a hack from what I have, and then you can correct me as I go along. Uh, motion by Snedden, um, seconded by Friedman, to receive the NOVAC report, send the business advisory task force recommendations to community development staff for review, and return to council to appoint an accountability subcommittee and consider an additional subcommittee for long-term visioning. That's okay. it. All right. Council member Harmon. Yes. Council member Oscar Gutierrez. Yes. 
Council Member Jordan. Yes. Council Member Alejandro Gutierrez. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Snedden. Yes. Council Member Friedman. Yes. And Mayor Murillo. Aye. So that's unanimous, Ms. Clerk? Correct. Okay. And so, Mr. Casey, if you would help me, the two uh, will close this item with thanks to the public who has waited to participate and to everyone's good contributions. So, Mr. Casey, what we are rescheduling is, um, go ahead and tell me. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It's item 12, which was uh, a budget departmental presentation, but it was gonna include the Community Development Department and the City Attorney's Office. And we'll look to schedule that next Tuesday morning, uh, June 9th. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. The, we're looking at the morning of June 9th. We'll go to council member committee assignments. If you have something to report, uh, please do. Uh, otherwise, we'll uh, we'll catch up with you next week, and um, go ahead, Miss Snedden. So quickly, Madam Mayor, um, incredibly impressive meeting um, with the historic landmark commission and and reviewing the um, new ordinance and just the attention to detail and discussion. Um, looking forward to that coming forward, and um, grateful that it's here. The historic resources. Okay. Yeah. Okay, seeing no other council member uh, rising to speak, we'll adjourn this meeting. Thank you. <laughs>